Good morning, everyone. How are you all this morning? So my name is Elisa Valentine, and I am the Communications Justice Fellow at Public Knowledge. And I am proud to say that I have led and organized this year's Emerging Tech for Social Change event alongside my wonderful colleagues at Public Knowledge. I'm so thrilled that you all could join us here today uh, in person as well as online. We're streaming live right now, so if you guys can't stay the whole day, you can always watch it online. And I want to begin by thanking Congressman Mark Takano. We are here today because of his leadership on these issues. And I also want to thank uh, his wonderful, hardworking staffers, including Emily Paul, who worked with us, and she serves currently as his Tech Congress Fellow. I also want to thank our very generous sponsors, Google, as well as the Internet Association for making this event possible today on the Hill, as well as our reception and showcase tonight at the Google DC office. And because I don't want to make any assumptions about what people know or who people know, I want to begin by telling you all a little bit about public knowledge and the history of this event. Public Knowledge is a consumer advocacy organization here in DC, and we work to promote freedom of expression and open internet and access to affordable communications tools and creative works. We work to shape policy on behalf of the public interest. Some of you probably remember when this event was branded as 3D DC, which was an event similar to this, except it focused specifically on the wonders of 3D printing. In 2018, this event was rebranded as Emerging Tech DC so that we can include policy discussions about the Internet of Things, artificial intelligence, as well as virtual reality. And now in 2019, we have Emerging Tech for Social Change. And as I stated earlier, I had a little something to do with this in my role as a communications justice fellow. No matter what issues we focus on at public knowledge, whether that's about expanding broadband access, intellectual property, platform competition, artificial intelligence, or data privacy, it is my job to approach these issues from a social justice perspective. And it's a pretty amazing and impactful role, but I also feel as though it's my responsibility. Not only to myself, but to people who look like me who came before me, as well as people who look like me who will be here long after me. I believe technology can be used for social change. And I believe there must be regulations in place to ensure that change is something that's positive and beneficial, especially for our most marginalized communities. We haven't always made the right decisions in the tech space, and we've suffered serious repercussions because of it. Hashtag privacy. But we can't give up in the fight for equity in this space. And I'll tell you right now that I'm not going to give up. I'm a Valentine, I'm a black Latina from Tifton, Georgia. I went to Howard. So it's just not in my DNA to give up. So I hope that everyone in this room fights alongside me and our esteemed panelists and our showcase participants as we work to center voices at the margins, uplift people who have been held down for far too long, and empower communities that have been disempowered. And I want to be clear, I don't think we're always going to get things right when it comes to tech, but we sure can make a concerted effort to do so. And we must ensure that those who have been most oppressed in society are the same people who lead the conversations about equity and justice in tech. And with that being said, welcome to Emerging Tech for Social Change. So before we move on, I have a couple of housekeeping items. So um, if you want to access today's schedule of events, please use the QR code. We have it listed in the back, Oops, sorry. And we also have it on our Eventbrite page as well. We're trying to go green today, you all. Um, we will break for lunch at 12.40, so you can head over to the cafeteria here, um, or if you feel like making the trek to Rayburn to get Ann pizza, you can do that as well, but it might take you a while to get back in. Um, but just make sure that you're back here at 1.40. After we conclude here today, we would like to invite you to our showcase and reception at Google DC, which is located at 25 Massachusetts Avenue. It's about a 15 minute walk from here, depending on how fast you walk. Um, but if you don't want to walk, if it's hot by that time, you can always take a ride here or a cab. And if you have any questions, you can talk to one of the PK staffers here. Can the PK folks raise their hands so people know that they can ask questions too? All right, so we have these folks. I think we have some folks outside as well. 
And lastly, be sure to use hashtag tech for change for all of your tweets and social media posts. We encourage you to take photos and share your thoughts about today's event. And we really want you all to stay engaged online, especially the people who are watching online. All right, so I think we're gonna go ahead and invite our panelists up here for our first panel because we're waiting for Congressman Takano to get here. And he, never mind, I think they're walking in. But the panelists can go ahead. If you guys want to go ahead and sit up here, you can. Megan, where's Megan now? You can go ahead and make your way where we can be settled. before, Congressman Mark Takano sponsored this event for us, and he's the reason that we're here. And again, thank you to Emily Paul for all of her hard work. Congressman Mark Takano represents California's 41st Congressional District. Congressman Takano serves as the co-chair of the Congressional Maker Caucus, and he is a huge fan of 3D printing and how it can change and impact manufacturing, as well as entrepreneurship. And we are thrilled to have a representative here who leads in that space. And beyond his work in tech, we are thrilled to have a member of Congress who understands and advocates for marginalized communities in all spaces, because that's what the conversations here are about here today. Without further ado, please welcome Congressman Mark Takano to the stage. Well, good morning, everybody. Um, I, well, I'm Congressman Mark Takano. I represent the 41st Congressional District in California, and uh, I'd like to start by commending uh, public knowledge for bringing together a diverse uh, group of people to talk about emerging technology uh, here in the Capitol today. And as one of the co-chairs of the Congressional Maker Caucus, uh, and an advocate in Congress for uh, sharing the benefits of new technologies, I am excited, really excited to be here to help kick off the emerging tech for social change event today. Now there's been a lot of talk in Congress and rightfully so about the harms of technology, uh, whether it's the violations of people's privacy to misinformation uh, and the spread of hate online, hate speech. Uh, these are important and necessary discussions, but they aren't the full story of what Congress is doing on technology. And that's why it's so refreshing to have an event like this day, an event focused not only on how to address potential harms of technology, but also on the ways that technology can contribute to our well-being um, as individuals and well-being as a society. Now, most advances in technology are not inherently harmful or beneficial. Uh, but what we see happen too often is that the decisions on how to use these new technologies are made by a small and privileged group of people. And because of this, the potential for innovations to discriminate and exclude can be overlooked. And that's why I'm happy to see today's event focused on the ways technology affects, uh, uh, the ways in which technology affects and can benefit communities I am a part of and care deeply about. People of color, LGBTQ people, veterans, people with disabilities, and the working class. These communities are an amazing source of creativity and innovation, uh, but they're not always given a seat at the table when decisions are made about how new technologies should be used. And that needs to change. Uh, they need to be in the room where it happens. Today, you'll be hearing uh, about emerging technology, including virtual reality and 3D printing, and you'll be having uh, important discussions about how we can promote inclusive uses of these technologies. Uh, before that, I want to share a few applications of emerging technology that I find exciting. Um, the first is related to the use of virtual reality, otherwise known as VR. Um, I work closely with many of our veterans and in my district in Riverside, as well as uh, veterans living across our country and around the world. And one inspiring effort that shows the benefits of emerging technologies is the use of virtual reality to help veterans dealing with post-traumatic stress disorder, or PTSD. Over 20 years ago, researchers at Georgia Tech 
first tried using virtual reality to help treat PTSD. And since then, virtual reality has been used in numerous PTSD studies and is currently in use at several of our VA facilities. I've actually visited one not far from here. And it's kind of, it's interesting to just walk through uh, this virtual reality, or not walking through it, but you're, oops, the virtual reality is just sort of happening around you. Uh, and um, uh, it, it is new technology and a, a group of people with an in-depth understanding of an issue affecting the community. Uh, and they were able to apply this VR technology to really make a difference. Um, another emerging technology I'm interested in is 3D printing, as you've heard before. And many of you know that we actually have a 3D printer right in my congressional office. Um, and I, there's a, there's a bust of me that somebody sent me. It was, uh, it's, it's, you know, the program is somewhere online. Um, someone who's online, the online program that can, you can actually just print it out the computer and bust it me. We, we keep it on, on this shelf, but whenever, sometimes we use that shelf as a backdrop uh, to do uh, videos, but we are always careful to take it down, <laughs> put it aside, because, uh, you know, there are online viewers out there, many of whom uh, don't like me that much. <laughs> Uh, I'm sure they'll key in on, like, you know, what does this guy have a bust of himself? <laughs> uh, on the, you know, but it's a it's a discussion piece, right? It's like, what is that? And it's, uh, it's actually just see me going. Okay. Uh, uh, well, there's a there's a uh, a maker space in my own district called Vocademy. Um, I I've been excited about the ways in which 3D printing uh, and the maker movement more. Uh, uh, about the ways in which 3D printing and the maker movement more broadly empower a diverse group of people to use their creativity uh, to be active participants in innovation in their communities. And uh, uh, Gene, who owns Academy, Gene Sherman, uh, he, you know, he had visions of uh, helping engineering students gain the practical machining skills uh, that they don't get uh, when they go to engineering school. They learn the highly theoretical stuff, but. Uh, what was interesting to him, uh, what was interesting to me, is that what people come into his, uh, his, his makerspace do uh, is they make costumes for Comic-Con. Uh, and very elaborate costumes. And it's, you know, everything from the, the plastic molded uh, helmets uh, to the very fine leather work, uh, a, a futuristic, uh, you know, sci-fi, uh, sci designs that you might see in the movie set. Um, that's what a lot of people were using this makerspace to, to, uh, to produce. Well, just last week, I was at a VA facility in Seattle and saw how they're using uh, 3D printers to print actual medical devices uh, like custom orthotics for people with diabetes. I'd seen a lot of work that the VA had done with uh, printing uh, 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 prosthetics. But this orthotics was a very web-like material, very flexible. And people with, uh, uh, many of you might know that diabetes is one of the largest causes for people to lose their, uh, lose their limbs, right, their extremities. Uh, and these orthotics uh, were designed to help ease uh, some of the stress of uh, the sores on their feet. And it's they made out of this very flexible material. And as you know, 3D printing allows for a lot of customization. Um, and um, so when someone's device or someone's uh, uh, orthotic breaks down or wears down, the VA can just reprint it and ship it to them, uh, saving a lot of money. Uh, and actually, uh, it's a product that's probably not as generally available. Um, using these emerging technologies for social good isn't just about healthcare, it's also about creativity and expression. As a former public school teacher, I see the potential for the maker movement to empower students to design and build things themselves. Not just students, um, all sorts of people in the economy. And I, I've been trying to get my friend for years who was left behind uh, by the last recession, never really got back on his feet, just to go and tinker around in a maker space. Because they're very non-threatening places where you're not graded on things, you can just go and tinker around and learn how to do things and, and learn how uh, these new technologies work. So I see the potential for the maker movement to empower everybody to build things for themselves. This to me is a crucial part of the effort to ensure that everyone is able to access the tools 
they need to create and innovate and help shape how we use new technologies in an equitable way. By involving diverse voices in the design of new technologies, we can move closer to realizing the full potential of emerging technologies to benefit all of us. Well, thank you all for being here today and being involved in this discussion, and good luck today. Thank you. Thank you, Congressman Takano. All right, I'm going to introduce our first panel for today. Um, we have Megan Stiefel here. Stiefel, not Stiefel, you all. Um, Megan is currently the Senior Policy Counsel at the Global Cyber Alliance. And so very recently, I think like in the last two weeks or so, she was PK's Cybersecurity Policy Director. Previously, Megan spent eight years at the Department of Justice, and there she was the Director for Cyber Policy in the National Security Division, served as counsel in the Computer Crime and Intellectual property section of the criminal division and began her DOJ career as an attorney in the Office of Intelligence. We are thrilled to have Megan here to join us as she moderates our first panel of the morning, Emerging Privacy and Security Threats in Consumer IoT, Protecting Consumers to Drive Social Change. Thank you, Alisa, did I get, okay, close enough but not too close. Good morning, everybody. Um, thanks everyone for coming. Thank you, Alisa, and the team at PK for putting this event together. I think it is incredibly timely and I'm delighted to have the opportunity to participate. So our plan for this morning is hopefully not to scare you away from all of the great things that Congressman Takano just talked about with emerging technologies like 3D printers and the like, but to help sort of inform the conversation as we think about how all of these technologies can enhance our lives. and. I think most of us on the panel could agree that it starts with security and privacy. So our goal is to help inform the conversation about how we can best address those uh, challenges and interests as we develop uh, additional emerging tech for change. Um, so we're going to quickly introduce ourselves um, and then we'll move into some questions. We've saved time at the end for questions, but if there's something that's burning, uh, perhaps we can, you can stand up and I think we have a mic if there are questions. So we'll talk for about 40 minutes or so and then uh, look forward to talking with all of you about some questions. So I'll turn it to Dr. Eswick first. Good morning, thank you PK for the invitation. Um, so uh, I'm currently the director for the National Cybersecurity Institute at Excelsior College. Uh, Excelsior College is an online uh, educational uh, institution uh, catering to adult learners. I'm also the director uh, for their cybersecurity program. And also uh, I come from really a background of 20 years being in the intelligence community. I spent eight years uh, serving in the United States Army in uh, what we call information security. It wasn't cybersecurity back then, um, and telecommunications. And then 17 years, about 17 years at the National Security Agency where I held a multi multitude of uh, technical positions from cyber, uh, computer science researcher to, uh, before I left there in 2016, uh, technical director in their uh, NSA Cybersecurity Threat Operations Center. So uh, thank you for having me. Good morning. Uh, my name is Adam Sedgwick. I'm a policy advisor at the National Institute of Standards and Technology, or NIST. Um, NIST is a uh, sorry. Uh, NIST is part of the Department of Commerce. We're uh, the technical arm of the Department of Commerce. We're actually a national laboratory program, but unlike a lot of the other national laboratories, our focus is all on industry needs. Uh, and we're also a measurement uh, agency, so everything we do is focused on, uh, that's where the standards come in, that everything we do is supposed to be focused on measurements. So we do things like maintain the atomic clock that synchronizes all of your cell phones and all of your computers. Um, on cybersecurity, we develop uh, standards and guidelines for information systems. So we really help, uh, help the federal government, but also help industry on, on how do you use uh, technology, old technology, and emerging technology look at it. Yeah. Hello, I'm Harley Geiger, and I'm Director of Public Policy at Rapid7. Rapid7 is a cybersecurity firm. It's based out of Boston. We've got about 1,300 employees and about 7,800 customers. We sell a variety of cybersecurity software tools as well as services, so we will hack you for money. Um, and uh, and we will also sometimes hack you not for money and tell you what your vulnerabilities are. We do a fair amount of independent research, including on IoT, and work with manufacturers to try to catch them. 
hoping I'll use this. This is working. No, it's not. Okay, never mind. I won't use that. Okay, um, so I just wanted to give everyone a background uh, very, very briefly about um, the work that public knowledge has done on cybersecurity. Um, as uh, Lisa mentioned, up until recently, I was the cybersecurity policy director there. We were. Um, our work was supported by a generous grant from the Hewlett Foundation. Unfortunately, they changed their approach, and so I'm staying in the neighborhood, but uh, not exactly in the same place of public knowledge. So, um, what we really tried to do was to think about how uh, cybersecurity, but better ways to talk about cybersecurity with consumers in particular. Um, obviously, that includes the business space. So, last uh, spring, we published a paper um, entitled uh, "Securing the Modern Economy: Transforming Cybersecurity Through Sustainability." And essentially the argument of the paper is the internet is an ecosystem. All elements of the ecosystem play a role in protecting it, advancing it, securing it, and using it. Uh, and at the end of the paper, we outlined a series of steps that a number of stakeholder groups could take to best secure themselves and contribute to a more sustainable internet ecosystem. Um, following on that work, uh, earlier this year, we published a paper uh, that advocated for something that is like the, security, the energy star for cybersecurity, entitled it. Um, security shield and uh, thanks to Dylan who's in the back um, and others in PK for their great work on both of those uh, efforts and the idea around Energy Star and Security Shield is to think about ways to, con to communicate to consumers how they can purchase a, a, an IoT product consumer facing IoT product that has been built in the most secure manner possible and can be deployed in a, the most secure manner possible uh, we won't spend too much time today talking about that, I don't think, but we're happy to. Um, instead, I think what we should begin with first is to say, to kind of set the table. What are Internet of Things things? Um, how do they differ from other security threats that we've talked about? For a long time, we all had desktops, and then we had laptops, and now we have processors on our phones that could are stronger than what Amelia can tell us about um, what we had back when we sent the first person to the moon. Um, how, do the, how do we manage these new fully capable devices in our lives, and how is that different than what we had 10, 20, 50 years ago? So I'll turn it to Amelia first. Because I'm on the side, right? <laughs> I go first, but, um, so yeah, so Internet of Things, you know, we hear, we hear that term thrown around a lot, right? And basically is uh, IoT, looking at uh, devices that are connected uh, via wirelessly or uh, by uh, cable. Um, to the internet, right? And things that can be controlled uh, sometimes remotely, most of the times remotely. So I like to tell people all the time on a high level, right? And another things, it's your smartwatch, right? It's the, you know, folks have wireless cameras now around their homes. It's the thermostat that you want that also to control from your phone. We want the convenience to control everything by our phone, right? And it's become so pervasive uh, in our society that uh, I ran across a stat that said by 2020, meanwhile, I think I saw this stat about a year ago. Um, so 2020 is next year, right? So by 2020, right, world population is supposed to be like 8 billion people, but uh, IoT devices will be at 36, over 36 billion, right? So that's four devices per every, you know, human on earth, basically. And I don't know about all of you, but I know I have more, for, more than four devices <laughs> by myself, right? I think we all could probably speak to that. So um, it's one of these things that uh, we definitely, of course, have to think about. We have to develop policies around and try to figure out how can we best uh, mitigate uh, cyber attacks uh, against IoT. Probably you're adding in some strategic differences, if any, between where we were and where we are. No, not, not where we were, not, not where we were, where we are. Just um, a couple of other thoughts on sort of the, the definition of, of IoT, what we conceive of it. And I think it's it's one of the challenges that you run into if you're looking at making policy around IoT is how to define it. Because in any sort of legislation, any sort of regulation, you have to define things very clearly because it's all going to end up in court. It's all every every word will be will be scrutinized, right? And what we think of as IoT, like physical objects that are connected to a network of some kind, sort of electrical network, that has a CPU and memory, actually encompasses a huge range of, of devices. Your printer is IoT, right? Un under that definition, your laptop, your you know, a, a car, a tank, is is IoT. And so, like, just from the outset, the definition is different. Second is that a lot of the things that we conceive of as IoT is actually uh, an ecosystem of technology. So most IoT, you know, people think of it as just the device, but it's not, right? There is also a network that it is transmitting information to. There is also 
the cloud storage that many of the devices are uploading data to. There's the mobile app that you have command and control or you know, manage and control your device. And there are vulnerabilities at each stage of the, every stage of that process. So it's not just a you know a piece of hardware that we're looking at. It is really an ecosystem. And it's one reason why you know, some folks cast doubt, I, I think reasonably so, on, on this concept of IoT security. Like is, is there is there really an internet of things or is it just computer security? Yeah, so I, I think that's right. And um, coming from NIST, where everything likes to be defined and standardized, that's sort of what we do. Um, we get this question a lot about um, what does IoT mean and is there a definition? Especially when in other areas, when there was a bit of a gap, um, NIST did come in and provide a definition. So cloud computing, computing is an example. When that, when that term came out, people wasn't really sure what it, what it meant. And for some people said, well, I already have a server that has a lot of data on it. Does that mean I have cloud computing? Um, so in that, in that instance, it was somewhere where we came in and put out a notional definition that ended up being one that everyone likes and is now used throughout the world. Um, and in IoT, we, we haven't done that. Instead, we've, we've sort of referred to existing definitions and looked at particular use cases. Because I think building off what Harley said, I think one of the challenges we have here is there are good ways to look at it both horizontally and vertically. And what I mean by that is, you know, what are the attributes of generic IoT devices? What are the, as Harley said, computer security, right? What are we thinking about it? Particularly when people that are building products don't necessarily want to build a product and say, okay, here's how it would be used in the financial sector in this use case, and here's how it would be used in the healthcare sector. Um, and, that, and that would be the vertical. Right, because is it, is it appropriate to look at IoT from that broad horizontal, which is what are the generic properties, when in some instances I might want to have different security protocols on the um, security camera in my son's room versus my heart monitor or my car, right? It just makes sense that, that you might want to think about those differently. So those are some of the challenges in how we address this and how we think about IoT um, as, as a broader set of policies. Thanks. I think another thing to think about is we went from not every home having a large desktop computer to now more than four devices per home. So one of the ways that we think about this is the so-called attack surface has increased exponentially. Um, and so in order for us to gain the benefits that we've heard about and you will hear about today, we need to be able to secure those devices to ensure that we continue to trust in those devices. Um, so there was a large attack that I, people have said is sort of what, what prompted um, what we're about to talk about next a little bit. Um, but I don't want to bore you with the details. We have enough fear, uncertainty, and doubt. You can open the newspaper and read about whichever company was most recently the victim of, of malicious uh, or malign cyber activity. Um, so what's being done about this exponentially increasing attack surface? There are lots of things that are being done. I thought it would be useful for us to, to since we're in DC, um, frame the conversation a little bit about around what the executive branch is doing. Uh, and I'm going to turn to Adam first to talk about uh, what's being done under an executive order that was issued in 2017, which is, if you're writing this down, it's EO 13800. Um, it, was the, it was the most recent executive order in a series of executive orders. Another one that Adam may or may not talk about is EO 13636, um, which, again, I'm talking also to the students in the room if you have to write the paper if you're watching online, taking notes. Um, these are little guide points to help you. So. Um, I think we'll, we'll begin with that and then kind of branch out from there and, and maybe get into some of the details about what this executive order did and maybe you can talk a little bit about what came before it, but I didn't tell you about that beforehand, so put you on the spot. Sure, sure. Yeah, I'm happy to bore you with some of the details on, on these things. Um, so um, looking back on how some of these policies have been developed and, and um, are being developed, uh, just a bit about my background is I actually worked um, in the Senate. Um, Security Government Affairs Committee from 2001 to 2010. So I, I actually saw this become sort of a topic that cybersecurity or information security as a topic that um, wasn't of interest to, interest to many of the members. They thought it was this kind of weird, dull topic to something that you know we have is, is debated every day, multiple bills uh, mentioned in, in addresses by by presidents and one of the transitions that I that I witnessed there and I think how it became really of interest to policymakers and this is just cybersecurity generically was um, the conversation around critical infrastructure and the idea that this greater connectivity of things that were designed without without concepts of it being connected to this global information network all of a sudden were being connected 
And what, is the, what did that mean? And what was the impact of that? So the scenarios of um, electric grids being subject to remote attacks became something that really made members of Congress sit up straight and say, well, this is really something we need to do something about. Um, and Megan mentioned Executive Order 13636. I mean, the focus there was largely on this, this conversation of critical infrastructure. But I think if you look increasingly at the policies that came after that, we sort of moved from critical infrastructure and it just broadens out bit by bit to more and more. Right? You had the Sony attack where people had to ask themselves, well, that's not really critical infrastructure, is it? But that's something that feels pretty important to us as a country. And then increasingly you had um, attacks on uh, these major cybersecurity companies that impacted consumers. So really, if you just look at the set of policies coming out of the Obama administration now into the Trump administration, it's sort of reflecting that this isn't something that's just segmented just to critical infrastructure, just to businesses. It really has the broader consumer interest in mind, and that's really where we get at IoT, which does impact enterprises and governments, but it also has this direct impact on the consumer um, in a way that uh, these other ones didn't, because you have to work directly with the consumer instead of just working with uh, electric providers or big financial companies. Um, and so one of the reasons why we talk about the ecosystem so much is that it, it's an increased realization that you can't just impact, you just can't work with one node, work with one part of this much bigger system. Um, how that manifests itself in policy and the executive orders that um, Megan mentioned was, um, you know, executive, or, executive order 1300 asked for a report that we call the botnet report. Um, What's about botnet? Yeah, I'm getting there. <laughs> Um, but also was about what they call automated distributed attacks. Um, and so uh, people also refer to botnets almost as zombie computers, so big networks of computing power that are then used for various purposes. Um, and the particular incident that Megan was talking about was something called the Mirai botnet, which really did harness, which harnessed a lot of consumer security cameras. Um, to have something with a, 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 a lot of compute power, which then could be used for denial of service or other, which means that you would be preventing people from getting on the internet or for other purposes. Um, the reason why I think that's a good example for this IoT device, for this IoT conversation, is it's really at the nature of the problem. Does a consumer necessarily care if their perfectly well functioning security camera? is being part of a botnet when it doesn't impact how the security camera is to them. The, the, from their perspective, the security camera is working just fine. They're getting the information they need. Um, so maybe it's doing this other stuff on the side. I don't have anything to do with that. Um, and then is the consumer, if he goes in the store and says, would they necessarily be willing to pay more money for a security camera that wouldn't be subject to that bot if it, again, is delivering them the service they need, if it serves that function. I mean, these, these are some of the really challenging questions that we have to ask ourselves when, when we are trying to solve this problem. What the executive order did was it tasked uh, the Departments of Commerce and Department of Homeland Security to work with stakeholders to develop a plan, realizing that there are a lot of different dependencies here and just focusing on individual devices might not be the most effective solution. And also looking back, taking some recommendations from um, an independent commission that came at the end of the Obama administration and looking at why hasn't the federal government working with industry been able to make progress in the, on these issues in the past. And the conclusion was sort of a lack of sustained effort, right? You sort of started and stopped and thought about it and then you moved on to a problem without trying to really commit, understanding that it's not just one organization or one set of companies moving, it really requires people to act in a coordinated fashion. Um, and the reason why I say that is because when we talk about IoT, there tends to be a lot of focus on the security of the individual devices, right? How do I make those security cameras more secure? How do I make my phones more secure? where really what we're trying to do in the botnet report and with these other efforts is try to address it at multiple levels, understanding that there are some dependencies there and then there are some additional vulnerabilities. So an example of that would be, I'll use the security camera example again, 
if you did make the extra money, if you did pay the extra amount of money, if you did get a device that you understood had greater security and then you took it home and it asked you to create a login and password and you decided to make your login login and your password password, then you have undermined a lot of the security settings of the devices. So um, we're trying to think about it not just from the individual devices, but also consumer education so that they understood what to do what um, additional resources they might have. Um, and also at the network level, understanding that we already have a lot of these devices out there. A lot of them aren't gonna have good security capabilities. So what are the other things that we can do to better understand what's happening across the network to try to make the entire ecosystem a lot more secure? So that work under the executive order led us to draft a report. Uh, the report's been out for um, a little over a year now, I think. Okay. Um, one of the things that we changed, and, and, and we do, we tend to do these things through a, an open and transparent process, where we try to make sure that everyone has the same information we have as we're making these conclusions. So we do it through workshops, we do it through public submissions. So if people are curious um, how individual organizations submitted comments, what they look like, and what we did with them, they can sort of look over our shoulder and made sure we did that in a fair and equitable way. And one of the things we did at the end of the report is not just, which really looks at it in different arenas and also gives out sort of different homework assignments to different uh, parts of industry, things that we should do, things that they should do, things that other departments and agencies should do. And then one of the last things we did as we moved the document from draft to final, we also gave ourselves uh, a requirement to sort of check in after a year understanding some of the conclusions of the commission were, you know, you got the government seems to be starting these things and then stopping. So in some ways, again, we're grading our own homework to a certain extent, but we will be coming out with a report in October to show how much progress has been made over the course of the year in implementing that report, and then trying to figure out what we need to adjust to be different. Thank you. So um, there was a report and then there was a roadmap that followed. I think that was published near the end of uh, November of last year. Um, and it had basically five lines of effort. Um, enterprises, and so I think as we get into this conversation, it'd be helpful for us to, we're talking in our language, making sure that we talk about it in everyone's language. What's an enterprise? It can be, it's the .gov, house, mail.house.gov network that we're sitting in, um, un, under which we're probably sitting, although it's probably also in a cloud, it's in hopefully lots of different places. Uh, so there's redundancy. Um, infrastructure, we talked a little bit about critical, critical infrastructure, uh, the power companies and other things, and it can also be infrastructure such as ISPs, those who operate the internet backbone. Um, tech development and transition, we probably won't spend too much time talking about that, but among other things, we're talking about um, research that the government can do for its own purposes that then could be transitioned out to the private sector. Um, and then education and awareness. So I think it's, um, it would be helpful for us to spend a little bit of time talking about what is being done in the roadmap space um, and how that can specifically impact social change in marginalized communities. Um, and I think one another way to think about this is we have this IoT, we have this uh, excuse me, IoT camera, baby camera, security camera, it might be a 3D printer in other cases. Uh, do these devices are deployed, I have some in my house, please don't hack them, um, but they are, they are all over the place. They are, I think, most prominently in small and medium-sized businesses, and so, um, Dr. Asa, we uh, had our um, prep call. We talked a little about small and medium-sized businesses and micro-businesses. And I think it would be helpful for us to kind of frame our minds today around, um, particularly as a result of IoT deployment, how these devices uh, impact communities, particularly marginalized communities. Um, and maybe you can give a little more example or drill a little bit down on what might an enterprise be to those who are not, you know, it's not mail.has.co, but maybe it's the Right. right, right. So it's it's really uh, that corporate infrastructure, right, that we talked about. Um, so when we talk about uh, could it be a maker shop, maybe? if they are connected to a larger organization, absolutely, and that organization is its own entity as well. So absolutely. So I think um, so. It's been interesting for me the past three years that I've been in this higher ed educational training awareness space. Um, I've had quite a bit of uh, folks reaching out to me, especially small and medium-sized businesses and micro-businesses, which 
are a subset to small uh, businesses, right? And, um, you know, when you think of small business and you think of micro businesses, right, we live in this gig economy. I think we've heard that term quite a bit, right, uh, where folks get multiple jobs and uh, they're probably interacting with businesses that are small businesses or they're micro businesses. Micro businesses uh, are, tend to be an organization, a business that has less than five employees, right, and that one employee is probably the owner itself and <laughs> four additional employees, right, and uh, they're, uh, they're startup, so to speak, uh, monies tend to be low capital, right? And they also have uh, traditionally low revenue, set, uh, re well not low, but about 250,000 in revenue uh, that they uh, that they bring in. So, but they are the backbone, right, of our society. If we think about everything um, from the food trucks outside, right, to, um, you know, our local uh, shops around our communities, um, to to many of the small businesses and micro businesses. So I, I'm just, I, I'm, a, I'm a computer science person, so sorry, math is my background. I love bring it in stats. So, um, so just reading this, this is just a 2016 small business uh, credit survey, and it talked about, um, 89% of the small businesses are actually micro businesses, believe it or not. Um, so uh, the median age of, of typically for micro businesses are 46 to 55 years old. So already right there we're dealing with a little bit of a gap, right? When we talk about technology, when folks talk about technological natives versus um, those who are uh, from the that persuasion, right? Uh, who are technically not natives, right? Um, to, of course, the millennials, right? Which are considered technological natives, right? And then a uh, percent of these uh, firms are also uh, minority uh, owned. 30% are actually a micro businesses or minority owned. So when you talk about cyber threats and you talk about IoT, and you talk about devices, many of these micro businesses and small businesses, um, because they are uh, part of the supply chain, right? Of these many of these companies, they're independent contractors, consultants, you know, consultants, so forth. They are using technology very quickly, so they are adopting technology without understanding probably the cybersecurity impacts. Um, noting that, unfortunately, if they are hit with a threat, right, or if they compromise in some way, that could be detrimental to their company, right? Could completely wipe them out. So um, there's been just a lot of uh, momentum behind uh, assisting uh, organizations and businesses that are kind of at the backbone of our society, but unfortunately are not equipped with the infrastructure and the resources, right, to, to uh, identify and mitigate any of the uh, cyber threats. So it's, 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 it's been something being reached out by a lot of startups saying, help me in cybersecurity. I got this great app, or I got this great service, a great product, but um, I don't understand the cybersecurity implications and I need help with that. So yes, definitely. Um, Harley, I don't, I feel like you're, we're not bringing you into the conversation enough. So feel free to chime in, but uh, otherwise I'll quickly turn to Adam and maybe it's a good point to talk about. So again, we're talking about <coughs> some of the challenges. What are we doing about, how are we addressing these challenges? Um, We've talked about the roadmap uh, there, and we mentioned the five elements. I think it's also uh, useful for perhaps Adam to talk a little bit about um, the privacy implications and how NIST has helped with developing tools to help everyone in the ecosystem, but primarily through a trickle-down effect, um, primarily industry and the government, to think about um, the privacy implications of deployed technologies. Uh, but before we get to the privacy implications, we talked a little briefly about the CS13636, which spawned the cybersecurity framework. Um, so maybe we can touch on that and then talk a little bit about the intersection of CSF and the privacy framework. Is it, did it come out? Yeah, it's out. Exactly. So one of the things I'm hoping you can maybe speak to is how, um, I mentioned the trickle down effect. So if, if you're a small company and you're like, I see lots of references to ISO standards and things and that's not my game. Um, how might micro businesses see the effects of that or how could they perhaps ask of their um, Google you're pretty good with, but if you're going with your local cloud backup storage guys, how can you better position yourself? Sure. Okay, it's a lot. I'll, uh, I'll take it bit by bit. Yes. Um, so, uh, yeah, so back in, so just a bit about NIST, and, and we're about a 100 year organization, so I won't, I won't go too far back. But, um, you know, historically, how we, we worked was developing standards and guidelines for federal information systems, right? And that means that. Um, that means for if you're working Department of Treasury, you work Department of State, 
and um, you are using a technology and you're not sure how to configure it or use it, you have to turn to NIST, and NIST will help you provide that guide. And a lot of that was developed so that, uh, or that, that, that method, um, and the broader way in which NIST has worked in the standard space is sort of to solve this problem of how does the government effectively use technology um, and how do we stop building our own stuff. So, for example, I think it was only a year or two ago that the Department of Defense stopped building their own phones, right? So you go out, you write a spec, and you say, this is how I want my phone to look with the security capabilities. And um, that historically creates real challenges because, um, of course, that requires the Department of Defense or, the, or whatever government agency to keep on going out with procurements and requests. When um, an industry is moving faster than that, wouldn't it be easier just for um, the federal government just to get a phone from Apple and if there are additional, or, or Samsung or whoever, and if there are additional security capabilities that they need, make sure that it's configured in that way. So that that's sort of at the heart of, of what we have done. And a lot of it is to, to prevent the, you know, it's very similar approach in other areas to prevent things like a $250 custom DOD ashtray. Um, and the reason why we've been effective in that space is because the federal government used to spend, is, is still the largest procurer of information technology in the world, right? We spend about $90 billion. And so if you want to sell to the federal government, you want to work with NIST because you want to make sure that your, the, product, the capability of your products are being reflected in that. But increasingly, these, as more people use technology, the people that make the technologies might not care about selling to the federal government when they can make sufficient money just selling to consumers. And they might not want to go through those additional hoops. And so we've thought about our approach a lot differently because also the needs of how the federal government uses technology is increasingly pretty similar to how just companies use technology. It used to be that people would go and try to get jobs in the federal government because they got to use cool technology. I don't think anyone's saying that nowadays. <laughs> um, you know, we get to use uh, um, MacBooks, and we always are looked at jealousy, jealously by our, our colleagues in other departments and agencies because their they're, uh, they're, they're, uh, technology folks haven't figured out how to do that in a secure way. Um, and so um, part of our work, it's, this is a long build up, and Megan's probably rolling her eyes, but part, part, part of where this took us a few years ago was. Um, with something that was called the cybersecurity framework. And this was really focused on industry's needs, particularly critical infrastructure. And what policymakers were really struggling with was the idea that there were a ton of best practices out there, there were tons of standards and guidelines out there, and they, were, they couldn't figure out why organizations just weren't using them. And so instead of choosing an approach where we just said, well, we're just gonna require everyone to use them, we actually had a dialogue to try to understand where some of the gaps were, where some of the challenges were, and figure out how to work better with them to, um, to, to address those challenges. And in cybersecurity, it really did seem to break down to some, comp to some challenges with communication, um, and also some, some, some breaks between different sectors and how they communicate cybersecurity risk, which became an increasing problem as as technology you know, exploded and, and more people were relying on more technology. So it used to be that you know, industry might have come to us and said, you know, you guys are the government, we're the private sector, we move faster than you are, we feel pretty good about what we do, we don't really need your help. But um, even, even five years ago, instead they were coming to us to say, hey, we're pretty confident in what we do, we hire really good people. But I'm, I, I'm dependent on um, the telecommunications industry, on, on the internet, I'm dependent on the um, energy industry for my power, I'm dependent on all these different sectors and different organizations, and I don't know what the heck they're doing, and I don't know how to help them uh, improve their game. And so where the framework came out was really a tool to help people communicate what they were doing with cyber, in cybersecurity, both within their organization and externally, and try to go up to the highest level as just a simple communications tool and then provide a guide to more detailed implementation guidance. So that if you were having a conversation about cybersecurity from the CEO level, 
you could say, you could look at the highest level of the cybersecurity framework, which are words like identify, detect, protect, respond, and recover. And you could say, I don't need to know how we're doing it, but under identify, do we know where our risks are? Do we know where our vulnerabilities are? Under um, detect, do we understand when there is an incident, when a bad thing is happening? Protect, are we using technology to make sure that we're protected? Um, and then respond and recover, understanding that there will be incidents, that there will be bad days. It might be as simple as someone leaving their laptop on the train. Do we have the right processes to make sure that, that we're getting back on and recover, which is not just the immediate crisis, but longer term, how do we make sure that we're operating better and delivering services in the way we're intended to? And so that's where the cybersecurity framework came out. It's been, I think, used very widely through industry beyond what we ever expected. Um, and not just by critical infrastructure companies, um, tech companies, financial firms, a lot of regulators have referred to it as a good practice, so a lot of companies use it that way, and we also see it internationally, because other governments were grappling with the same problems, and they said, well, this seemed like a pretty effective approach. So it's not just used here in the U.S., it's used in Israel. The framework and the cybersecurity framework may become something like a standard of care um, that might invite the FTC to the table, um, and whether, not to put you on too many questions to you, but what do we think? Yeah, <laughs> I think one thing that we've spoken about at PK has been active in talking about is whether the FTC has enough authority and resources to do the work that it has, and then whether perhaps that needs to be expanded. I'm not asking you to buy on that, but they, they, give us industry review, um, please. So NIST does terrific work, and I mean it's it's extremely accurate. It's very very useful, um, and it's necessary work. Um, I don't know how many folks in the room have actually looked through the NIST cybersecurity framework. Quick show of hands, anybody? A few people, okay. So you know that it's, it's like 60, 60 plus pages, right? That there's 120 or so different controls that are listed in the, in, in the framework uh, tied to just a, you know, a plethora of standards that themselves can run into well over 100 pages. Um, for large companies, you know, large enterprises, and uh, these are these are the types of folks that I think have the resources to spend to go through all of that. And the framework itself also doesn't say here are the things that you must do. It is here are the things that you must consider in trying to decide which of these are right for your organization, and then just kind of right size it and stay flexible. It's not it's not a checklist. It's it's actually more nuanced, and therefore more in some ways more difficult than that. Um, I. I hope that it is being taken up by, by micro businesses, by consumers to manage their own cybersecurity, by uh, companies that are you know that are uh, outside of the United States, in particular IoT manufacturers that are using commercial off-the-shelf commodity products to build their their IoT devices before shipping them out. But I have serious doubts that those types of parties are in fact using the NIST cybersecurity framework. And, and setting aside the NIST cybersecurity framework, consider also that there are dozens and dozens, if not hundreds, of IoT security best practices out there um, for manufacturers and operators, for companies that are integrating it into their environments, as well as for consumers. Uh, I interned at the Federal Trade Commission in 2008, and uh, you know, so well over 10 years ago, and they had a long-running consumer education campaign about security, as well as a long-running campaign on small business security. Um, these issues on a voluntary basis alone, I think we are starting to see that it is not working. And it's not working particularly at the low end of the market, right? You can expect uh, better security in general, in general, from name brands, from sophisticated devices. Nothing will be completely secure. You, will, you, know, you don't go out and find a new story that Tesla has security flaws, I know. But, but in general, they are not gonna suffer from a lot of the same basic security flaws that you'll see in consumer products that are at the low end of the market that use those commodity products. And there are a lot of those. Probably the majority of IoT devices are those types of products. So what do we do about those if the voluntary best practices are not working? If NIST's great work is not being adopted by these parties, what do we do? Um, and can we call that a market failure? If, and if it is a market failure, then what is the role of government? From our perspective, there are things that government should be doing, and to some extent are doing, to address what we think is a market failure for those types of devices. Um, there are several agencies that have put out uh, voluntary guidance about 
their own, uh, like describing how IoT fits within their authority. And when I say voluntary, in some cases it's kind of in quotes because they are still able to pull a recall of your car if your car has a cybersecurity defect that will affect safety. So they put out the voluntary guidance, but it's sort of like, look, you know, this, these are the things that you can do, but if you don't do them, it's, you know, it's whatever, we're still gonna pull your car if it has a safety defect. Um, so NHTSA uh, did this, the Consumer Product Safety Commission uh, is starting to do this, uh, but they, they did have a recall. It was just for something that actually caused a, a, a physical harm. Um, the FTC is doing this for COPPA, so COPPA is uh, for children's privacy, um, and it includes security requirements, so they put something out on that. Um, but there are also, the, the, the FDA, I wanna mention also, the FDA has great guidance for uh, medical devices pre-market, so before it ships, as well as aftermarket, so once it's actually out in the field. But there are a lot of gaps also. Uh, the Federal Trade Commission that, that uh, Megan had brought up, uh, they, they do have limited authority to go after poor data security. Um, but they don't have original finding authority, which means that you get your first bite of the apple almost free if you were, you know, if, if you have poor data security. Um, it also, the courts have also sort of thrown into question whether or not breach of information alone is enough to trigger that authority, or whether there has to be some sort of actual harm. So it's like, well, you know, your nudes got leaked because of poor security on your device. And it's like, well, I can't prove that that caused an economic impact to me, but it causes extreme embarrassment extreme embarrassment, right? And, and, and it, is, it is the sort of thing that people do care about now. And, uh, but if, if you can't have a measurable financial or economic or physical impact, then the ability to actually you know, uh, require the company to change those practices from the FTC's perspective is limited. Um, same thing with their civil finding authority. So we have urged a couple of things. One, there's a big privacy debate that's happening now in Congress. Um, it is far beyond IoT as it ought to be. Um, we think that data security must be a part of that legislation. And one of the advantages to putting data security into privacy legislation is that it would be tied to a definition of personal information, not a definition of IoT. Earlier you heard us describing about the difficulty of defining IoT, the fact that it's bound up in a, you know, in a bunch of other technologies, and ecosystem technologies. And many of the things that we think of as IoT vulnerabilities are actually not related to the device. It's more like you've improperly configured your cloud storage. So that would help take care of that. We hope that that legislation would beef up uh, the FTC's authority to regulate on data security uh, practices without the limitations that I had mentioned before. And, and if they don't, I mean, if, if it's not, the states are in fact moving in that direction. Some, some 24 states do have, uh, uh, have uh, data security legislation, but it varies on the details. Uh, separately, we have said that agencies ought to all look at um, uh, articulating how IoT fits within their authority, their existing areas of jurisdiction. There may be like some sort of uh, impulse to say, well, there just needs to be a new agency that does everything on cybersecurity, and that's ridiculous. You know, we have agencies that have deep domain expertise on things like cars, you know, things like medical devices, and these are cars, these are medical devices. Just because they have internet in them doesn't mean that they're not cars or medical devices anymore. Um, and then lastly, one of the things that NIST is doing, and but anyway, we hope that it will, uh, that it will be successful, is the idea of a label, the idea of uh, some sort of transparency. Consumers do have a role in buying secure IoT and in maintaining the security of, of their IoT and having some sort of a, a, a label, seal, transparency mechanism, whatever you want to call it, that lets consumers differentiate their products, not just based on cost, but also on security features we think will help them fulfill their role and their responsibilities. Thanks. Um, so one of the things that, uh, so we didn't spend too much time talking about this, but uh, Harley just mentioned it and it's discussed in our paper a little bit is, um, in order to have a label, you have to have something to, that qualifies to get a label. And so there's a process underway at NIST to develop a security capabilities baseline. Um, that was an element that was concluded in the roadmap that we keep sort of referring back to. Um, I think there's a sort of summer, late summer, maybe sort of draft timing. Um, there is legislation that's been proposed uh, by Senator Warner, um, and I'm forgetting whose co-sponsor was, Gardner, Gardner um, to uh, essentially require the capability, the capabilities baseline be developed to enhance uh, for federal, federal procurement purposes, if I didn't get that exactly right. Um, what we proposed in our paper is that something like that could then be followed on with a label that would attach to products that qualify and meet the capabilities. Because as Adam, I think, mentioned, the government is the largest procurer of goods uh, at this point. And so if there is, there is a sort of um, 
a uh, trickle up effect, if you will, the rising tide lifts all boats idea that if the government is procuring products just like Energy Star that met a certain set of requirements, that would help lift industry and then thereby consumers as well. Um, well, we won't go too far down the road of that. I don't know if Harley wants to give someone to start that. Just to, just to note that <coughs> the things that we're talking about in are, are hotly debated right now, and the, the debate is happening now in Congress. So on a, on a transparency label, or on government procurement, or on a, a security baseline for IoT devices. And some of the pushback that you're seeing, particularly from large uh, traditional business trade associations, is that it, it can't be done. It's, 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 it's going to stifle innovation. It's, it's impossible. You know, we should just move on a fully voluntary basis. As I've tried to describe, I think that voluntary basis has failed, particularly for consumers and particularly on low-end devices. Um, I also think that for for the baseline that NIST is putting together, many of the many of the, the, the items that will be in that baseline have been in uh, best practices guidance guidance documents for 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 years. Like we don't need another another best practices document or another framework to say that if an IoT device is storing personal information, that information ought to be encrypted. We don't. You know, we've heard a long time for a long time that IoT devices need to have some sort of way to push security updates to the device. Um, it's it's really it's it's uh, I'm very skeptical of the idea that another set of best practices is actually going to suddenly cause, uh, particularly again, the uh, manufacturers of low-end devices to say, oh, we should probably include these in here because it's now in this new set of best practices, even though it's been going around for a long time. These are not just best practices for IoT devices; they're best practices for computer security in general. So um, we've talked a little bit about what's been going on in the space, what's being, being, what are the security threats, particularly as it relates to IoT. We haven't spent as much time as I think we all intended to speaking directly about how it impacts marginalized communities. Um, but there are, as Harley and others have said, there's ongoing debate, there's an opportunity to get involved in the debate. Um, I had a follow-on question, which was how can, particularly these communities, what advice will we give them to become, uh, to get better involved in the conversation? But we'll save that. Uh, in the event that we don't have any audience questions. Questions from the audience, otherwise I'll keep going. Anyone, anyone, Bueller? <laughs> uh, one quick, I'll have to just cover the day. One quick question, the Internet of Things, big things, automobiles. So cars, are, the new generation of cars will be able to talk to each other. So one car will know that another car is coming through very fast and hit the brakes, but there's two evolving languages that are caught. In a policy form, should there be a policy to make one language instead of two? And second of all, how secure do you think it will be that somebody else can't get in and talk to everybody's car? So I'll try to sort of repeat the question, which was um, secure, excuse me, vehicles are B2B, vehicle to vehicle communications are emerging right now. In fact, PK put a paper out about a year and a half ago or some comments um, in the process that the FCC was leading. Um, how do we, there are two different standards for communicating that are emerging. The question was, should there be a policy that dictates that there should only be one standard? And then the question is, how secure is this B2B communication? Anyone want to take that? <laughs> I don't know the answer to that question. I, I mean, I can see both sides of it. I know on the one hand, I'm not, I'm not sure whether it is you know, the, the role of government to choose the, the language that the two cars are speaking, I mean, that might be something that is better for the market to work out. Um, in terms of whether, you know, in terms of whether everyone would be able to speak to every car, I mean, that is, that sounds like a, a, a really huge problem. Um, and one that ought to be, one that ought to be adequately addressed before it hits the road. I mean, it's, it's not, not that it wouldn't come with safety benefits, but if the risks are, uh, are, are severe enough, then I think that the technology needs to wait. Um, but I'm, I'm sure that that's being that that's being looked at and addressed. Um, one thing, one thing that I know that uh, is attendant to that problem is the idea of spoofing. Right? Is, uh, is they'll say, well, 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 we'll fix the problem by just making it making it so that you know you're, we're, we're sure that the cars are only talking to other cars, and the other cars will have you know, some sort of an ID number or something like that. Well, that that ID can be spoofed, and you know a, a bad actor can say, well, I'm actually that car over there, and so forth. Um, so it's 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 a real problem. Um, I don't think that there's necessarily a law or regula a new law or regulation that needs to be um, put into place about it because we already have uh, anti-hacking laws and vehicle safety laws that I think would cover those scenarios. Um, so I guess we'll see. I think one of the questions too is whether the incentives back to this question about what will it take for there to be for, for vehicle manufacturers to ensure that they've done everything they can before they put the vehicle on the road. 
Um, so out of, out of lots of circumstances, segue. Um, sorry. Did you have something to say? Um, no, no, no. Okay. I, mean, I do, but that wasn't segue. Yes, okay. No, sorry. <laughs> That's what I was saying. I wasn't saying. Okay, yeah. So, um, so yeah, I, I don't know enough about the particular, the, the competing standards. I will say that um, a lot of times these things are sorted out through international standards bodies. And, and a lot of what, another role of NIST is to make sure that <laughs> Uh, U.S. participation in those standards bodies is um, is coordinated, and departments and agencies know what their role are. We participate in a lot of those international standards bodies as well, um, and that's I, I think that's also an important question here overall, right? Is um, you know we, we've talked a lot about what the U.S. is doing, but given that this is a global market and a lot of these devices are being made overseas, you know, what is the rest of the world doing, and um, how can we have an impact? On products that might be outside of the scope of our regulatory reach are, are also big questions that we think about. So we do look at what's happening in the international standard space quite a bit. We actually put out a report last year that, um, that tried to do a high level analysis of where some of the gaps are. I think the communications, um, means of communications is, is another important topic here. Um, and I think it's a good IoT example overall, right? Because you're gonna have the cars communicating not just with other cars, they might be communicating with things on the highway. Um, there might be a law enforcement component of that as well. Um, we are seeing some of the impact of data localization laws, back to this question of privacy, right? If you're, if you're looking at the old model and you're concerned about what, where data might be going, you're trying to set requirements or, or trying to put the power in the consumer to decide what you're doing, uh, what, what something you own is doing with the data, you can start thinking about use cases with automobiles, you know, made in one country, you're driving in another country, and, and the data is trying to make those sorts of decisions. You quickly get into a very, very difficult use case. Um, when do you, as the person driving the car, do you have to, you know, put, click on the windshield? Yes, I agree. Yes, I agree. Yes, I agree. Um, so those are the sorts of things that are breaking existing models, and there are other things that we have to think about. Right. So the question is whether um, over the air, as sometimes we call it, updates to deployed IoT products, um, whether those should be automated or you should have the opportunity to opt out. Or they, um, so I think Harley mentioned a little bit about that, but I don't know if there are others who want to. Was that your question? Yeah. Whether you can opt out? Well, well is well, there a policy approach in place? Enacting security upgrades with IoT devices. So as uh, Harley mentioned, there's some security upgrades with IoT devices. So as the consumer devices would be able to keep up in terms of not getting hacked into or not being set with their data. So the the feature that you talked about, about a security update, we think is critical. And we think ought to be part of any baseline for IoT security without a very good reason not to. And because, oh, because no matter how good your security is gonna be, devices ship from the warehouse with bugs. It's, I mean, there's millions of lines of code. Even for very, for very simple devices, you know, there, there are, there are you know, there's actually a lot, a lot of complexity to them. Um, and of course, more sophisticated, sophisticated devices, there's, there's there's so many moving parts that there will inevitably be bugs. And so you know, even if you're going through secure development at the, you know, from, the, from the start, there will have to be some way to fix known vulnerabilities after it is already in the field. And the way that you do that is with updates. And there are several different ways to update the device. One of them, which is pretty old school, is used in like infrastructure areas to have to have a technician physically on site to plug something in to deliver the update. But that doesn't scale, right? That, that just does not scale in, in, in a consumer world. Um, there's automatic updates, right? So that they just push it, push it in, in, an update out. And you might think that that's the best way to do it, but there are some perils there. So one of the, um, uh, I think it was WannaCry, the, the WannaCry attack, which is a, a malware attack that took out a bunch of hospitals. One of the problems that they had there was that it was taking advantage of, uh, of an automatic update feature. Um, to, uh, to, to infect different machines. Um, but not having an update feature is the worst option, we think, because then you have vulnerabilities that stay, they don't get addressed, and there's almost nothing you can do about it except recalling the device. And that means 
contacting the consumer, making the consumer care enough to take out their device, send it back, and so forth. And this was one of the things that exacerbated the Mirai botnet. So the Mirai botnet was the one that involved a lot of internet cameras, took down uh, infrastructure, critical infrastructure, uh, information infrastructure in large swaths of North America and uh, in parts of Western Europe. And it was exacerbated because they could not update those cameras. Um, so yes, we think that it is really a very important feature, one that ought to be included inside of any baseline. And we think that that baseline, um, there's a few more features that we think ought to be part of the baseline. We think that baseline ought to figure into uh, what agencies are saying, this is our expectation for IoT security. And we think that it ought to figure into what, uh, what ends up being the reasonable security standard for personal information in any privacy legislation. So in our paper, just to bring it back to a little bit to the cyber, um, security shield, we said that essentially these, the ability to update ought to be uh, a, quali a qualification requirement for a product that might be otherwise qualifying for the security shield label. Um, and I think, Adam, I'm pretty sure that that's also part of the Warner Gardner bill. Um, and I think that's part of a few others that have been introduced. Uh, anybody want to add on? Please. So I, I, one thing that uh, we didn't kind of, because um, it, it takes a minute to talk about education and awareness, yeah. right? Um, so that's a big one. I know. I, I know that's a big one. So when we talk about small businesses, small, medium-sized businesses and, and micro-businesses, um, I, I can't stress enough that I understand. I'm, I'm a computer scientist. I'm a software engineer. I understand security by design and privacy by design. Absolutely. But the education awareness needs to be there. Um, it's very anecdotal, but I do have people contact me all the time saying they bought the, you know, this device. Uh, what should they do? You know, they keep the default password. So there's, there's things, of course, we talked about that they need to do. But also uh, to understand that the language needs to be clear. Right? So every time you open up an app or a device, they all have what we call EULAs, right? The end user licensing agreements. Um, and most folks don't pay attention to it, right? You just accept or you hit it, you know, yes, right? Whatever, you just click on, let me let me move on and try to install this thing, right? Um, and I'm a computer scientist and I don't even understand the language, right? So it's, it's one of those things that we need to, I, I'm loving the label uh, idea and the security uh, baselines and understanding, I mean, something simple where companies, especially small, medium-sized businesses and micro businesses understand at least what the potential risk may be. And let it be there, like you said, to, to be able to discern, you know, should I accept this risk or should it, there's ways I can mitigate it and so on and so forth. Because they are part of the supply chain, right? We talk about third party risk, right? So these are things that we really need to just uh, make sure we uh, get the information out there, get the training. Um, if you don't know where to go, if you're a small, medium-sized business and, or micro-businesses, there's um, different organizations. Um, not as many support, unfortunately, but there's like the association of, I think, um, uh, entrepreneurial, I think, uh, entrepreneurship opportunity. There's your local minority uh, development uh, business organizations that you have in the community. Um, SBA, right, Small Business Association, they have some assistance as well and resources. Um, so yes, you have to try to do your homework as well. So yes, thank you. So I'll give a quick plug to two things. First of all, um, the Global Cyber Alliance, the organization for which I now work, just released earlier this year something called the Small Business Cybersecurity Toolkit, Small Medium Sized Business Cybersecurity Toolkit. It is pretty straightforward. If you go to Global Cyber Alliance, you can find it. Um, and more importantly, or not more importantly, but equally as important, sure. the idea or the, the need for uh, awareness and education raising is part of this roadmap that we keep referring back to. I think it's important, though, to also remember that. First of all, there's only so much the government can do. They have limited resources, the budget keeps shrinking, so if we have some friends who have some spare change that they might help share with folks like NIST and DHS and others in this ecosystem, that would help a lot with the education and awareness raising. But there are a lot of companies that are also involved in this space, some of whom are very proactive in trying to enhance user awareness and education. Um, Microsoft, I think, has been a supporter of PK, so has Google. Um, not to endorse them per se, but they are doing a lot to try and move the needle. There are others who are not, and I think from the consumer standpoint around the advocacy space, there's an opportunity to push corporations that are developing these IoT devices to be more responsible in their development and use of them. Um, we have one more minute, so maybe we can do two questions. I think it's one more minute. So I appreciate the panel's broad view of what's going on with IoT. I'm interested from a policy perspective, though. Do you see more focus, not on the federal level, but at the state and local level? Are there governors and local 
state entities that are looking at this as a practical issue they want to address because the feds are too slow and they're not doing it in a uniform fashion? Hypothetically. Or are they waiting for the private sector to say, oh my gosh, we have to respond to something that happened? And if not, why not? Sorry. Right. I think everybody heard the question, which is what's happening at the state and local level around this. Are they waiting for the government to step in? Or are they are they um, acting themselves? And I think I'll quickly answer the short version is a little bit of both. Um, we've spoken a little bit about the uh, work underway in a number of states around uh, data breach and data security notification requirements. Um, the National Governors Association has been active in cybersecurity. That's what about IoT, not just cyber. Cyber right. Um, I think the, question, the answer to that that I have is I'm not entirely sure, but the fact that I'm not sure is... I can speak to it, I can speak to it a little bit. So the, the main action is actually happening overseas. Um, it's happening in India, China, the, and now uh, the European Union. The but if you're looking online. just at, at states, so uh, states are, in fact, looking at IoT-specific legislation. Do to to um, California already passed it. Um, it's, it comes online in 2020. Um, it's sort of the, it's tied in a weird way to the California Consumer Privacy Act, so it's, there's, it's a, there's a bit of limbo there. But it essentially says that you can't have unique, or, or you can't have default passwords that are shared across many devices. So it's essentially a unique default password uh, requirement. To my knowledge, that is the first IoT-specific uh, state legislation. Um, 24 states have data security legislation, but it only applies to personal information. They all already have, all states and all territories in DC have data breach notification, and that's ineffective for, for other reasons we can get into later. Um, the uh, um, other states and other localities are looking at IoT. I heard that uh, Houston, as an example, is looking at a security requirements for their procurement of IoT as they rebuild post Harvey. So yes, the federal inertia on this issue are, is, is leading to other uh, entities, other states, locals, and particularly international governments to take charge. I know we're running low, but just a 10 second add on. I think a lot of them are looking at it in the context of smart cities as well. Well, that is a wrap for us. I think some of us are sticking around for a few minutes. If not, um, you can find us. And thanks, everyone. Again, thanks, Elisa. And thank you to our panelists for joining us this morning. And to happy your <laughs>
also leads media and analyst relations for the company, as well as the company's digital equity initiative, Starry Connect. And as you all know, all of this, these devices that we're talking about today, they don't work if we don't have the internet. So uh, Virginia is going to be talking today about the importance of digital inclusion, making sure that everyone has access to affordable and robust broadband. Yeah. Thank you, Elisa, for that kind introduction. It's really wonderful to be a part of today's event talking about all of these emerging technologies um, that, while nascent today, will become part of our daily lives in the not too distant future. When we talk about the potential for artificial intelligence, the Internet of Things, or platforms that utilize virtual or augmented reality, we often overlook the one thing that enables access to all of it the internet, or more importantly, access to the internet. I don't think there's anyone in this room that would disagree that access to affordable, reliable broadband is critical to our daily lives. And yet today, more than 20 million Americans still lack access to broadband, and millions more are underconnected in both rural and urban areas. These emerging technologies have the potential to affect positive social change and lift up marginalized communities but they will never meet their full potential without ubiquitous, affordable broadband. Today, when we talk about broadband access, most people often associate it with cord cutting and the ability to Netflix and chill. But the truth is, internet access has become fundamental to participation in our broader society. Sure, you can stream great television shows and movies and make Instagram stories to your heart's delight, but broadband access enables all of us to do this and so much more. It's the bridge to job and educational opportunities, access to health care and social services, it even makes filing our taxes easier. And at a most basic level, internet access enables human connections to a wider community and the world around us. Electricity fundamentally changed our economy and how we live. Internet access is the modern equivalent. So how do we make sure all our communities are connected? How do we ensure that millions of Americans don't get left behind and are able to share in the benefits of broadband and all these wonderful emerging technologies? How do we narrow and close the digital gap? With technology companies like Starry, the way we deliver internet access to the home is changing, and that's a good thing. Starry is innovating wireless last mile connections that reduce equipment and network deployment costs by nearly 100 times. Today it costs roughly $2,000 to pass a home with fiber. With Starry's technology, that passing cost is reduced to less than $20. And we can connect homes and apartment buildings without having to tear up streets and sidewalks and without having to access public rights of way. The efficiencies we've built with our technology create massive cost savings for consumers, which is why we can offer both $50 and $15 service plans. So why does a company like Starry even care? Our company was built on the fundamental belief that connectivity is a social good. The more people that are connected, the better off our communities. But there's always been a massive imbalance in the internet service provider marketplace. More than 60% of our country has only one choice when it comes to broadband providers. And it's much higher when you get to the block and building level in each community. This massive market imbalance didn't feel right to us. And so we set out to build a technology that was cost efficient and could easily scale because fundamentally we believe that competition. All right, so I'm going to introduce our moderator for this panel. Uh, Chris Lewis is the vice president as public knowledge and leads our organization's advocacy on Capitol Hill and other government agencies. Prior to joining Public Knowledge in 2012, Chris served as the Federal Communications Commission as Deputy Director of the Office of Legislative Affairs and advised the FCC Chairman on legislative and political strategy. And Chris loves 3D printing, you all. He's very excited about this panel. He's excited for the showcase later. And he's basically like everyone else at Public Knowledge who hasn't experienced it before very excited about the 3D printers. So no further ado, Chris. Thank you, Elisa. Thank you, everyone, for coming out. Uh, we've got a few more things being brought up here to the front, uh, but uh, while we're in transition here, um, uh, thanks also, uh, I'm sure it's been said, but it can't be said enough, thanks to uh, folks who helped sponsor and put on this event, uh, the folks at the Internet Association, uh, our friends at Google. I uh, would really appreciate your support on this annual tradition. Uh, 
uh, of the Emerging Tech event, Elise is right, I, I do love 3D printing. Uh, I fell in love with it at my first one of these events, uh, uh, where this used to be just a 3D printing event, now it's expanded. Uh, to all sorts of great emerging technology. Uh, okay. But I'm glad I get to yeah. moderate the 3D printing mm -hmm. panel because this is where we started. So thank you guys for being on our panel. Thank you all for coming back. Here comes Richard, our final, uh, our final panelists. Um, so uh, with this panel on 3D printing and, and social good um, and social change, uh, we have a fantastic uh, group of experts up here from the 3D printing community and 3D printing space. Um, I'm going to give each of them a chance to talk about uh, first uh, who they are, uh, what, what they represent, uh, and the work that they do, um, and, uh, and to introduce themselves. <coughs> but before we start going down the line, uh, we're going to try something here since uh, this event uh, certainly represents innovation and, and, uh, and trying new things and new technology. <coughs> You'll see that we have these boards up here to the right. And uh, 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 our friends at uh, 3D Connect Printing, uh, where Richard works, uh, have, have come up with this idea that we're going to try and see how it works. Uh, but as our speakers talk, uh, we have three categories up here. Questions, uh, the second one? Yeah. truths and myths about 3D printing. And so if you're not familiar with this technology, or, um, or you have a question, or a truth, or a myth that you want to test, uh, we'd love for you to uh, write it down. And our, our friends at, uh, at 3D Connect Printing uh, will be floating throughout the room and can give you uh, a sticky pad of paper, uh, or a sticky note, and you can write down your question, your truth, or your myth, hand it to them. They'll put it up here, and we'll see if there's any that we want to address uh, towards the end of the panel, okay? Uh, so we're going to give that a try. Where are our friends from, from 3D Connected Printing in the room? We're going to help us out. Say hi. Uh, Matt. Matt. Rita. Rita, right there in the middle aisle. Yeah. All right. So if, if you have a truth or a myth or a, a question, you can write a hand to them. Just raise your hand. They'll come to you. Uh, Matt and Rita. All right. So with that, we're going to get started on, on the panel. Um, and to kick us off is our, our friend from uh, 3D Connected Printing, uh, Mr. Richard uh, Brown, and he's going to talk about his work and his uh, uh, view on 3D printing for social media. Right. Please take a I hate it when people don't use mics or don't don't use it right. So I'm Rich Brown. I'm the, one of the founders and the CEO of 3D Connected Printing. We are a small company, 12 people, who we just develop our own products. We 3D print them and we sell them on the internet, a couple different channels at craft fairs and B2B where we sell a number of products to one company and they give them to the customers or key people. Um, I wanted to mention <clears throat> kind of how we got into this because people are always asking, how'd you decide to do this? We, we had developed a prototype in another industry of a product. And as we were doing it, we realized there always are connectors, there always are pieces, boxes, there are things that no one sells, you know, that, and in order to acquire them, you have to either go to a machine shop, I see this gentleman's nodding, or you have to use a 3D printer. We went to a 3D printer with this device, and we said, can you copy it? And he said, sure. And, uh, but he wanted a month. A month later, it wouldn't fit. It was wrong. He said, give me another month. I gave him another month. It was still wrong. So then we ordered a Prusa kit and built it. And two hours after we got it running, we had our part. And then everybody said, forget about the other business. We need to do this. <laughs> and so we did. Uh, we have an unusual team, we have a dozen people, including four people under the age of 16, and two 75-year-old electronic engineers who are very important in the organization, and, and every age in between. Um, we learn from each other, we learn from the older ones, we learn from the younger ones. Uh, Hannah was teaching me Photoshop the other day, she's 12. Okay. Um, so, and our people have come from maker spaces, 
They've come from engineering school. They've come from um, art backgrounds. You know, it, I think one of the nice things about 3D printing is it's growing so fast that there's lots of room. There's room for people of, who are minorities. There's room for women. There's room for older people. It doesn't matter. And it is growing. According to Terry Wollers, who is the big expert on 3D printing, 3D printing is growing 36% a year. It is still tiny. It's a very small slice of industrial production, uh, less than one-tenth of one percent. But because it's growing, it represents an opportunity to get in on the ground floor. Um, the Okay, we've handed, uh, okay guys, have you handed out the uh, stickies? Yes. Okay, they're out. So, as we're talking, please note a truth about 3D printing on one uh, and a question on another and a myth, something that people believe but you don't think it's true. Um, <clears throat> 3D printing is one of several new technologies that are that follow Moore's Law. Who in the audience uh, knows Moore's Law? Okay, what's Moore's Law? Um, that the amount of processing power will double every two years. Pretty close. The, the cost of a computer decision is cut in half every two years. Okay, and that's been true uh, for 50 years. Some of the other things that follow Moore's Law are sensors. We don't think much about sensors, but they're very important. They're in everything. And now there are diapers that have sensors, okay? Um, they cost two or three cents now. They were $30 not very long ago. Also, there's the human gene genome. Who here has had your genome figured out by 20th, 3andMe, or Ancestry? Raise your hand. Look at that, seven or eight people. That analysis would not have been possible but for all of this progress. Um, so let's talk about the effects of 3D printing on us. Okay, let's start with the people. One of the things that we've seen is many more young people are learning CAD, computer-aided design, from people like David, David, over here, David, um, at schools, universities, and high schools, and elementary schools and they're learning product development and engineering, which is, I mean, it's fun, it's interesting. Um, also, it's a new creative outlet. You don't just have to paint that picture or do the woodworking. You can actually develop a new product and sell it yourself and make some money. People are in new jobs where their design is part of the job. But before, you might have been a machine operator now you're going to be much more than that. So this is changing our world. Although, bear in mind, 3D printing is still a small slice of what we're doing. Uh, people are receiving implants, uh, jaw bones, teeth, bladders, joints that have been 3D printed. It's happening more and more. Um, we're testing those things like livers and kidneys in, in animals now. Before long, this terrible problem of needing that kidney is going to go away. Um, but it'll take four or five years. Um, people are benefiting from customized products requiring good fit. Um, I understand now there's a company that's doing bras, brassiers, that fit you better than the ones you might buy. I've never worn one. but. They're there. Um, uh, shoes, earplugs, headsets, sheet machine masks, sleep machine masks, diving masks, all these things that require fit. People are starting to 3D print them. Disabled children and adults, Maria's going to talk about that, um, are benefiting from receiving 3D printed prosthetics. And disabled people who need prosthetics have a tough time. It's really it's a hard thing. Um, talking, and then we can talk about products. Basically, we're shifting toward customized products. We're shifting toward the thing that you need when you need it. And 
th even things like automobiles are now being revised, not once a year, but monthly and quarterly. So I think we all see this effect. We see, don't you? You see products that are more for me than what we used to have. Um, in summary, I just want to say that 3D printing um, in the future, you will be able to use something until it no longer gives you joy, a la Marie Kondo. And so instead of putting it in the garbage bag as she shows on her videos, you're going to recycle the contents and 3D print what you do need. Okay, that's the distant future. Um, that's, that was my intro. Okay, we don't see any stickies yet. Please, uh, okay, go on. All right. Yes, so please, we're going to keep going down the panel, but please uh, raise your hand if you need one or if you have one to turn in, and we'll, we'll come back and see what we've got. Uh, but as we keep going down the panel, uh, next we have uh, David Preet, uh, who is one of our uh, uh, two academics here uh, from the university. Uh, he's with the University of District Columbia, and uh, he's going to talk a bit about his work. Go ahead. Hello, everybody. I think that you show, right, you, you, you did a summary of uh, the entire 3D printing world in, the, in five minutes. Uh, so I'm David De Prete. Um, I'm an architect and uh, an artist and educator. Uh, my background is actually um, strange because I started with uh, making small things. Uh, I had a degree in uh, jewelry and uh, metal smithing uh, from the East of Art in Venice. And after I studied architecture, so I worked for several years um, uh, in Italy and here in the United States designing and making big stuff, right? And, um, but when I moved to the United States, uh, I had the opportunity to study uh, sculpture. And I did my MFA and my MA in, uh, in sculpture. And I started thinking about uh, all the experience that I had before in 3D modeling and um, animation. Uh, computational design uh, during my uh, architecture work and I started working with uh, uh, a, com a combination of uh, new technologies and traditional ones like uh, 3D printing, 3D scanning and uh, uh, casting from uh, metal casting from uh, EBS and PLA so uh, I think that in 2010, 2009, 2010 I was one of the uh, first trying to uh, melting down practically everything that I was 3D printing in order to create bronze sculptures and uh, uh, aluminum sculptures. Um, so my professor actually let me, you know, doing a lot of uh, experiments with it. Um, I was lucky um, when I started working with the uh, Corcoran Co uh, College of Art, uh, uh, they gave me a, a small grant and some, some money to study Fab, Fab Academy. And so I, I study digital fabrication and a little bit more electronics and uh, uh, computational design and uh, programming. And I, I was, I mean, overwhelmed by the uh, incredible amount of uh, uh, information that, uh, that you can use and in, in order to create uh, an artwork. And when I started working as a professor um, in the DMV area, I, I tried to create a class uh, uh, that could teach students um, even in introductory classes the use of new technologies and the use of uh, 3D printing, 3D scanning in an easy way using uh, easy tools, uh, something um, easy to understand and, and, and to manage. Um, Right now, I have uh, I teach practically a couple of classes. I teach sculpture, introduction to sculpture, advanced sculpture, and uh, uh, in a class that I developed um, six, seven years ago, uh, that is called sculpture in technologies. So it's a combination of uh, uh, traditional uh, sculpting techniques, so um, carving and you know additive with clay and and uh, uh, all the new technologies that uh, help us to produce pieces in uh, art, artworks in, uh, in an easier way. Um, so uh, I think that uh, um, it's going to be up just at the beginning of you know, discovery what, uh, what 3D printing can give us. Very good, and, and I have some more questions come back to you about 
uh, some specific uses that I know you've been working on. Uh, but next we'll go to, to Sergio uh, Picozzi, if I'm saying that right, uh, our other academic from Catholic University. Uh, and, uh, and please tell us a bit about your work uh, that you're doing at Catholic and how that impacts marginalized communities. Right, so I am a physicist, but I'm currently serving as a professor at, in the department of uh, in the School of Engineering at Catholic University, in particular material science and engineering. And as a subset of that program, uh, we have been pushing this uh, professional certificate in additive manufacturing, aka printing. Uh, so this all came from interacting with the industry leaders, uh, military leaders. So the director of my program is a retired Navy admiral. So he has lots of connection with government and in particular with the, uh, with the US Navy. And so talking to many of their leaders and to, uh, again, industry leaders, uh, it became apparent that uh, the technology has far surpassed the level of education in the field. So there are lots of wonderful, shiny, uh, fantastically uh, looking machines out there, but the uh, level of skills needed to make the most out of those machines is lacking. Uh, and uh, research has backed up, uh, research conducted, for example, by the lights of Lloyd's or um, uh, Stratasys itself, uh, backs up the fact that um, in order to fully uh, explore and uh, implement the uh, potentialities of additive manufacturing, we need an educated workforce. So using a 3D printer or actually conducting an additive manufacturing process, which is more than just 3D printing, is not just a matter of pushing the print button. Uh, you actually have to be knowledgeable about the science behind it, uh, behind, uh, you have to know how the technology works and uh, you have to be able to also make decisions. Like for example, this is a wonderful uh, pump impeller printed in metal. So I don't know if you can see it, but the geometry is extremely intricate. So this would be very difficult to make with traditional casting methods. So it looks fun. But are you confident that you can install this part on a mission critical application and make sure they will not fail? Like are you confident, for example, you can install it on a helicopter as part of a rotor, for example, and make sure that it will not fall out of the sky. So very little research has been done on, uh, on this subject, because you know the manufacturers basically vouch for the geometrical accuracy of their parts, but in terms of the microstructure of the part that ultimately determines its performance in service, very little has been done on the topic. So we felt that we needed to uh, fill in that gap, both in terms of uh, explaining uh, what's behind this otherwise amazing technology, but also enabling uh, decision makers to figure out whether they could give a green light. It's like, okay, we got a green part, it looks great, but can I install it? Can I put it into service? So three components, the science behind it, the um, you know, the material science behind it, then how to operate the technology itself, and then finally, the decision-making aspect. And there's also a fourth aspect with which uh, we are involved indirectly along with the uh, business school. So if you're an entrepreneur, you have to be able to make a decision whether you do have a business case for adopting this technology. So I can make this part, it's fine, but can I make it, uh, cheap more cheaply, more affordably than with traditional methods. Uh, it depends on many, many factors. And you may have the best technology in the world, but if in the end your business case is uh, weak, uh, you end up on the losing end of the proposition. So it's a very complex um, uh, enterprise, so to speak. Now, how would that affect marginalized communities? Uh, so let me start from a very strange place. Uh, you know, in the Middle Ages, you could be imprisoned, even tortured and maybe beheaded, if you spoke ill of the monarch. Uh, if you say, if you made unflattering remarks about the powers that be. So that's ultimately, this was of course outrageous, and so that's ultimately where the issue, the uh, concept of freedom of speech came about. 
you cannot be in prison for speaking ill of the authorities, and God knows if we do it these days. Uh, uh, freedom of speech, freedom of expression, freedom of religion, other civil rights, those are all terrific. But let's face it, do they really matter if we cannot put food on our table? So if you're hungry, it doesn't matter that you can express yourself freely. Uh, you know, you, you don't make it till the end of the day. So my belief is that uh, social justice equality begins with economic opportunities. And this technology, this suite of technology that is known as additive manufacturing, is potentially a great enabler of social justice and social equality via the democratization of the manufacturing process. So before this technology, uh, sure, you will get uh, a degree, you will get some kind of skills, and then you counted on a big company such as General Motors or the likes to uh, be so gracious to hire you. Uh, and there could be a lot of barriers towards that accomplishment. It could be that perhaps uh, you know, you have taken a couple of wrong turns in your life for whatever reason and they look bad on your resume and they would disqualify you. It could be that uh, for whatever reason you had not had access to the right education. So that could essentially be a, a deal killer for you. Uh, and so you'd be relegated to one of those entry level jobs for the rest of your life. Whereas now, uh, as long as you are enterprising enough, if you're clever enough, and if you have the discipline of learning the ropes, uh, you don't need to ask permission of you know, General Motors, Boeing, uh, that is so good with planes these days, uh, to give you a job. But you could start your own operation. The entry level, the entry fee, is not as prohibitive as it used to be. You know, if you want to decide to, you want to make cars, right? You need hundreds of millions of dollars worth of capital. You don't need that amount, not even close, to start a small 3D printing operation. Just to give you an example, uh, say you know you have a washing machine and a part of your washing machine fails. So you contact the manufacturer, they let you know that uh, they discontinued that model, but they will be happy to sell you a new washing machine. Now you don't need a washing machine, you need a $20 replacement part, right? So the day will come in which you can just walk across the street to an establishment not unlike a FedEx anchor or something, and you can have your part 3D printed for you on the spot within maybe a few hours, and you're good to go for a few tens of dollars. And that operation may be run by, you know, just uh, half a dozen people. And these people don't need hundreds of millions of dollars of capital. So uh, we, can have, we can envision, say, a network of such um, operations, especially in small communities. So if you live in a small town in the Midwest or some place like that, you, you don't need to uh, you know, send out an order for a replacement part that may come days, days later from a huge warehouse. Instead, you can have your own local operations. And you can have your parts for whatever need to be made just right for you. So these are one, this is one of the many examples in which this new technology potentially, if we get it right, uh, can revolutionize uh, you know, social order in a positive fashion. Fantastic, thank you, Sergio. And I hope you guys don't mind, I'll be moving around because I'm reading some of the great things that our audience has written up on the board and we're gonna get to those as soon as we, uh, you guys are making my job as a moderator really easy. There's, there's great stuff up here. Uh, but I wanna welcome back uh, Maria Escuela from Enable, if I'm saying it right, uh, just, yeah. Uh, welcome her back, and, and I love also that she and our other panelists have extended the tradition of bringing uh, practical things they can show, uh, actually 3D printed material to the panel uh, to demonstrate just uh, how the technology works. But uh, Maria, tell us about your work uh, at Enable. Um, well, I do, if, if you don't mind uh, passing stones. Oh. Okay. So this is to it. Okay. There you go. So, uh, in, I'll, I'll leave them first. Thank you, Thank you. Um, 
So in the bag there is a, a one pager and it talks a little bit about us, but it also yoked the 3D printing projects that we do to a number of other emerging technologies and issues. And at the very end are some bullet points, which are examples of uh, calls to action in our youth advocacy working group, which go back to two years ago when we walked the hill uh, together and asked for people to join the Congressional Maker Caucus and Manufacturing Caucus and to declare December 3rd 3D Day and include um, advocacy and highlight all of the different technologies that are involved in scanning, in animation, in AR, and in VR, as well as 3D printing. Um, and so I, um, I put that in your hands. The, and there is a small picture in the bottom, and I, I want to start with that. Um, the, that picture is our youngest designer. He holds six um, open source licenses for things that he is creating for himself. He was born without a hand due to amniotic band syndrome. There were bands in the amniotic fluid. Um, his limb became tangled in it. When there's no blood flowing, then nothing grows. So his lack of a limb, his upper limb difference, is because of something that happened as he was being formed, and it's not something that creates a sense of pain and trauma. Um, in his memory. He was born this way, it's his lucky fin. Um, he goes to camps for kids like him. Um, he designs for them. And what he has learned to do is use clay and Sculpey to adapt his toys and handlebars and anything that he wants to manipulate. When he gets it just right, then he gives it to his mother to bake. And so she is creating this concrete version of it, but that they scan it using a free app on her phone to create a digital version of it, if it really works, if he likes it, because that creates something that doesn't need to be created one off again in an artful way. It creates a solid digital version that can be recreated again and again and shared. And that's what they do. They share it under his name, since he's done the work, um, as a, an open source license so that anyone anywhere in the world is able to adapt the handlebars of their tricycle or hold a paintbrush or hold a Harry Potter wand when they go out. And so these are, um, these are things that, that this, this little boy does. When he first got that hand, it operated um, like the hand of that guy. Um, it was something that was 3D printed in this fashion. There are some pieces of it that are printed flat, and that um, not only makes it easier to print, but it also creates more structure when you heat it and thermoform it. So if you pass that if you want to. Um, the hand that you have, in the bag, this is how you would wear it. So slightly oversized, certainly. But um, the parts are all gen uh, 3D printed. The files are parametric so that as you scale them up or down, certain parts of them retain this, the uh, standard size. And so that allows you to keep using uh, standard size screws, for instance. Um, the objects that are used to put the, uh, the uh, hand form together to create a working uh, body-powered robotic hand are things that we wanted to uh, feel sure that people would be able to find just about anywhere in the world that it would be affordable and sustainable, maintainable thing. Um, so the fingertips here, the, so, and for very, very small hands, we've even cut the tips off of pacifiers to test those out as ways to give people grip. Um, these are just the silicone fingertips that you get at Kinko's or at Staples to take money or to take tickets. Um, but we've also used Plastidip. Um, we've used a number of other uh, 3D printed fingertips using TP or TPU. Um, the elastic cords that you see here uh, are just from the uh, jewelry counter section of a hobby shop, but you could also use orthodontic bands and different kinds of fingers that we have on file. Um, the static cords that are tied at the fingertips and then run through the palm of the hand and attached to the, to the wrist piece at the tensioner block. Um, the, we currently use 80 pound fishing line with a Teflon coating, so it doesn't cut into the plastic. Fishing line is commonly available. Um, it's just a very simple surgeon's knot. Every scout knows how to do a square knot and add another half. Um, on the inside here, we're using um, a, a very simple Velcro, but um, as you can see, you can 3D print those parts. We've also taken to taking our failed prints melting them into sheets and cutting them with lasers to create those parts. And then there's the gauntlet. So if you want to try this on, it's not going to fit you. Um, just put one finger inside the palm, press against the tensioner block to hold it against the back of your hand. To imagine that it's something that's been um, uh, fastened here below the wrist. By, by bending your wrist 30 degrees, <laughs> by bending your wrist 30 degrees, you're able to create enough 
of uh, enough tension, thanks, to enough tension to be able to uh, close the hand. It's going to shorten the fingers at the core and, length and lengthen the fingers across the back of the wrist. So this is a very, very old design. Um, this was the Raptor Reloaded. Uh, this goes back to 2014. Um, the hand that's going around is a Phoenix. It's much better for use in places where you're <coughs> going to be playing hard. Oh, thanks. Um, I actually look at that one. The, uh, the, uh, this is a, a modification of the Phoenix hand where if a person doesn't have a working wrist, then you're able to use the elbow. So, that, so the first object that my daughter and I worked on was actually an arm for someone who didn't have that kind of strength. And so we used aquarium tubing, we ran it across the back to attach it using a Velcro harness. Um, to the opposite shoulder, and so the lengthening of the cords across the back was not only really successful, but the muscles being used for that came from the opposite side of the body and from the waist by pushing the shoulder forward. So I'm going to pass this right around, printed parts. And then lastly, in the, in the past uh, year, we've been working on a passively closed design. This one was part of a destructive test. Um, there's a hand in the bag that shows the difference between the orientation of the print giving strength because that thumb is printed um, landscape, if you can imagine that. Um, this would be printed as if it was uh, vertical and so the, the lines of adhesion for those layers um, would make it vulnerable to breakage. So one of the things that we do in our community is engage um, very young people, uh, as young as four and five years old in building the hand. Um, we're designing hands like this for people who are even too young for medical devices because this has very large parts, it's not a chokeable. And so the first hand that like this, um, this was a prototype for it, was a father who was a prosthetist in, Cal was a prosthetist in California asking for his two-year-old son. Uh, what we found when we scaled this up was it was also ideal for another request from a runner who wanted to hold a water bottle while he jogged. So a, a hand that is like this is able to hold 70 to 76 pounds. Um, it's something that you could use to carry water, carry your groceries, do rugged work. Um, and that was a, a, a great, easy solution, something that, you know, once it's off the printer, is really quick to assemble and something that four and five year olds could do. But it was also uh, a gift that they gave to us in saying, um, instead of using PVC pipe for the forearm, what if we used laminated paper? So we call this a Jedi arm because the, the uh, young man that got the first one wanted to have a Star Wars theme. I brought it with me for the 4th of May, uh, but I, uh, I also wanted to show you that this is something that's two pieces of printing that can be done away that, um, where you have access to power for a long period of time. We have a lot of quality controls. The last piece that needs to be 3D printed is a very small ring that's based on the measurements of the person receiving it. And that this forearm, this paper in a laminated pouch is something that can be based on the art or where it's being fitted. It could be something that is gifted or shipped flat um, to make the, the shipping look less expensive. But these are things that young children can assemble and achieve the same outcomes as professionals with 15 or 20 years of experience in engineering. Um, there is nothing wrong with that. So the, um, the reason that we need to create this niche is because there are so many people in the world that do not have access to medical care for their upper limb difference. In fact, it's been estimated by the United Nations that of the 30 million people living with limb loss, 80 to 85 percent are living in fragile states. Only 5 percent of them have access to medical prosthetics that they can afford. They're estimating that 9 million people have never received medical attention for their limb difference, and that there's a global shortage of prosthetists. So we need to create citizen science scientists who are designing for themselves in collaboration with experts in their field, engineers, teachers, uh, prosthetists, medical and allied health professionals, and together in collaborative research, they're creating these open source designs so that anyone anywhere in the world could receive a free device created in service learning by the people in our network. So that's where I'm leaving it now. Thank you, Maria. That's fantastic. Um, yes. <laughs> the prosthetics are always popular at the 3D printing event. Um, please, yeah. We have about 30 minutes, and then we'll go to the board. 
so uh, a few months ago, I saw this uh, report on PBS TV from Damascus, Syria. Those are my guys. <laughs> no, no, please. I think In which basically they were talking about, uh, you know, very young men who uh, uh, communicating via internet with their American counterparts were exchanging files and were 3D printing prosthetic parts in Damascus. Because, you know, as you can imagine, the country is ravaged by the civil war. And so those parts are in short supply over there. And they could be printing those you know, prosthetic parts for, of course, victims of the conflict. Uh, and it could be done in real time. So this is something that would be impossible to achieve without this technology. Marina, you know these guys personally. I do. Yes. Oh, I'm sorry. It's all right. Yeah. So, um, Mohammed and um, uh, Ahmed and some of the others that were on that episode, um, they stayed in place during the battles. The, the volunteers stayed in place in Aden during the battle in Aden. The volunteers that went underground in Aleppo um, that I didn't find until almost exactly a year ago. Um, today, I, I asked them last April if they would begin to hold girls informal educational clubs, workshops, so that they would be able to restore the education that had been so disrupted, not just for you know the, the, the guys who are coming, but for families to come. And that's something here in the States that worked very well, that if I had families to come, and we had intergenerational, and we had girls who stayed. But um, for a year now, they've been teaching girls STEM, and they gifted their first dozen hands two days ago. So it's really, I'm glad to report that not only have they been able to stay and keep printing, but that it's been a very inclusive process. It's a fantastic story, and and we've had uh, in previous 3D printing panels folks from the Pentagon talking about how the military uses it in the field, but but everyday folks absolutely uh, can benefit as well uh, without the, the great infrastructure and bureaucracy of the military, so that's wonderful. Um, so we've got great stuff on here on the board from the audience. Thank you, everyone. Um, and, and I'm seeing some connected themes here. One of them up here in our questions, um, uh, someone asked, uh, "Can we print through? Can we three D print with sand? Uh, and what kind of materials can be used?" But also related, and I, I like the way this is phrased. What are? Uh, oh, where did it go? Uh, see, I'm losing track. There was one that up here that asked basically, uh, "What material uh, do you think uh, can have the greatest impact for social good and social change right now that you see either potential for or that you see out there right now?" Because you know, a lot of the, what we're handing around is plastic. Uh, Sergio brought metal, uh, but you can print so many different things. So let's talk about materials. Right, and I, I can uh, mention that. Is this, is this oh, oh, there we go. Thank you. Um, people are starting to build in remote areas using 3D printers to build structures. And the idea is you go to a place that is remote, that has very little infrastructure, and you use the local dirt or sand or rock or whatever it is, and you mix in binders. Okay, so we're talking 3D printing on a different scale. We're talking about building a hut, uh, building a, a school, building a house. Uh, it is being done. There are some groups working on this. They bring their solar panels with them to generate the electricity. They bring the 3D printers with them, and, and also at, it, the same process is being done in, in developed areas. People are beginning to learn how to build buildings. Uh, but you were to ask about materials. Did you have a... Yeah, I was, I was going to add carbon fiber because it's so uniquely suited to 3D printing and not carbon fiber filaments. Carbon fiber carbon itself. Fiber. Yeah. Yeah. I don't know if anyone's yeah, familiar yeah, with there's, it. There's a company that works with that. Mark Forge. Mark Forge uh, yeah, they, they specialize in it. Sergio, um, yeah. are you want to mention something? Yeah, perfect. This is a good example. Oh, this is a, this is a um, part of that type. Do you want to do you wanna pass it around a little bit? Yeah, let's pass that around. I, I, I know other folks had to, Ideas or yeah. I mean, uh, with the with, for architectural uses, I mean, a lot, a lot of companies are developing uh, technologies related to um, concrete extrusion for 3D printing of houses and buildings. Um, right now, I think that 
we have maybe in the United States we have like m more than 20 companies developing you know 3D printers for houses, and um, one actually uh, AP Score that uh, actually it was uh, was Russian I think um, they were able to print 3D print a house in, in one day in 24 hours. Uh, of course, there are a bunch of issues connected to uh, how to, you know, start the foundation and uh, add uh, all the, you know, um, mechanical plumbing, electricity, and, uh, and so on. But uh, the idea that you can actually personalize a design, an architectural design, and send only uh, a big 3D printer, practically, a uh, sort of big crane that can, you know, uh, move uh, around the center and deposit the, the concrete, uh, can be amazing in, in certain situations where you have to build uh, faster, you have to build uh, uh, with the materials that you can find local, um, and you need to personalize the design based on different uh, necessities. Uh, so I think that the same company, uh, AP Score, uh, they just won the competition for the Mars Challenge. Uh, so using the same technology, they are studying how to you know, send to the Moon or to Mars. Uh, 3D printer, use you know the, the materials that they can find in local, uh, mix it with different kind of binders and uh, that they can transform and actually build the new houses. Right. For, right. Uh, I, I have two more on this. One is there's a company called Algex that makes filament from algae, and we bought some of their. We met them and we bought some of their their stuff. The other th thing is there's so much of this plastic waste. I think. We're getting like eight trillions, eight trillion tons of plastic waste in the ocean every year. There are some groups starting to work with collecting that waste and recycling it and turning it into products that we, we can use. Mm -hmm. Maria? Yeah, if you look at the back of the card that has the little boy's picture, there are two parts. We have a lot of partners that are working on what we've been calling Project Alchemy which is uh, taking the waste plastic, returning it to the recycling stream, using it to create filament, and then printing arms and hands. There are a couple of things that need to be said about this. First of all is that um, it, it creates the opportunity to print at the point of need because the point of care can be too far away. Um, the millionwavesproject.com um, will show you on their website um, the, the, not only the, uh, the, the cases that they've uh, printed for in the Philippines, Costa Rica, and the United States, but you'll see digital badges, which are a way of credentialing people for presenting evidence um, that has been reviewed. Um, and, uh, and approved by uh, groups in our community so that this is a way that we credential people through our learning process. We use those badges to match people to the requests. Um, part of the uh, motion, I'm sorry, the, uh, the Million Waves project um, extends over to uh, the Coast Savers. So if you go to coastsavers.org, one of the people collecting waste plastic on the beach is a girl named Abby. Um, the NOAA pictures show her wearing her 3D printed prosthetic from waste plastic. Um, that uh, in the process of harvesting it. One of the youth in our community in 2014 or 2015 asked his family and his friends in this little town to save the Starbucks clear plastic cups and the clamshells, which he shredded in the family's blender, which became their old blender. And then, <laughs> and then he used it to produce filament with which he produced one of his own hands um, as a youth in our group. He is now a sophomore um, in Ohio, but uh, during his gap year, he created his own company called Form 5. Um, it was an, out, um, an, an outgrowth of his blog, which was uh, Alive with Five, referring to the fact that he only had five fingers. But he calls the company Form 5. It, it originally, it was in deference to the blog that it replaced, but also because he's using number five plastic. Um, the youth in my community, I cannot pay. I can't pay the volunteers, but I try to give them opportunities. And I'm trying to use the increasing um, cultivation and nurturing of scientific practices in our community and communication in our community to give them opportunities. So for four years now, youth in our community have been doing bioprinting. Um, in Drexel, they were um, looking at the levels of skeletal cells in solutions before they loaded syringes and began bioprinting in a, a mesh micrometrix using the secret sauce um, and other ratios to create um, a, a, a structure for the mirror image of an existing bone to create a replacement bone in a shoulder that had been crushed or in a, 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 an area of disfigurement, um, so that person was going to receive in two and a half weeks their own bone. 
Um, there are people who were printing in cartilage. Um, in Johns Hopkins, we've been printing skin and, and the burn unit on the patient in order to seal that wound. Um, there, there are a number of ways of, of bioprinting. And when we go to the FDA, we're talking about binder printing. We're talking about printing stomachs on chips to measure the absorption rates of medications. Um, for um, at NASA, there's some extraordinary things. Um, also, some other uh, other uh, industries. Um, we. Uh, joined in partnership with one of the only fire prevention programs in the country so that we had access to some heat resistant materials um, outside of the um, military industrial complex where they were uh, printing prototypes for aerospace engines uh, just so that we had more regular access but that's how we're making a hand for a fireman who lost his hand um, the uh, people who've been printing with carbon at the University of Maryland are, are truly on the cutting edge and have received one of the students who received a $25,000 grant but his problem was the same as ours, that it, the, uh, how do you put an arm on a small body that's in motion that wants to pick up something that could be very heavy and manipulated? So for him, it's a cute satellite, and for me, it's a four-year-old on the playground, and, and, and it all works out to be about the same. The service learning is incredibly valuable. Um, at Local Motors, our board member offers tours to everyone who comes in because they're 3D printing real-worthy vehicles. And that's where we're okay. getting our uh, customization station prototypes from. And quickly, Sergio. So very briefly, uh, you know, I'm teaching uh, this semester a class uh, is called Introduction to 3D Printing Science and Technology. And a few weeks ago, I gave an exam. And the first question on the, on the exam was, describe the differences between additive manufacturing and subtractive manufacturing conventional techniques. Now, of course, we could be here all day discussing all the many differences. But if you have to name just one, one difference, which is the difference. What would you think that is? What do you think that is? Added and subtracted. And yes. Between conventional fabrication techniques and additive manufacturing. The one difference that makes all the difference. Yes. Less waste. Well, that's important, but what I was thinking of is that <laughs> no. <laughs> With 3D printing, you do away with tools. You fabricate with no tools. So what if you happen to be in the middle of nowhere when you have no tools? And what if you happen to, you know, General Motors wants to make a certain car model. So they have to shut down a factory for six to eight months to retool, hundreds of millions of dollars of investment, and if the car does not sell, that's all gone. Whereas if you're 3D printing, you don't need tools. So today you 3D print what you sell today. Tomorrow you're ready to 3D print something completely different, to make something completely different. So in that sense, the technology is a huge enabler because once you don't need tools, all you need is to change your CAD file and you're good to go. Okay. Uh uh, let me let me get to, to another, another one from the board, and then maybe we come back because there's one that's on truth and one that's on myth that are related. And so let's talk about whether it's truth or a myth. Um, on truth, it says, "Here we go." Uh, truth: three D printing will be common a uh, common household appliance by 2030. But someone also put on the myth that it's a myth that having a three D printer in your home will be common in the very near future. So, our panel of experts. How soon will this be common in folks' households, and, and what sort of impact will that have? Well, I like well, I like to compare um, to compare three uh, D printing with photography. So when when photography was born in uh, eighteen thirty nine, you know there, there were artists uh, saying, "Oh, from today, painting is dead, right? Because we can take a photo, and we don't need to paint uh, and spend hours hours in order to make a portrait." Uh, now, uh, anybody uh, with basic knowledge of uh, photography, even my grandmother can take a photo, crop it, you know, change the luminosity, the contrast. So it's very common to improve this knowledge uh, in, uh, and it's part of every, every, everybody's life. So I think that we, 3, 3 British is, is actually an uh, old technology because it was born in uh, 1984, right? Chakul Chak with um, and. Uh, uh, only in 2008, 2009, when the patent uh, expired, uh, we were able to, uh, you know, open up the production of 3D printers, make them cheaper, uh, have, you know, uh, 
actually uh, more convenient um, uh, accessibility, accessibility to the to the to the machinery. And you know, as as you know, normally artists that are starting artists they, they don't have a lot of money. So uh, only in 2009, 2010, uh, artists started working with uh, uh, these materials. So I believe that uh, we are still far from having you know a 3D printer in every house and have. Um, a, a basic uh, uh, knowledge, uh, you know, to, to, to access it because you need to uh, be able to 3D model something, prepare the file uh, for uh, uh, for printing, so with a slicing software, uh, be able to um, send the file to the printer. I'm not really sure that you don't need any tools in order to. Uh, there is always some post processing of, of the parts. Uh, but I believe that we are going to see in, instead of. Uh, um, Instead of that, we are going to see a uh, personalization of the production. So uh, instead of having a 3D printer in every home, we are going to have uh, hubs or places, shops where you can go and uh, you can have your personalized object 3D printed over there. So um, you can go to a shoe shop, uh, you can 3D scan your feet, um, download the model from the internet, have uh, you know the shoes 3D printed over there and, and you know, in, in a day. Uh, so that, that I think that we are going to have in, you know... Maria, you agree? Richard, you agree? Um, in England right now, in order to uh, increase the value of the post office, the postal industry, the 3D printers are at the post office that you email them what you want and then they deliver it to you with your mail. So it's not a requirement to have a 3D printer to uh, have that kind of a service. <coughs> Um, I, I think the makerspace model is ideal, and we're seeing that in the way we're uh, making libraries that third space where people meet and do if they don't have a makerspace on hand or their schools don't have them. Right. Libraries are definitely turning into knowledge centers now. Yeah. Richard, thoughts? One of the interesting things in this year's Terry Wooler's report is that the growth in the sale of desktop 3D printers is decreasing or decreased this past. Now, uh, there's still more of them sold than the year before, but the increase is lessened. Um, that kind of, our, experience, our experience with using 3D printers is that they are, there is a learning curve. There is work you have to do to, and you have to have the file you know, Rita asked me to create a little basket to go underneath a, a coffee maker we have that would catch the water. So I created one, but it doesn't fit right. The water still leaks out. Um, this is harder than people think. So I think, yeah, did you? Yeah, I would just add that there has nonetheless been a lot of market penetration as well already, and a lot of people are learning to use the tools. And I think part of this is where the entry level printers are starting to become, the people who are willing to live with that have them, and people who aren't are going more to the professional market, which is expanding. Good, good. So, I mean, Sergio, you were talking about the importance for marginalized communities and the democratization of the technology. Uh, you know, we had questions up here about, uh, uh, you know, in order to make that possible and what you're describing, like, is there a way to simplify it for for just average folks to learn the technology, I think someone wrote up here like like a Microsoft Office for three D printing to help people make it more intuitive, and easier for people to learn how to use computer aided design. Oh, did I get that one wrong? Okay. Did you write it down? Or no? Okay. Okay. Well, why don't you post the question and then we'll talk. So it says up here, how can we make CAD more intuitive and accessible, like Microsoft Word? Uh, so that's how I took it, but I don't know if you guys have that thoughts. That actually has nothing to do with additive manufacturing. It is about uh, using a software. So CAD was invented before additive manufacturing. So I'm, I don't know what I can say about that. So it's like saying, how can I make uh, you know Microsoft Office easy to use? Right. So, I think it's important for us to teach that as part of digital literacy to our kids. Um, not only are they downloading files from sources that have integrity, um, do they know how to look at a file to see if the file they downloaded matches the intended original 
Um, but, but also, you know, they, they, uh, there's something called Morphe. It's a, one of many free CAD softwares, but it's designed to teach kindergartners how to do CAD. We have a, a project file there. Um, there are many other um, types of uh, free licenses for some or, or, or free CAD software, but I think, I think it's a, a fundamental um, way of giving, empowering people to take what's in their imagination and to make it real and to put them in the process. I think also it's fundamental to allowing people to speak for themselves or create for themselves so that you're not creating a new kind of digital colonialism um, or creating uh, another method of appropriation of someone's culture. Um, this is an opportunity for us to give skills to people who have been disenfranchised um, so that when they're designing for themselves, they have leapfrogged over that uh, manufacturing age where there would have been colonialism so that they've brought it back on a small scale so that it looks like their culture, it's coming from their culture, it speaks to the rest of us and the rest of our world, um, but that they have not learned these things in service to us, that this is a manufacturing process that belongs to them. If, if I can show an example. So this one is actually a sculpture from uh, uh, one of my students. Uh, and if you if you think that they had, uh, this one is the introduction to sculpture, right? So they had only, um, they had only two, uh, three weeks to learn uh, basic 3D scanning, uh, basic 3D printing, and uh, how to uh, modify the model, the 3D model, in order to create an object and with, with a meaning, right? Mm -hmm. So, and if you if you think about that, uh, you know, with, with a, an art piece like this uh, from uh, 18 years old, uh, 19 years old student without any previous knowledge of uh, 3D modeling, 3D printing, or even sculpting, uh, it's quite impressive how uh, the concept, you know, of duality and you know the social issues or the race mm -hmm. and gender. You know, they, they were able to create something uh, really interesting in, in just a couple of weeks and with uh, hardware that is like three, four hundred dollars and, uh, you know, software that is free. Now, you know, if you are a student, Autodesk, uh, um, you can download any, any software from Autodesk. Uh, uh, if you are a DC resident, uh, you can use uh, your DC library card to access, uh, um, you know, uh, Linda.com and have you know access to, to training. So I think that is more a um, matter of uh, simplify the process, and I think that we are actually doing a great job in terms of uh, you know promoting 3D painting, promoting additive manufacturing for. If, if I could uh, just add on, we use Tinkercad all the time, and it's not hard to learn. I watched an 18-year-old master it in three hours. This isn't. This isn't hard. <laughs> Great. It sounds like we just need to get the technology in front of you. I mean, you have young people, Maria, very young people using it, so it's just getting it in front of people. Yeah. And I think it's important also for people to understand the components in the 3D printing, where it's not just the material or the decisions that go into that design um, at that moment, um, but that it could even be the slicer um, as well as the, the CAD. And, and when people are creating their own printers, um, in places like Tanzania, they're building them out of e-waste, and we're trying to help them when every printer in the room is different. Um, they, I, I think that the remarkable thing is that the, um, that the outcomes um, are the same because they have um, the availability of free software that is getting closer and closer to what you described. So uh, there, there was a question here. You know, our theme is social change and, and social good and doing good things with technology. Someone actually asked, is there something about 3D printing that you're worried where it might cause harm? And how do we address that? How do we get in front of it? Certainly, we have, we're in a place of policy making. So uh, let's start searching them with it, Richard. So uh, before I answer this question, very briefly, I would like to add that, that um, the, uh, the hardest barrier to access this technology is not so much to how to use the software, but how to learn how to learn the design that goes with additive manufacturing. Because it's true that pretty much you can design anything you want in the virtual space, but not all that you design in the virtual space can be 3D printed by any machine. And so that's a skill that takes a lot longer to master because essentially you have to learn how to design things. It's not something, it's not about mastering a piece of software. Now, uh, in terms of harm, well, the first thing that comes to mind, of course, is the impact on employment. So um, could it be that uh, there would be fewer and fewer people needed to make things? 
I don't really know the answer because the technology is still evolving very rapidly, so I don't know which way it will go. But it's certainly a huge concern, uh, probably not as much as a concern as with um, AI and uh, robots uh, pretty much taking everybody's job. So it's not the Mexicans who are taking our jobs, are the robots, the robots. And so uh, I am shocked that no politician is talking, speaking to that, because uh, very soon, you know, you know, the ones of us that are not nuclear engineers uh, will probably have to, you know, figure yeah. out how to make a living. Richard, any other concerns? Yeah, there. One worth mentioning is intellectual property um, counterfeiting of products around the world is is a terrible problem. 30% of all medicines sold around the world are fake, are counterfeit. And people die every day because someone sold them medicine that wasn't what it said it was. Um, 3D printing will result in counterfeiting if it hasn't already. It'll also be used by bad people to create resources they need, whether it's the gun or the bomb or whatever. Uh, it hasn't really erupted in the in our face yet, but uh, those things need to be be watched. I, I believe 3D printing will create more employment because it is more complex. You, you get into product development, you get into design, you get into slicing, you get into the modeling. You're, you're taking a process that you're moving away from mass manufacturing more to customization. More people will get work because of this. Right, and a few years back, public knowledge worked with policymakers who were concerned about 3D printing guns, help them structure the laws they were writing to go after undetectable firearms, but not the technology itself. And so it'll be interesting whether it's that or employment concerns, how do we make sure that we promote the technology while addressing any concerns about unintended consequences. Ray, you got a last thought? I, um, yeah, I'll try and keep it. Sorry, we were running out of time. No, I'll keep it narrow. Um, I think that it'll create more jobs if we look at small batch manufacturing and our innovation process, because then you're creating um, things knowing that the next one's going to be better than the last. Um, I, th I think that would involve more people and bring manufacturing back to where people are, where people live. I'm concerned about the uh, security. Um, of not only of people's identity, um, of their data, um, because we're talking about something that's very bespoke, um, their, their personal information. Uh, we've been looking at um, partnership with Solid, uh, Tim Berners Lee way of uh, allowing people to create pods to hold their data, to allow people to access um, some of it and then be able to withdraw it, um, which is a completely different way of uh, sharing information than we do now. And that we've also turned to open recognitions as a way of doing credentialing um, and credentialing in an ecosystem. And then finally, blockchain. Um, I'm using blockchain to assert in an immutable timeline the intellectual property to defend open source and open hardware. Um, I'm using the supply chain um, uh, in smart contracts right now, um, monitoring using IoT for temperature. Is the filament staying at temperature? Is it crystallizing before it gets there? Um, it's, a, it, it's, it's more than just a cryptocurrency, which certainly gives you a way of allowing people who are unbanked or in fragile states ways of be receiving sustainable payment. And then for open data, when you monitor that, you can see if they're spending money on medicine and food, don't send them stuffed animals. Make sure that the next set of aid is more filament, um, more aid. Um, but the transparency um, needs to be addressed because um, you are exposing people's information, their location, and so on. So I'm hoping that we'll be more encouraging of uh, more agnostic um, blockchain pathways like Hyperledger, um, where it allows for more privacy and where the permissions are not dependent on the VPN. All right. So I'm going to do two things. One, I'm going to ask Elisa to come back up. She's going to help us dismiss the lunch. But also, can we give a hand to our fantastic panel? You guys did phenomenal. Um, thank you for being here, and we'll turn it over to Elisa with the chat. We have to shape policy on behalf of the people who have been in D.C. for a long time, forever. Those folks who are blasting the sounds of familiar faces in backyard bands, those are go-go bands, for those who don't know, outside of the T-Mobile-owned store on the corner of Ford and Georgia. 
And we have someone who is already doing that work who we can work alongside. So please welcome to the stage, Lindsay Parker. Well, thanks so much. Now, have you had lunch? Yes. Okay, great. That's all I wanted to make sure. I was, um, I, was, I was running in here trying to feed myself and realized that like, it's a good thing for all of us to, to have eaten before we talk. Um, so uh, one thing I just wanted to say, congratulations to Howard and congratulations to Public Knowledge. I think those kind of partnerships are, um, you know, speak uh, just, uh, you know, it's wonderful for me to see that happening in Washington. And this group of people uh, makes me smile. This is sort of why I like to do what I do. Uh, so, so thanks for being here today. And thanks for um, bearing with me as I sort of talk a little bit about what we're trying to do here in DC. Uh, and we can use all of your thoughts and your help uh, in doing just that. Um, I wanted to say that I, I live around the corner from that T-Mobile. Um, so it was front and center. Uh, I was not. I definitely did not call to mute the music, um, let me tell you. Um, I was on the, uh, the other side, and we had a great mayor, uh, Mayor Bowser, um, that was right alongside saying, let's not, let's not mute this either. Um, so if you, if you know anything about what I'm talking about, uh, I think you'll be happy to hear that. Um, the, so I, I wanted to start and kind of, I usually try to be a little vulnerable and give you a little sense of who I am, uh, as I uh, think it's really important as we start talking about um, shaping technology that's going to help shape our futures. Um, and so, um, you know, uh, I, I have this honor uh, for, I've had this honor for about three months now uh, to serve uh, DC Mayor Muriel Bowser and the residents of Washington, DC as the Chief Technology Officer. And so everybody goes, well, what does that mean? Uh, well, the truth is, um, I've got a team of more than 600 people um, trying to think through how we create an infrastructure to allow for the innovation that we know needs to happen uh, in our city in order to be a more inclusive and diverse uh, city, the, the, the inclusive and diverse city that we all uh, love, uh, and it's why we sort of choose to live here. Um, and so I'm gonna kind of throw back, go back a little bit. I'm, uh, I'm the product of multiple generations of public servants. Um, duty to community and country is firmly entrenched uh, in sort of everything that I think through. Uh, and I was fortunate enough to grow up um, product of a dad from um, inner city Baltimore and a mom from Delaware. Her parents like, moved around a little bit. Um, and I have no idea where I was from, but I went to kindergarten here in DC. Uh, and so here I am growing back, uh, coming back to, to the city that I know the most in the US. Um, so I was fortunate to grow up in six global cities before turning 16 uh, due to my dad's career as a US diplomat. Uh, so dinner table conversations revolved around the interplay of politics, diplomacy, trade, uh, and how that really shaped geopolitical stability um, around the globe. So uh, you can think I was in five about decision. We're gonna, we're gonna, we're gonna get there. Um, dad was assigned to uh, NATO when we lived in a Flemish speaking community uh, in Brussels about 30 years ago uh, this year. Uh, and I vividly remember watching the, uh, on CNN uh, the many hopeful faces in the crowd uh, as the Berlin Wall came down. Uh, not knowing that I was witnessing sort of a major first step uh, in the democratization of information. Um, does anybody else remember that? I think about half the crowd, yeah. All right, uh, Dad, Dad was uh, the cultural attache uh, in New Delhi, India, uh, where we lived across the street from Tata Motors. Uh, the Tata Motors Air, uh, when Parliament, uh, at that point, lifted trade barriers to allow for foreign direct investment in a country that once shunned uh, uh, free trade. Uh, add the World Wide Web around the same time, and suddenly the largest democracy in the world, once with the most obvious social stratification system, um, right, that we've ever sort of seen, right, the caste system, uh, started witnessing upward mobility and not just for the Tata family, right? I'm talking about a middle class. So with information and trade came options. Uh, and with technology came room for new ideas. Small towns became cities literally overnight. Um, our CISO today uh, in Washington is from Hyderabad. And that was a town when I moved to India, it was a town. When I left India, it was a city. Uh, and you, you probably know it. Um, in just four years, a complete shift had occurred in India, and my family and I witnessed a technology-empowered middle class grow and grow rapidly. Uh, I had a front row seat to the creation of pathways to, middle, to the middle class uh, for many who were held back for generations. 
both in the former Soviet Union, when you're thinking about the Berlin Wall, and then throughout India. Um, and I always remember a section of Thomas Friedman's book where Jerry Yang, the co-founder of Yahoo, quoted a senior Chinese official as saying, where people have hope, you have a middle class. Uh, and so technology really provided that hope in both cases that I talked about. I finally realized that the technology revolution that has taken place over the course of my lifetime, um, some of you think I'm young, some of you think I'm old, um, has led to innovation policy being my work and my passion. Uh, as I believe it's key to retaining American competitiveness. And more specifically, uh, I think it's innovation policy in our urban centers uh, that's gonna help us find a way to break those cycles of poverty uh, so that we can remain competitive, uh, and, and really so cities like Washington, D.C. can continue to grow and prosper. Uh, and so I strongly believe that cities are our future. I'm focused on it, I love it. I uh, came to work for city government. Uh, Adrian Fenty convinced me to come work for him and think about economic development policy um, almost 10 years ago, uh, and it was the best job I ever had. And so I tried to leave, I went to Symantec, I tried to leave, I, went, I worked for Gabby Giffords, uh, and I, I rapidly, uh, I loved Gabby, still love Gabby, but came back uh, as soon as uh, Muriel Bowser decided to run for mayor because um, there's a lot to do uh, and we get to do it really quickly. Um, and so we continue to look for those innovative solutions to keep DC on track, right? To become um, an even smarter city. I inherently think that cities are smart um, and what we are doing today is thinking about how to make them smarter. Um, and it's gotta be responsive to that diverse and innovative community that calls DC home. So it's our diversity that I believe is both a resource and a source for learning. Uh, it's what attracts some of the big players, think Amazon, and the startups. Um, and it's how DC has become one of the top cities in the US for inclusive, female-driven entrepreneurship. So if you don't know, DC has once again uh, been named the number one city for women in tech. Uh, most notably because women in tech are making 95 cents to every dollar our male, male counterparts make. Still more work to do. Um, DC government is, um, if you don't know this, um, I want you to know this, uh, if you take away nothing at all, uh, we're a city, county, and state, all in one. Uh, and we regulate and implement city services. Uh, we also kind of regulate ourselves, which is interesting. So we're providing a city service, we gotta go uh, get a business, uh, uh, business permit, uh, or a building permit to, to build a building for, for DC government. It's kind of a weird world. Uh, we have big challenges, and we have some of the smartest people at the table finding some big solutions. Um, smart cities is not really just a moniker here. Um, when we find a technology that solves a problem, we can operationalize pretty quickly. Um, I think some of the things that um, we're doing might surprise you. So at the Child uh, and Family Services Administration, we're testing out whether uh, virtual reality technologies can help us train social workers so they're prepared for some of the interactions that they're gonna have with parents, with foster families, with children, uh, before they're actually put into an environment where that has to uh, be realized. We recently held an innovation challenge called Gigabet DCX, uh, where we partnered with US Ignite uh, to not only offer an innovation award, uh, $34,000, pretty exciting, but also the opportunity to work with many diverse and talented entrepreneurs actually from, over, from across the globe uh, on a common goal for betterment of our city. Uh, in this case, Vision Zero. Uh, so Mayor Bowser's commitment to reach uh, zero fatalities and serious injuries to pedestrians, bikers, and other users of our transportation systems. Uh, the winners were a team of young engineers, sorry not Howard, um, you got, you weren't there. If you were there, we would have, you would have won. But um, uh, it, was, uh, it was George Washington University, a great group of kids uh, that presented an innovative approach to analyze um, video feeds um, in real time using AI uh, to help transportation planners make safety decisions uh, that matter, right? Um, and of course, uh, data is publicly available. That's something that we uh, hold uh, hold uh, preeminent. Uh, our police force, um, some of you may know, uh, Metropolitan Police Department uh, was one of the first to fully deploy body-worn cameras um, uh, for all patrol officers. So we piloted the approach. We found that while our officers didn't act differently uh, when, they had on the, when they had the cameras on, uh, the information we could glean from the footage allowed us to tailor our trainings, it allowed us to ensure our officers continue to improve their ability to connect and engage with communities, 
um, and especially communities of color. And so the mayor and the chief at that time, Chief Kathy Lanier, um, uh, there was a bunch of us in a room going, so we have to spend a whole heck of a lot of money to implement this. Um, we didn't see anything from, from the pilot that actually suggested that this would change behavior. Uh, and the mayor said, you know what, we gotta do it anyway. But we're gonna do it anyway because we wanna see how we can better uh, use technology to train, train folks in the field. Um, and so as CTO of the nation's capital, I'm tasked with looking for ways to leverage technology to securely and more efficiently uh, provide user-centric user city services, uh, making for a smarter DC. Uh, I'm working to do this by driving innovation, improving customer experience, uh, and focusing on people who can make that happen. Uh, and so that's why I'm here. You need a new job? Are you interested in doing something different? You should think about DC government. We're doing a lot of really cool things. And so uh, the, the one thing that I always talk about when somebody is like, what's the top of mind issue for uh, some of the folks uh, in government today? And I would say it's a customer relation management tool. It's a CRM tool that nobody has figured out. So, uh, you know, there's, I'm not gonna, I'm gonna be vendor neutral right now, but there are tools out there that help um, uh, the corporate world track sales, right? Um, they're, they are at sort of a linear cycle that everybody understands. Um, uh, you, you, ca you catch the person, uh, you get them excited about uh, doing it, they swipe their credit card and you move on and you try to get them to do that again next month or the next year. Um, with government, it's not really as um, cyclical as that, right? What we're trying to do is gain trust. Uh, and so one of the things, one of the challenges that I would throw out to this team um, is help me and, and help each other think through uh, tools where we can start assessing trust. So wherever a uh, constituent comes into government, right, whether that's in our school system, the police office, a fire department, um, to get a permit, to get a new driver's license, how do I use that experience to start building trust, right? And I call it rebuilding trust, because I think right now when you think of local government, you're like, Ugh, why? Why do I have to deal with you? However, um, if you think about <laughs> our Department of Motor Vehicles, I don't know if you've gotten your license uh, reviewed lately, but I hope that you've had, and if you are a DC resident, are you a DC resident? Okay. Um, you've had a better experience than the guy sitting next to you who did go to the DMV in DC. Um, that is my hope. We've done a lot of work uh, to, to streamline that process uh, over the last uh, eight years, in fact. Um, so that, that being said, I'm, I'm really working hard, and, and here it is, um, my communication team is really good. I'm working hard to retain and attract diverse and innovative tech talent to work for DC government. Um, uh, whether you're at the beginning of your career, the middle of your career, the end of your career, we can use you, um, and you can find a really interesting path forward, um, designing, thinking, uh, working with a really neat group of people. Um, and so in March, for instance, um, here's, here's a good example of folks that I hope are, are, on my, are on my team eventually. I met with a group of fourth and fifth graders uh, at Henley Elementary School in Ward 8. It's a, it's a community um, across the Anacostia River, for those of you that aren't um, from here. Um, and, it's, and, and actually the community that I was specifically in is probably experiencing some of our highest poverty rates. Uh, they were so excited to show me a robot that they had recently designed uh, for a competition. Uh, but then they quickly moved on. They're like, okay, robot competition's over. Let us tell you what else we're doing. Uh, they, they, they said, we have a business plan that we're putting together. These are fourth and fifth grade uh, girls who were annoyed that the boys were stealing their iPads um, in class. And so they turned to their teacher and said, we want to do a girls only thing. And, uh, and that's why they that's why they were a girls only uh, robotics club. I loved it. Um, but they said, we, want, we have a 3D printer uh, that we uh, wrote a grant uh, application for and got this 3D printer delivered the other week. Um, and we decided that we want to sell educational tools that we're building um, uh, on this 3D pr printer. And I was like, well, that's the coolest thing I've ever heard. Are you kidding me? Uh, and I was like, what have you learned? And they're like, well, if we walk around the halls long enough, uh, we'll hear teachers griping about tools that they need uh, to help uh, in class, whether that's a pencil holder, whether that's a, a place to um, clap out erasers. Um, no, what, 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 I can't remember the actual technology. But they, they found, they had basically walked around the halls, I think um, probably like cornering teachers to be like, hey, what do you want us to build you? Um, and they had, done, they had done such a great job um, that, that now I think they were just in the hallways here uh, last week. Um, it's called, they were called the SparkleBots. Uh, they were talking to members of Congress um, about what, what exciting things they were working on. 
So I, um, I want to make sure that they think of DC government too um, as a place that they can come and build robots to make DC smarter, right? Um, I know that some, the same creativity that drives and motivates the Spark robots is why you're all here today. Uh, prioritizing civil, civic engagement, user-centric design, tech innovation for good. Uh, and it seems to me that you're all motivated by service first, tech second. Um, as opposed to, and no offense to the congressman's office, um, another valley where tech comes first and sometimes uh, we think about the people, right? Uh, here in DC, the mayor has challenged us to ensure that everyone living and doing business in Washington, DC is giving and getting their fair share. And so I take that challenge personally. Um, I try to make sure that my team lives and breathes it every day. Uh, she really challenged us to work together, to advance, to, to work to advance together uh, and make sure that a rising tide does in fact lift all boats. Uh, and so in the recently released uh, Resilient DC plan, goal number three in the plan is smarter DC. And I'm so excited um, because we all envision a DC that embraces these advancements in technology while minimizing the negative consequences of change, while thinking about an inclusive way, the diverse audience that these technologies are gonna to have to touch and making sure that we're building solutions for all. Um, and so a smart DC is really one that works from the roots and finds a solution, not the other way around. So our mission is simple. Uh, how do we support our residents in solving our city's biggest problems? It's our reward that drives us, and it's really being able to see the firsthand results, um, uh, to, to see firsthand the results in our neighborhoods, our communities, and our residents. Uh, as cities across the world are defining, redefining, and redefining again what smart cities mean, uh, DC knows uh, that the future is coming and we need to be prepared. And so I'm calling, I'm sort of charging you um, with helping us think about how we open up new opportunities for collaboration for public-private partnerships, for data analytics and testing, right? We've got a new data lake on the way. Um, we are already thinking about how we open up new data platforms so that you're able to see what we see. Um, we're calling 18F in to help us think through Vision Zero and sort of the amount of um, transportation data that we're kind of overwhelmed with. We have too much, right? We've got so much, so how do we pare down to think about what we really need and what could be predictive? Um, we want to provide values that guide and drive innovation with purpose. Um, and we want to do that with you by ensuring that our inclusive innovation ecosystem in DC has a seat at the table for everyone to grow and to innovate. Um, so we have a really critical responsibility to prepare DC for the technological changes that are at our doorstep, meeting the diverse demands of our residents, businesses, and visitors. You know, there's a whole bunch of people here that like cars, bikes, you know, they don't really get along all that well. A um, lot of diverse needs. Um, I'm excited to have the opportunity to bring what I know about resident desires and expectations, agency operations, strategic communications, and the levers that are available throughout DC government to, our, to my role. But I'm even more excited to say, um, we need your help. Um, and each and every one of you have a, a unique position, a unique role. Um, and we want your voice as we think about a smarter DC. And so whether or not you live in D.C., um, I encourage you to think about it, <laughs> try, try to. Um, and if not, um, and if, if either way, um, you know, check out the Resilient D.C. plan, resilient.dc.gov. Uh, see what we're doing at Octo, octo.dc.gov, octo.dc.gov. Um, we've got a, a, a love hundred open data sets um, for you to play around with. Um, but really, um, I just impress upon you uh, that we're thinking about, we're thinking creatively, and the best, um, the best tools that I've kind of seen develop in DC are tools that we've um, kind of uh, gotten uh, a hint of from California, a hint of from Colorado, right? It's when we all work together uh, that we find the best, uh, the best way forward. And so thanks for meeting today. Thanks for continuing to share and talk and think through really tough problems. And, and I welcome you uh, uh, to the office. I'm over, I'm, I'm not that far away. I'm sort of a walk away, 200 I Street Southeast. Um, and we're doing a lot of really good things. So thanks so much, really appreciate it.
few questions. Was it be a question? Not a statement. No question. No question. <laughs> <laughs> um, who are you? Yeah. Uh, some of us will recall that Amelia, uh, Dr. Amelia, some years ago, yeah, um, mentioned that there were there were a whole lot of micro businesses in the United States. These mm -hmm. are five to eight people uh, making on an average of a quarter of a million dollars a year. Many of them are minority families. Mm -hmm. Okay, um, I mean, so we're obviously, not, um, and as a small as small business owners ourselves, mm -hmm. I understand the issue. She was saying. They don't really understand about cybersecurity. They really don't understand about how to protect against hacking, which is what they do. Now we have all these devices. Yeah. And so what's DC doing to help more micro uh, businesses in this area? That's a, it's a very, very good question. And it's something that I talk about with my team all the time. I think I have two. Um, Two big hurdles there. Um, small businesses, great, great. Um, kind of uh, that, that's all, that's one huge audience, no question. Um, but really, my first audience is the employees of our government. Right? We have to make sure. I, I need to make sure that I'm sort of changing them the way that we're, they work, so that we're better protecting the data. Um, and we're with, with the the data that the public entrusts upon us. I want to make sure that we're doing everything that we can to make sure that we're um, being thoughtful about it and. Uh, you know, the truth is, DC, uh, every, every cyber attack that hits the federal government, uh, they try it out on us first. So uh, we're kind of federal government light uh, in the eyes of folks uh, that are trying to hack into, into our systems. And so um, I'm, doing, I'm doing sort of three things. Uh, one is we're trying to ensure that people understand that they should be thinking about cyber the same way that they think about putting a fence around their home putting a camera on their door, um, and, and how do we do that um, so that we're changing the, the way that people work in, at their desks at, in government uh, is one thing. So I've got a mandatory training that I've got everybody to, that I have to have everybody take. But the other thing that we're trying to do is, and I'm gonna forget the name of it, and Mark might help me. Mark, right here, cyber parties. No. Um, uh, crypto parties. Crypto parties, have you heard of these? So I think they're phenomenal. So we're so crypto crypto parties are a way to engage a diverse group of residents um, that might know each other. So you might have a book club, you might have a small business group um, that are, are interested in learning a little bit more about how to protect yourselves um, online. And what we're doing is we're bringing that sort of um, very uh, common sense approach to um, cyber to you. So, um, you know, talking about the fact that not everybody is going to have the same um, uh, need for the same type of protections. We're going to be comfortable with, right, utilizing Apple Pay. Some of us are going to be comfortable with having our credit cards on our phones. Some of us are not going to be comfortable with that. Um, but what we need to do is kind of remove the fear and make sure that we're giving people the tools. And so that's what we're working on. New York has recently, New York City recently launched an app, an app um, that says that if you download it, it's unclear. So basically, they, 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 it's like a cyber app. Um, I'm afraid of that. I don't want to provide a tool from the government that's like, here, this is going to help keep you safe, because I think the liability is like, one, ridiculous, and then two, um, it's not going to be, I, I'm not going to be able to put together an app that's going to keep you safe. And so instead, it has to be an ongoing conversation. Uh, and so um, starting with those crypto, um, crypto parties, we're going to start actually in, uh, in communities of color at first. Because um, uh, I think there's a greater fear of sort of the technological uh, uh, change that's upon us. So we've heard in more of our small, uh, our smallest um, government uh, entity is called the Advisory Neighborhood Commissions. And we've heard more rancor about the fears of 5G and like what that means uh, in communities of color. So we're going to start there first. Yeah. Um, so sorry. Who are you? Uh, personally, uh, also. Nice. Uh, two part question. Yeah. What do you do about algorithmic bias within the job platform within DC government? Do you have any ideas about that in regards to what do you do about the economy workers in DC as there is a kind of like within the DMV region on the local area? So, what do you do about the economy workers specifically, kind of like the workers who are not, as we've been kind of like, we've seen on the committee and like large um, 
with uh, kind of those particles that are coming out. They're not being paid kind of like the least in way. What do you all feel? What, what do you do? Your role is in the city. What do you feel that can be done uh, okay. in these areas? I'm going to answer what I thought was the harder question first. Um, and then the second one, you're like asking me to like get way out in front of the mayor, so we'll see. I'll see. I'll try to figure out what I can say on the second one. But the first one um, is uh, the first one actually, uh, Lark Tony, who I was uh, talking about, uh, is on my team in the back, and she's going to have to be happy that I'm pointing her out, but there she is. Hi. Um, and she <laughs> helped me um, uh, stand up a reverse job fair. Uh, earlier on uh, this uh, month, actually, no, last month, um, where we had unemployed and underemployed um, residents get into a program uh, and spend a year with us. Uh, they got certified in three different areas. Um, they all passed, which is awesome. So they all worked really, really hard. Uh, I invited the people that try to sell to me, right? There's a bunch of different vendors that are interested in meeting with me every day. And I was like, hey, I have a place for you to come and meet me. It's going to be at this reverse job fair. Um, and so uh, I had each of those, um, each of the interns actually sit at stations. Um, and so instead of um, having like Amazon and Cisco, right, and all these sort of big names around the, around the room and people having to approach, right, uh, uh, you know, potential employees having to approach uh, potential employers, I reversed that. Uh, and I asked those employers to hit every single table. So it kind of, I thought it was neat, yeah, it, I, right? It kind of worked, yeah, Lark, yeah. Um, uh, the, the way that I see, you know, some things that we're gonna test out going forward is we'll put folks in different rooms. So you won't even, um, the sort of the bias, the innate bias that you have as you approach a table, you won't even have that bias to sort of skip over a table or whatnot. You'll have to enter each room um, where you'll have a different candidate. So that those are kind of some of the things that we're trying out. Um, the, the best example that I've ever seen uh, was an organization called Foster Lee uh, in DC, and they had an intern network. Um, and it went away because Adam decided to like start his own business. But um, the idea was, uh, we're trying to think about how to bring it back, but the idea was you if you um, were looking for an internship, sorry, if you were looking for an intern, uh, the algorithm would um, sort of populate a part of a resume without the name, without the address, without the college, actually. Um, and, uh, and then the employer would say, hey, yeah, we're interested. Uh, and then the, the first time you would meet and get sort of the, the personal details was at that meeting. Um, so, you know, trying to do as much as we can to, to, to think about taking out that, that inherent bias before, before an actual meeting. Yeah. Yeah, definitely. Oh, Sorry. 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 All right, let's give Lindsay Parker another round of applause, please. Can my panelists for the AI and privacy panel go ahead and come to the stage, please? Panelists and moderator. And you all just let me know that I have to hear mics. Sharing is caring, everyone. All right, I'm going to begin by introducing our moderator. Yosuke Tashu serves as the Media and Democracy Program Director for Common Cause, where he leads campaigns to engage the public and policymakers on key initiatives around media reform and broadband access. Prior to joining Common Cause, he also served as a policy fellow at Public Knowledge, where he worked on a variety of technology and communications issues. His work is focused on broadband privacy, broadband access, and affordability, as well as other consumer issues. And Joseph, I'm going to give your panel until 3.30. So yes, please have your phone timer. So 3.30. All right. Take it away, Joseph. Thanks, Alisa, and thanks to Public Knowledge for putting together this amazing event. Tech for Social Change is a huge passion of mine and should be for everyone. I'm super excited for this panel and for the all-star panelists that I get to be with today and hear a lot about what they think about these issues. So we're here to talk today about artificial intelligence, privacy, and the impact on communities of color. So artificial intelligence is emerging as a transformative technology and it's likely to grow even more ubiquitous in the coming years. As big data and autonomous systems become prevalent, there are legal and policy issues that are continuing to ramp up as Congress and other lawmakers start thinking about these issues. 
What often gets left out of the discussion is how these technologies impact communities of color, both positively and negatively. Issues such as algorithmic bias, a lack of comprehensive privacy protections, and the future of work all affect equal opportunity to access to news and information, education, employment, housing, and a host of other issues. So this panel today will explore these topics as we discuss various approaches to privacy, artificial intelligence, and the impact on communities of color. So to start off, I just want to give each panelist an opportunity to introduce themselves and briefly explain to the audience here what is your particular approach to how to look at AI privacy. Uh, thank you, and thank you for having me. Uh, my name is Sean Perriman with the Internet Association. Uh, my official title there is Director of Diversity and Inclusion Policy and Council. Uh, it always strikes people as kind of an unusual title. I, I work in looking at diversity through uh, a policy lens, and specifically how do uh, algorithmic bias works, how, do, how, do, uh, how are communities of color affected by issues of privacy. And I think uh, the way I approach this is that we have to look at the, the current landscape of what's going on, even though AI is quickly uh, advancing, algorithms are not a new thing. This has been in our society, the data sets have been in our society, and they've been problematic all that time. But now we're applying it to a new technology. How do we how do we look at this and do it in a responsible way in ways that we haven't thought about before, frankly? Um, so that's the lens that I come, uh, come at this from, from a policy lens, uh, having worked on the Hill and now working uh, for a trade association which represents a lot of the biggest uh, tech companies in the country. Good afternoon. My name is Italian Conde, and I'm a tech policy analyst, and I'm a fellow at Data and Society Research Institute in New York City. And I come to this conversation really as an advisor to Congresswoman um, Yvette Clark. She's the vice chair of the House Energy and Commerce Committee. And in January of this year, when the 116th Congress came in, one of the things that we were told from the leadership's office that was that tech accountability was going to be a legislative priority. So when I look at these issues, I'm looking at them both through a human rights lens. So think, thinking about how can we how can we ensure that these technologies that are being developed, many of which are nascent, we keep hearing that they're advanced, but quite frankly, I sit both in the research and development world as well as the policy world, and a lot of these technologies are still experimental, but they're being used on test cases, which is, in my opinion, problematic, but also looking at market structure and how can we think about changing incentives, because the other part of this is incredible wealth is being made and concentrated outside of communities of color. So can we enact antitrust and other vehicles to try and create economic equity as well as some of the concerns that we would look at through a human rights lens? Hi everybody, my name is Francello Cello. I work for the National Hispanic Media Coalition, and I think of myself as a translator to make sure that we find ways to um, humanize the impact of some of the data harms that we're talking about. Um, when we think about uh, what data sharing regulations look like, I think the truth is that we have um, various templates to look at. However, um, the truth is I think we don't know what's the fit for our economy and for the type of society that we want. The truth is that we want to hold on to a lot of our capitalist values. Um, but something that uh, Ms. Escuela mentioned on the last panel earlier today was something about digital colonialism. And for those of you who have, um, maybe have never heard of it framed that way, it's essentially thinking about um, a small number of organizations, companies, controlling data for the masses. And the problem with that system is that a lot of their bias and a lot of the issues that historically caused separation of wealth and other socioeconomic division are essentially embedded into code. And those codes and those regulations are basically seeping into the way data is shared and managed. And it essentially keeps um, certain people at the top and other people at the bottom. And there's no way to get out of that digital caste system. I think that it's important for us to be able to translate some of these things in plain language so that more people are involved in the conversation. 
I think that it is important to talk about not just how these things impact communities of color, but how we can impact consumers of color. And I think that it's important to remember that the things that are good for consumers of color are very often going to be great for all consumers. And my name is Leonard Bruce. I uh, have two main gigs. So my, my first one is working with my community, the Hugh River Indian community down in Arizona um, as a program evaluator for our government, um, working on a whole variety of issues, um, you know, child welfare, um, looking at economic development, things like that. Um, also, I'm a PhD student at ASU in the human and social dimensions of science and technology, um, which sounds super fancy. And so excited to say it every time I do. Um, but a lot of my work is, is looking at the future of work um, in indigenous communities specifically, uh, how um, emerging technologies are affecting um, indigenous communities in Arizona and across America, um, specifically looking at uh, how automation is impacting jobs. And um, you know, it's, it's really interesting being here in the, the 3D printing panel because I think the, the question of, you know, there's a lot of um, negatives that are possible and that we see. Um, but there's also a lot of social good and social change that can be brought about by these technologies if they're leveraged the correct way. Um, and so a large part of what my job and also my, my research is in is how can we leverage those technologies um, to a future that we want and not a future that is kind of handed to us. Good afternoon, my name is Gabrielle Reishwi. I'm a law fellow at the Georgetown Center on Privacy and Technology. The center is a think tank focused on privacy and surveillance on policy as they affect marginalized communities. Uh, so coming um, to this panel, um, I hope to bring a perspective or looking at how you look at the demographics of people who are designing these technologies and they're predominantly white men. Um, in the schools that they're going to, they're not receiving an education that's centering ethics. And um, when you look at the news, every, every week we're hearing a story of um, bias in technology. And that's a reflection of the education that they're not receiving. Um, communities of color obviously care about these topics, about privacy, about AI, um, but they're not in the rooms and they're not given the chance to share their concerns. And if you empower these communities to share their concerns, we will see a change in um, the stories that we're seeing. Great, thanks. So I want to start the conversation off by talking about how do we address algorithmic bias when it comes to AI, AI technologies. And one of the issues that I'm really interested in and what sparked my interest was a panel I was on a few weeks ago organized by Elisa and others was data sets and incomplete data sets. So I'm really curious, what, what is the impact when there are certain communities, particularly communities of color, that don't necessarily have access to these technologies, and how do data sets or incomplete data sets impact that? Um, so Leonard and Francella, I want to turn to two of you to really answer this question. Um, if you can provide any examples of how certain communities don't have connectivity may be impacted by the lack of data that goes into AI. Uh, okay, <laughs> I'll give you a good recent, a couple of, a good recent example. So. Um, one thing that uh, I think about all the time is um, government surveillance and how essentially when we decide on whatever data sharing regulation we come up with, um, here the government is gonna essentially exempt itself. And one of the most dangerous things is the way that they've actually used information with third parties or how they collect information from companies. And um, I was thinking about the Motel 6 settlement and for those of you who aren't familiar, Motel 6 just settled the fine um, earlier, it was about three weeks ago, to pay $12 million because they were systematically passing over information to ICE to target um, whatever they thought was Latino sounding names of people who were staying at their hotels. And this was the system. ICE agents would go and um, stop people at the front desk at Motel 6. They would collect information about their names, ID information, license plate information, anything they could, room numbers, car information. And then they would target the people and stop them. And they would um, detain them. Sometimes they would question them. And if they weren't satisfied, they would open up deportation investigations that led to hundreds of deportations. And there was absolutely no consequence because those families won't be reunited and those people are legitimately living in fear. What happened is that wasn't only happening when Washington State brought um, suit against Motel 6, it's also happening in Arizona and other places. And the truth is that, you know, a fine 
yeah, it's the slap on the wrist, but the truth is that it shouldn't have happened. And those people are um, among the most disconnected population. Latinos are um, only ahead of Native Americans living on tri tribal lands in terms of disconnectedness. And so the truth is most of them don't have access to go and find out what type of information, whether it's the government or um, their apps, phone, tracking, anything, they don't have access to find out what kind of information is being collected about them. However, they're constantly being targeted and in that case, deported. Yeah, and I think uh, Joseph talks about, and I mean, one of the, the big issues that we have is uh, it's really interesting to see articles that question the digital divide when we all kind of know that it is a real thing, um, especially in travel communities uh, on reservation. I mean, that's where I grew up and that's where I live. Um, and it's very interesting to see how many folks do not have access to these systems to be able to get online and be able to do um, what is increasingly like common uh, tasks online. You know, college applications, uh, business applications, being able to get into there. But I also think, um, and that same panel that, that Yosef was on, um, I watched was uh, about data justice. So one of the, the scary facts is that when we talk about algorithmic bias, we talk about there is a lot of data that is not going into those data sets because folks are are not having their data captured, which is can be just as problematic as being um, over surveyed. And so one of the things that I looked at was, um, you know, there was a great report that came out about the mosaic of, of America that came out from Walmart and McKinsey um, in collaboration talking about future work. And so they broke down every American county into kind of a, one of eight different archetypes of what is, how is automation gonna impact these different counties? And one of the things that was left out, which is often left out, is how it's gonna impact Native American reservations. Um, and you know, it's really problematic because these are sovereign nations. There's 573 unique tribes in America, and when we're not included in that conversation, it makes it really hard to, to be able to come lobby on the Hill when we don't have that kind of data and research to be able to back up our claims and our concerns. Super helpful. So Sean, I want to turn to you. Maybe you can talk a little bit about how the tech industry has addressed data deserts and what actions they've taken. Yeah, I just wanted to weigh in really quickly. Um, um, tech has done some things, uh, Microsoft, Google are all trying to, what we're talking about here really is twofold. One being broadband access. We're trying to get to these commu communities, whether it be rural or urban, that don't have broadband access. And we're doing initiatives that do that, but really this is a government, this needs to be a government-led solution because the, the economics of it are such that you're not gonna make a rural commu community more dense. And that's the only way for us to make economic sense for a lot of these companies unless you put some other incentive from the government in there. But the other thing we're talking about besides broadband access is power. Because, you know, a lot of people here probably live in, in some way or another, live in an IoT connected device. Whether you have it on your watch or whether you have a, a smart thermostat, you're generating millions of data points at any given time throughout the year. Uh, and you can imagine how much that is over a lifetime. And you use that data uh, to benefit you in some way. It could be whether for your health care, it could be saving conserving energy or whatever. Uh, these communities that have already been marginalized are left out of those data points and they cannot use that data because they don't have connectivity. However, uh, they are still subject to, uh, to algorithms and AI in the most perverse ways because they're being surveilled. Uh, you know, you know, if you look at what's going on in New York where uh, Congressman, Clark is for, uh, Congressman Clark is from, they just had a low-income community that installed facial recognition technology for all its residents to see, you know, I don't know what they're monitoring, whether the right people are going into the house or whatever. Uh, but that is notoriously technology that can go awry, that is inaccurate, especially for those communities that they're targeting. So we have to think about uh, not only just protecting people and their privacy, that is important and, and paramount as well, but also there are communities that are left out of the data conversation other than for surveillance and law enforcement purposes. And we have to somehow reconcile that, uh, what's going on there. Interesting points. So there's clearly issues with lack of connectivity, surveillance that disproportionately impact communities of color. I wanna shift the conversation a little bit and also start talking about, all right, our communities who do have access or who are actually actively participating in using these technologies, there are still harms when it comes to biases, inherent biases and algorithm biases. So I wanna to turn to Gabrielle, maybe you can start talking a little bit about what are some of the commercial data practices or uses of technologies that disproportionately impact our communities? 
Sure, so um, everybody beats up on Facebook, so we'll start with them. Um, <laughs> when you, <laughs> so, um, so looking at their advertising algorithms, Facebook collects a lot of information on you um, between the posts that you like and the pages that you follow. Their algorithms are able to create a profile on you and they are predict they have what they call a look alike look alike audience. So they get to predict your race, your age, things of that nature, even though they don't collect that information from you. Um, you turn around and you look at um, their what advertisers then do with that information. And so in 2016, ProPublica put out a report that advertisers were able to target or exclude a certain communities from seeing housing advertisements. Um, and then you can imagine with um, employment advertisement as well, you know, you target trucking um, jobs to male to men and then nursing jobs to women. And it just, and so that's one example of the data practices that they do. Um, you look at Amazon as well. Um, in 2016, when they rolled out same-day shipping originally, they excluded predominantly uh, communities and neighborhoods of color, excuse me. Um, and so that's not necessarily a practice where they took data and then co uh, committed a harm. Um, but you see how when you're invisible or you're not included in the data, they, Amazon um, defended themselves by saying that, oh, we looked at where we had warehouses, and so that's how we determined those things. Um, but when you take the picture of the communities that were excluded and you put uh, the maps from redlining back in like the, the 50s and the 60s, it was almost 100% a perfect match. And so we're seeing how these algorithms are either using data then to exclude people um, from opportunities like housing or from um, commercial services and how it's just a continuation of the, the stereotypes and the bias that we've been seeing for years. Super helpful. There's definitely a lot of discussion about how advertisements or data practices are specifically excluding certain communities. Uh, Natalia, I want to actually turn to you. When we talk about these biases and how our communities are being excluded or targeted uh, one way or the other, how are lawmakers actually looking at AI technologies? How are they looking at some of these practices? And what's the view you think they should be taking? So in April, Congresswoman Clark was the House sponsor for the Algorithmic Accountability Act, along with Wyden and Booker in the US Senate. And when we look at that act, we were, we were thinking about it in two ways. I do agree with Sean that there are some parts that are government responsibilities. So certainly around public education, to your point, to make sure that people understand that what algorithms are and how they impact them. But we were also looking at industry. And there are tools that can be used to audit algorithms, to think about the inputs that they're using, to make sure that we, the racial proxies are not then uh, visited upon the marketplace. So for example, a popular input is zip code because it can be got from census data, it's free. But with zip code, carry, with, with zip code, the history of redlining and the racist history of redlining then gets perpetuated out. So, and the issue that we are looking at in the bill is actually a commercial law issue. So if we look at the Facebook algorithm, the Google algorithm, the Amazon algorithm, these are protected by, uh, the, these are black boxed. So they're protected by commercial law because the company will argue that's how that's our secret sauce. That's how we know to do what we do and we do it well. And one of the things that we're trying to do in that bill is really argue that if this, if Google search, for example, which is ubiquitous, is used by over 90% of the population, it's actually much more of a public utility than it is a private product. So we need to be able to look at that input to find out how it's impacting the American people. We're levying personal fines against company owners as well as fines against the companies themselves. And even within that, there are arguments, like the FTC are gonna levy this $5 billion fine. But Facebook just made, if you look at the Q1 earnings, Facebook had $15 million, billion, excuse me, in Q1 earnings for 2019. So levying a $5 billion fine is it's like a parking ticket. Like it's a lot probably to you and I. Well, it's a lot to me. I'm not this <laughs> in the room. But it's not a lot to them. So how are we thinking about changing incentives? I don't know if that was too long, 
but we're just trying to think about ways of taming the beast when the beast is so big. That, that's actually super informative uh, and thinking about alternative ways or ways outside the box to tackle some of these problems. I want to turn to Sean, who can maybe talk about how tech companies are trying to limit some of these biases and also looking at how they're trying to change some of their practices, some of the issues that Tali talked about and how they're collecting data or whether the current enforcement system is working, whether we need to change that. Um, so I think that uh, some of the things that are going on, and, and people are probably familiar with this already, we're trying to get more human-centric when we talk about AI, when we're trying to get humans in for uh, oversight at all stages to make sure that things are not going awry. The important thing, though, to remember is that it shouldn't just be any human. We need to think about the communities that are most impacted by this, and I think tech is, is coming to that realization, and um, that's something that needs to be addressed. But uh, also having diverse data sets, doing auditing, I think uh, someone mentioned it earlier, we cannot be uh, with AI, at least some of the consequences of this, you can't just test out in the wild, essentially, right? You have to make sure that it's implemented in a responsible way. But I think what's important here is we talk about risk assessments, and I sort of smirked a little bit when we talk about taming the beast. Uh, I don't want to minimize what happens in tech. I think there are certain things that are very concerning that goes on in tech, where we talk about advertising, where we talk about picking, you know, whatever you use your AI for in, in the tech platform. But <laughs> there is algorithms and AI being used to send people unfairly. There's AI and algorithms that are being tracked. Like you have LPR, license plate readers, that are tracking your every movement throughout your city, and then that's being used. So when we talk about taming the beast, like I think we have to think about what is the risk here? What, is, what are we really talking about with the, the real dangers that are with some of this technology? Um, and I think there are companies, a lot of times when we focus on the technology, we aim at tech and not technology. So what I mean by that, we're aiming at the tech industry, which there are a lot of things that need to be fixed within the tech industry, and you know they're taking some responsibility for that. But when we talk about the technology, that's used by banking, that's used by law enforcement, that's used by the legal field. Uh, you know, your mortgage, how your mortgage is calculated, they're using AI for that, and a lot of the data they're using may not be being used responsibly. So I think that there is a need for um, for uh, us to have this conversation and talk about how we regulate these sort of things, but we have to make sure we're having the full conversation of how this technology is really impacting our society, and it's not limited to one industry. Thanks, so I wanna actually take what Sean just said and Mary, that's what Tyler just said, and kind of compare the different idea, different viewpoints and hone in a little bit on how specific communities are using these technologies, some of the biases they might be experiencing, some of the disproportionate impacts. I don't know if Francella and Leonard, the two of you can maybe talk a little bit about how are the indigenous communities or the Latino community actually experiencing some of these disproportionate harms. Um, so I, I think it's interesting because uh, like me and Sean have had this conversation before is that you know algorithms are not new. I think it's a great, like AI is a great buzzword and it's bringing some of these big core social issues to the front. So I mean, one of the things in, in you know, my community specifically, like I have a very clear example of this is like Harley. <coughs> and, and having a vehicle in uh, Arizona is really important because if you're not living in the metro area, you're pretty much screwed for getting anywhere unless you have a car. Um, so when you look at something like that on reservation, one of the things, and this is, I mean, there's a variety of social reasons for this, but it's really hard to get a car loan. Um, yeah. Most of the folks who are on our community are paying 20 to 25 percent interest rate on a standard car loan if they can get them at all. Um, and so some of these are are just created and perpetuated by some of the algorithms that have been created by the car companies that are surrounding us. Um, and so there are, there are situations like that, and there's other situations where. There have been algorithms that have been used for a long time that are now being created and perpetuated more in AI that are expanding. Um, and I think a large portion of it is, is because, you know, if you have more data and it's quicker and you have a system that can move through it that is a lot faster um, than there has ever been there before. So specifically, I think one of the, the main things that I would think about and going back to what Sean is saying is like looking at some of these technologies, I think AI is kind of a tagline for the panel, but there are lots of technologies that are reliant on just that data processing that we really need to look at the technology, not necessarily the people who are, who are building it. Um, because sometimes the technology is really bad, but then also I think the people building it, going back to the earlier comment, there is not a lot of like ethics training 
electrical engineer. Um, but there's not a lot of uh, ethical requirements for you to build the system. So what happens when that system is built by a small startup and then suddenly gains traction and you don't know what it's going to be used for? No one's thought about that. When I think about the impact on Latino communities, I think a lot about um, what are essentially the far-reaching consequences of feeling like you are in a community that's constantly over-policed, constantly under surveillance, constantly targeted, whether it's online, for predatory lending, whether it's um, by your government, by watching all the time and hoping for deportation leads. The truth is that it manifests itself into um, people who are maybe in mixed status families not wanting to enroll their kids in school, not wanting to seek medical services, not wanting to take, take advantage of government services that they're entitled to because they might work and pay taxes just like all of us and they still don't take advantage of it because they don't want to put their information into a system that they really can't see into and can't control. That has consequences also on their participation in voting and participating in the census. And these are things that essentially, um, you start with a harm, you end up with essentially a group of people who feel like they're constantly suspicious, and then there's additional harms because then they don't participate in the census and voting. So we create new problems from those original, um, the, the, from where we started. But one thing I do wanna make sure is that I, I cannot, that cannot be separated from this conversation is digital literacy. Because the truth is that once people do have access, do they really have the tools to be able to navigate, oh, I can control my privacy settings on this app, or oh, this is how I turn off my tracking. Like, does the ordinary person know how to do that? Because a lot of us who have several ways to log in, if I have my cell phone, my laptop, right now, I, I still it would take me a second to walk through some of my apps to turn off certain settings. And the truth is that for people who have limited access, do they necessarily have the opportunity or even just the know-how to be able to do that? So I think part of the reason why some of those voices just are simply not included in this conversation is because we haven't given them the language. I think the truth is that we're talking about data sharing and privacy and algorithms. And for some people, especially in largely non in community in Latino households that um, predominantly speak um, Spanish at home, they are coming from countries that are traditionally suspicious of government regimes, and they are now under surveillance every time they walk out of the house. So the truth is we have to be able to give them the language to be able to participate in conversations about saying these are things that you can do to safeguard your information. Because I don't think people are always thinking about this is that we are constantly contributing to a digital footprint that we will not be able to escape for a lifetime. Your credit score will stay with you forever. The rate that you're paying for your mortgage is gonna be similar to the rate that you pay for your next mortgage. These are things that we create this digital footprint and have we given people the tools to be able to help shape their own profiles. Super helpful, and that leads perfectly into our next discussion on privacy. <laughs> so everyone knows Congress is actively thinking about privacy legislation right now. And we've heard a lot about one key piece of that, which is the algorithmic bias and the particular impact to communities of color. But I want to actually broaden this out to talk about all the other aspects of privacy legislation. It's complicated, there's a lot of different parts to it. So I want our panelists to help us break it down a little bit. Uh, so, Gabrielle, I want to start with you. So outside of the algorithmic bias issues, what are some of the harms that communities of color are experiencing from a lack of privacy protections or the current privacy regime that we have now that um, isn't as adequate as it could be? Are you asking about, like, what should privacy look Yes. Be? Okay. <laughs> um, so, step, I think step one is kind of um, taking a step out from just privacy in particular. Um, at the center, we're trying to encourage the conversation not just to be about privacy, but about data practices writ large, um, so that we're encompassing all of these things, so like including your algorithm that's deciding what mortgage you get or how much you pay for a car loan. Um, we're hoping that like this legislation centers civil rights protection, so there's strong anti-discrimination language in the bill to ensure that it's not only you know Facebook that can't use an algorithm against you, but also, like we said, like these other industries that are also using algorithms. Um, we're hoping that the FTC gets rulemaking, strong rulemaking authority, um, in addition to empowering state attorneys generals so that they can also bring claims. 
Um, we think about uh, California or, or New York that has a history, or like in other states, I should say, that have strong um, histories of consumer protection and making sure that they also can add, they can also help the Federal Trade Commission in this work. Um, I think, I'm sure Fensel will have other <laughs> things. I'll turn back to Francella in a second. Uh, I want to actually go to Matale. Um, one, if you have any additional thoughts on what should privacy legislation look like um, outside of the outgoing bias issue, because there's a lot of other issues that we haven't talked about, some of which Gabrielle mentioned, but also um, what is kind of the, the issues of privacy or how tech companies are looking at it? What are some of the concerns you have with the approaches they might be taking? So one of the projects that I'm working on now is looking at facial recognition and really not so much that this is a very technology centric conversation, but there is another part of this, which is usage. And specifically from my perspective and the people that I'm working from, we want people to be able to invent, we want to make sure that this innovation, but we also want to make sure that the deployment of these technologies have are in the public good. So just to correct Sean slightly from earlier, I'm, um, I serve a New York-based, New York City Congresswoman, and within the district that she covers, there's a, it's, it's actually a landlord that wants to replace keys with facial recognition technology because it would be more convenient to look at your door and it opens than use a key. People in New York are, we are a, a city that believes in striking, marching, telling people to get the hell out, telling them, you know, tell people to leave us alone, and that's basically what's happening. And the reason that we're concerned about that is the secondary use. So it's not just this Fourth Amendment question around surveillance that, that we're concerned about. We're also concerned about once those faces have been captured, and we know that IBM has this project for a million faces, and they are using, uh, they're using arrest data for people that are perfectly innocent. They're using pictures of people that have been sex trafficked, and all of these really, you know, really horrible ways of um, diversifying the data set. What, if you're enterprising and you have these faces anyway, and you're in, a, in an African American community in an African American building, there's nothing to say because we have no regulations or laws around this that those faces could be captured and then sold on. And I think that that's really the issue. So as I'm looking at facial recognition as a policy area, I'm thinking about the use of facial recognition, and I'm so I'm going to be in San Francisco uh, in the next couple of weeks speaking to some of the people out there because they want to ban it. Uh, they, they want to ban the use of facial recognition within the city. And I love California for many reasons, not just Tupac, but many, many others. I'm <laughs> um, <laughs> on the black panel, so, you know. Um, um, but I do really like that state because they are very, very serious about this idea that we have the right for a private space that's actually part of our inheritance for living in this country. It's why people like me emigrate here. So I would say that we're looking at quality life issues, we're looking at secondary markets, we're also looking across to Europe, so we're going to be in Brussels trying to figure out how the EU are thinking about this, and we understand different continent, different, different history, but can some of those learnings come here? And the reason that we do, the, the reason that we're very much focused on the tech industry and the big, the big companies isn't because they're not the only people doing this, to Sean's point, this is ubiquitous. But if we can bring down a giant, then by bringing down the giant and showing that the work can be done there, it's going to, it, it's, it, it's going to have huge impact across the industry. So Sean, I want to give you a chance to respond to that. I'm also just really interested in how the tech industry looks at privacy policies, how they're updating the policies to limit and reduce a lot of these harms that all the panels address, but also maintaining some of the positive impacts that tech companies also offer. Thank you. Um, I would hope the goal is not to bring down any particular company. The goal should be to protect citizens from overreach, you know, from whoever it is. It shouldn't be to bring down a giant. And I think that's some of the concern that you have companies that are successful and then it becomes, well, let's look at them. I think we need to look at how these are being used across the board. Uh, you know, before this, I sat on the House Oversight Committee, 
And we had the FBI come in and tell us that, you know, they have this massive facial recognition since, uh, you know, database that is made up a lot of driver's license photos. And it's like, do you go to your DMV and thinking that you're going to be entered into an FBI sent, uh, system where that they're going to scan you every time they're looking for a criminal? No. So I think we need to think about, like, this is a larger thing outside of bringing down giants. But to your point about privacy, uh, you know, the Internet Association released the privacy uh, principles earlier, uh, well, late last year. And I think we need to look at this. I think the industry recognizes there needs to be a federal legislation on privacy, period. There has to be something. And the data needs to be yours. It needs to be portable. You need to understand that. You need to be understand what, how your data is being used. All of those things are important. So I think it's making a privacy framework where the American public has an idea of where, where my data, how is it being used? Can I take it? Is it my data? Can I take it with me? Um, all of those things are important, and we have those principles out. Um, did I answer your question? I know you were asking about what the industry is doing, but I think everyone's looking for a federal legislation on this. Yeah. So just to follow up on that, Francella, I know you've been working on this more than most advocates. I'm really curious to hear your thoughts on some of the issues that we've talked about with the various provisions to privacy legislation, but I'm also curious in all of your advocacy what do you see as the role for members of color, for tri caucus members, to really play a role in shaping privacy legislation? Um, okay, so a couple of things, and I'll bring up um, just a couple of my concerns about some things that were mentioned earlier um, about data minimization and like what happens when you essentially say, I don't want my data stored anymore. Um, I had a really important question for my four year old nephew, Xander, and he was talking to Alexa, and he is like, Where do the voices go? And he's like, And I was like, and he's like, I think they're in there. And I was like, I don't really know. And I never really thought about it. And the truth is that like, it's part of my terror all the time is like, where is this information going? And even when we're talking about facial recognition technology, I know that I think it was um, Senator Schatz and Blunt, if I'm correct, who introduced the Facial Recognition um, Privacy Act um, last month, or in March, I think it was. Um, but the thing is, it's like, I know that Congress is thinking about it. I know that they're thinking about what are ways that we can take essentially steps towards whatever is this larger framework. I think that in general, the larger framework is going to have to uh, address this in bite-sized pieces because essentially the issues that I have with maybe facial recognition are a little bit different than some of the other internet, you know, uh, internet of things issues versus um, just how you're choosing, you know, information, sharing data online. So I think that in general, we need to think about, okay, we can take this step here, we can take this step here and not try to address it all at once. But I do think to the question of like, who does this data belong to is something that um, it has taken a long time for uh, whether it's companies or even the government to get to a place to say that the data is yours. That has been a very long, like long struggle to get to be able to say that out loud. Because the truth is that once you claim the data is belonging to you, then all of a sudden you have the, you are vested with these new rights that didn't belong to you before. Because remember, a lot of the times before, you have a lot of third parties who are sharing your information that are saying, I've manipulated it to the extent that it is no longer yours because it cannot be re-identified. Is that really true? I don't know, because you won't show me your algorithms because they're proprietary. So we have this riddle. And so the truth is that we have to decide, okay, fine, we're in a riddle. Let's start deciding on you know, what can we actually find a solution for right now. Because I think that we do have good models about things that we can extract to say, yes, this can work um, in our society. But to Gabrielle's earlier point, we have to constantly be thinking about centering the voices that have been either silenced or marginalized into this conversation. Because again, we are going to bring whatever our bias, whatever our divisions, whatever is the separation that we have before this is about a digital economy and essentially embed that into code that's going to carry on into the 22nd century. So I think that we should be thinking about this with a forward thinking approach. And I think we should think about what can we address bite-sized pieces at a time. Super helpful. And Leonard, I just want to give you the final word before we close out privacy legislation. If you have any particular thoughts on what legislation should look like. Um, I'm really interested in what Francella just said about real solutions and maybe key provisions you think should be included in a bill, whether that is focused on indigenous communities or some of the civil rights aspects. Yeah, I think it's, so the privacy conversation is really interesting to me because, um, so Native Americans historically have been super over surveilled. Um, you know, going back to, 
on reservations and having to surveil them, having to get uh, many passports to leave the reservations. And so I think one of the, the really key things for us um, when looking at some of these, these privacy issues is, like Frenzel said, like having a seat at the table, having people to be in those decision-making positions, because I think a, a lot of the times when these policies are enacted, they are not enacted in a way that um, provides a, an avenue for meaningful conversation from not only Native American communities, but for many communities of color uh, to be able to take a seat at that table and say, hey, wait a minute, there, there are aspects of this that you're doing this in a way that is going to affect us very deeply. So I think one of the major things that I think about, and this is going back to Gabrielle's uh, earlier point about, um, again, ethics training, is that you know we have to have more diversity and inclusion, not just necessarily at the policy making, but also at the, the creation of the technology, at the um, at the teaching and the, the training of the engineers who are building these things, so that you know we have stuff like what happened. I think it's great what's happening at Google, where the employees are taking a stand and saying, "Hey, wait a minute, we shouldn't be doing Project Beagle. We shouldn't be doing this project in China where we're censoring the internet because you're making these these ethical principles, and you also have a company which arguably is um, enabling and empowering their employees to be able to make those decisions and speak up, which I think is what we need more of." Because I think regulation is, again, personal opinion, I don't know if regulation will move quick enough with the emerging technology. Um, we had a talk for free printing about Moore's Law, and like that's Moore's Law and the convergence with all these technologies. I don't know if we can ever create a legislative protection fast enough to deal with this stuff. So instead, I think we need to really focus on the individuals as well and make them so that they can be empowered to be able to speak up and also be knowledgeable enough to, to have a voice in us. You said something about surveillance, and I just want to give you like a really uncomfortable example, just so that if you are part of the community that does not feel like you are constantly under surveillance. Um, back in, um, it was after the New Deal when um, states were essentially um, implementing welfare. Um, it was uh, it was totally ridiculous if someone were to come and raid your house and basically like determine whether or not you should be eligible for welfare. And even in like the 90s and in 2000s when they were like asking people who were still, who were part of welfare um, programs to um, do testing, you do DNA testing on your children in some states, you're constantly being asked to really invasive questions about your partners and your, you know, your sexual history, all sorts of things that's documented. And the truth is, if you were in a group of people who's never been surveil surveilled, I'm just giving you an example of poor people who are constantly under surveillance by the government. If you were to ask rich people to go to like undergo something that was so ridiculous to say, I'm gonna raid your house and decide whether or not you should have to pay this amount of taxes or that amount of taxes. I'm gonna ask you to log the DNA of all of your kids to make sure that you're eligible for certain benefits. That would sound ridiculous. And the, the truth is that, the problem was that when the government was trying to implement these rules, it was kind of like, People in a room that were probably very homogenous decided that this was going to be a great idea because they were raiding houses of people of color. And I just want us to be thinking, whenever we're thinking about whatever framework we come up with, if we can find a way to include more voices at the beginning, we won't have to raid people's houses because we built it together. And I think that's the way I want us to kind of think about how we're approaching the problem solving. That's a great point. I think including more voices, more diverse voices, is just a strong point that is pre should be prevalent in all these issues today. And that gets to the third and final issue we'll cover before questions, which is AI and the future of work. So Leonard and Gabrielle, I'm really interested in both of your takes on how will AI impact the future of work, particularly in communities of color who hold current positions right now that are likely to experience automation. Sure. Um, so with the future of work and automation and how it's going to affect communities of color, um, if we aren't, so, sorry, taking a step back, the surveillance aspect, we're seeing that again in uh, the future of work where algorithms are managing uh, workers. Um, and then you, you, maybe you didn't see, but there was a 
a lot of news articles coming out about Amazon automatically firing workers because they weren't working fast enough. Um, and so when you think about these warehouses where it is people, maybe not only people of color, but these are people who are marginalized, who are you know, who don't have as much power, that's something that we're going to start looking at. Um, when you think about gig workers that are also predominantly people of color who are now, this is their only for form of income and the algorithm is telling them to do this and that and they don't know how much money they're getting made. That's what we're looking at and so if we aren't, if if the culture is and the, the guiding star is profit, we're going to continue seeing a lot of these principles where it's, you need to pack this box in 5 to 15 seconds. And if you don't do that, then this is going to automatically fire you because now we need to make sure that our company's model is on a customer clicks, you know, and they send in all the information and in four hours we need to make sure that's ready to ship. We can't, I mean, this is my views, not the century's views, but you so you can be really on Mount Everest, you can be virtually in Jurassic Park, you can be uh, really, but not really inside uh, Chemical Park. Yes, virtually. Yes, that's a great way of describing it. Um, so how many people here have had Patty virtual reality experience before? Okay. Well, stick around. Um, so, like, yeah, stick around. Um, so the way, I mean, historically, if you think about it, um, there's actually a very prominent computer scientist um, all in the world. Um, I think he's at like this. University of Toronto now, and he has something called like the reality spectrum. Um, so at one end, of, at one end of that, you have virtual reality, which deals with um, you know computer generated backgrounds. So the way I always explain, you know, what's the difference between VR, AR, and XR is something as simple as it's the background, um, and more specifically in technical terms, in Unity we we'll call that the scene. So in VR, the background is computer generated. Um, that scene was actually developed by game developers. In augmented reality. The background, the scene is actually the real world. So you have virtual objects. So, for example, if the sign you had an AR object that looked like there, the sign water bottle would actually sit here on the table. Um, so that's what augmented reality is. And some of you may, I mean, you probably encountered every single day. You probably use filters on Snapchat. Um, if you use Amazon, um, any of their shopping experiences now, you can use a camera and place objects inside of your house. Um, so that's the way I think about um, augmented reality. Um, <laughs> Thanks. 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 I, I had to go get my. Um, this is the hashtag VR Yeti um, <laughs> show, and I think it's, it's we hand we we customize this ourselves. Um, it, it's a nice segue, actually, because technology should be human friendly, and we really think that um, customizing, personalizing your technology, making it a part of you, helps people get over some of the initial confusion about some of these terms in VR. So I'll, I'll, I'll try to address that. Um, there, are, there are a lot of semantic word games going on in VR right now. Um, what happened is that really 360 video came out first and was sort of called VR by the media. And it stuck. And then VR kind of stuck. And a lot of us in the industry are trying to, I think, maybe unsuccessfully, but I think the attempt, the attempt is through XR to have a term that that really can encompass the entire VR umbrella. So the whole, all of the various technologies that are related to VR, that are some sort of virtual augmented scenario, fantasy world, uh, digital overlay is what I call AR over reality. Um, and some people call it extended reality. I prefer to think of it as X is just a variable that you put in front of whatever reality you're extending into. Thank you, that's very helpful. Um, so there are some people who may think that VR is actually a mechanism that detaches people because you know you're behind a computer, you're behind a headset. Um, but Hall at Discovery, I know that you do a lot of projects with educators from K to 12. Um, and so I was wondering if you could talk about these projects and how you see them as actually building community and empathy rather than detaching students. And then if anyone else wanted to talk about similar projects they're working on. Yeah, I'll say what, what we're doing, and I think that that's one of the real powers of virtual reality. It's not something you hear about very much, but uh, we're in the education space. We're can go through 12th grade. And for us, it's a, a lot of times the, the story of the power you bring to an individual. So the, there are a lot of stories about how uh, people have seminal moments that sets their career. I bet uh, most people in this room had a moment they can go back to and say, you know what, I decided to go into what I'm doing now because of a thing that happened when or this person, that stuff. But I'd like to tell the story of, uh, uh, Ray Montaigne, uh, 
who was the first uh, African American woman to run a, a, a computer department in the Navy. Uh, she just died last year at 83. Uh, and she knew that she wanted to be an engineer when she was seven years old and was visiting her grandfather. They lived in Arkansas, took her to tour a captured German submarine back then. You know the story. Uh, and she saw the dial, she looked at the periscope, she said, what do I have to do to know how to do all this stuff? She's seven years old, she's in Arkansas, and I said, well, you have to be an engineer. You don't have to worry about that, but you have to be an engineer. And she said, I'm going to be an engineer. And she became an engineer. By the time she retired, she was briefing the Joint Chiefs of Staff. She was uh, building programs for Richard Nixon. She was doing great stuff. That's one. Um, uh, the Terry Bradshaw was a quarterback. Walked his moment when he was seven years old, walked by a Sears store, and there was a football and a helmet. That's the first time he'd ever seen either one. And he decided that's what he wanted. Don't ask me why. But then he'd get the football, he'd throw it in the air, and go pick it up and throw it back. And there are lots of stories like this where somebody was in the place that made a difference in their lives. And if you are in a community or you're stuck in a neighborhood and you don't ever get out, you're not exposed to those things. And I taught with a math teacher in Hollywood, and uh, we had kids that never went to the beach. We lived in LA, they'd never go. We'd take them on a field trip to the ocean, right? Well, if that's true, uh, and if uh, uh, Ray Montague never goes inside that German submarine, or Terry Bradshaw never sees that football, their lives are different. With this, we really, and this is sort of the game changer, the high quality uh, VR. They're now under $200. They're accessible, you see a lot of these in schools. It means that I can take you someplace and maybe change the way you think about farming or mining or the military or about being a pilot. And it's an experience that makes a big difference. And if you can start at seven and go through 12, the people have never attempted. I heard this story in NPR last week. A woman walks in, she, she's in college, never heard a symphony before, sees it, changes her life. She's now the assistant conductor in San Francisco. $2,000 a year. She has another job. But that's uh, it's one of those things where you can only be exposed to everybody. That, so that's part of the deal. It's finding a way that it will really work. The, the other thing you can do, and I'm sure you will be talking about this, is when you talk about empathy, uh, we were trying to put together a video, it's not, not done yet, but where you click this on and I can uh, walk you through the world of a child that's dyslexic. I can make sure that every book you see is colored in such a way that it makes it very, very hard to read. You can just concentrate really hard and you can do it. But to walk around like that and to let teachers take that experience, you only have to be in there about seven minutes. Be able to have another child look in there, you're only talking about seven minutes, maybe less. Then you built everything, you change, you can see other people walk other people's shoes. And to me, that is a really huge part. Can I, can I push back against that a little sure. bit? Sure. I love what you said, but I, I think empathy is something that is is a really difficult thing to talk about with VR. And the reason being, especially to folks who have had situations that we may not be able to understand or put on a device and instantly <laughs> understand, I think it's it, it may be a misstep for us in VR to call it empathy. Um, and that's why I, I try to reframe my own thinking around this, and I'm, I'm still playing with this idea of, is it empathy or are we really teaching compassion because people are having a lived experience in VR that is simulating a real life experience? Because you're not actually having the same experience as the other person. You're, you're, you're able to have some level of compassion and you're able to understand what it might be like to be in their shoes. But I don't think you actually come out of VR and go, oh, I totally know what it's like to be this, this person. But I do think it enables us to put people in this embodied cognitive place where they're able to have an experience of the other, of whatever the other is, and they're able to think about maybe their own transformative experience that they had inside of VR or how that might be uh, an experience that has happened to someone else. So I, I mean, sometimes I just, I, I worry about that empathy word sometimes. I think, I think it can be difficult in different communities that we serve to use the word empathy feel like the wrong word. Well, let me just kind of respond to this one. So, uh, and, and I'll take, you know, cognitive, like, I'll take that, yeah, cognitive reality, I'll take, take that other thing. But I know that there was a fundraiser where um, we're trying to raise water for a place in a different space, and people put on headsets and followed one girl, it was her job, to go down and get water. And how long it took, it was an hour and a half to, take, to get one jar of water in and do it about seven times a day. So once you say to that, and you spend an hour, and you realize, oh, is it for a glass of water? Then it does change your thing. So yeah. you're right, you can't, it's not going to change the way you can say But it's, I, I love what you were saying about the kind of um, 
the experience that people haven't had before because uh, one of my colleagues that runs VR Nation and nonprofit Alexander talks about it as obtaining attaining the unattainable, which I think helps people also expand the, their imagination. It helps them think about right. what might be possible for themselves. And that is something that both traditional media and news media work that we do and work that we do in underrepresented communities, making sure they have a voice or providing them what opportunities to have a voice. I think we can do that same work in VR, but in an embodied cognitive opportunity where people can sit inside of an experience like the one you're describing and have a sense of what it might feel like. And then to actually, when they take the headset off, I think the key is having something we ask them to do right after that experience so that we can really use that opportunity as a, as a teachable moment, as an education opportunity, as an opportunity to go one step further than VR can do. Okay. I think there's another point there, which is the limitations you have with, I think VR has received this unwelcome and unassuming, I guess, uh, responsibility to teach empathy. Now it's a technology. Um, so for example, I mean, they're just technological cha uh, challenges that you have with even teaching empathy, right? So for example, um, you know, if you put on a headset to your question about attachment, um, you know, I always say like, you're no, being in VR, you're no, you're no, you're no more just happy. Attached you are when most of us walk around with our smartphones. Um, to be quite honest with you, um, uh, because I can be completely locked into my HTC Vive and have a very normal experience in this regard, everything else happening in the world. And I'll do the same thing walking down the street with my iPhone. Um, so the detachment issue isn't really a concern. I think the concern is that how do we give, how do we build as technologists, how do we build a sense of presence in VR? Like that's the true technological challenge. And oftentimes we can't do that right now because there are still areas of human computer interaction. For example, how do I truly smell in VR? So I'll never know what it's like to be a chef if I can't smell the cuisine I'm actually using. You know, what does it actually feel like to, you know, be a person of color and, you know, unfortunately have to please tap me? Well, you can't really feel yet in VR. So even there are limitations to teaching empathy um, that we hope will be solved with new uh, areas of human computer interaction. Thank you, that's really interesting. So um, I'm wondering if there are current hurdles for people to access VR. So whether that be education about the technology or the neighborhood you live in or affordability. Um, and if there are hurdles, if you could talk about them and ways that we can combat them. Sure. So this is predominantly what we do. Uh, we provide access to um, any, anyone in our community can come in and use uh, about eight different tools that we have. We teach seven different classes on VR content creation. Um, we help people, support people when those tools go away because the startup that started them just went poof. Um, and then we provide ongoing opportunities to build community around um, VR technologies. So we um, had a VR eco hackathon a couple of years ago. It was the first ever in Boston. Um, and out of that, we had about 40%, 40, 40% uh, persons of color versus 60% white person folks. And um, I think it was about 60, 40 male, female too, which was kind of huge in 2017 actually. And um, I actually think that there's a huge space inside of the VR field right now. It's really nascent. I keep saying that in the last four years, but it's still really, really nascent. We are building a brand new technology and we're building, it's a paradigm shift. A lot of people will talk about it like it's just a media, a new media tool. It's not. It's a whole shift and it's a 3D spatial computing shift, which is not how we see things right now. And that's gonna really shift everything. It's gonna shift how we consume media, how we create media. And so the, some of the biggest obstacles we saw early on was that people never tried VR and if they had, they tried it with Google Cardboard and they had a horrible experience. They never wanted to do it again or made them nauseous and that's what happened to me and then i saw the siri davos piece from the united nations which was an amazing piece that showed a, a, a young woman 12 years old in a syrian refugee camp um she, she was syrian but she's in a french refugee camp and i took the headset off and i was in tears and i had no idea i was going to be moved or so um but it was because that sense of presence was so strong um but i didn't have access to an hsc vibe or on this rift at that time i just happened to go to a conference so we're still, even four years now that we've been doing this work, we're still finding that a large percentage of the population has not had access to VR, and if they have, it's been a bad experience. Um, and we are trying to spread that across the country by working with arts and cultural organizations to help them. We train the trainers, we teach them how to fish. We don't want to be the vendor. We want them to be 
empowered or have the power to create programs on their own and be able to bring the art to their community. So we think that that should be publicly accessible, just like the Porta Pack was back 35 years ago. Um, when you know my my uh, predecessor, <laughs> the Porta Pack was the first publicly accessible uh, video. Uh, camera it was huge, and um, people, regular average people, didn't have access to that. And public access television made that accessible, so that citizens could go out and document stories that were happening in their community, and then actually held their government officials accountable because they were able to report in a local, hyper-local way on some of these stories. And I think we're really trying to do that in the VR air space. And we have about 15 centers around the country that have taken that on and have started um, moving, they're expanding their mission into that VR air space. But we can only reach so many. So, you know, I think the, the other obstacle is that philanthropists aren't giving yet to VR because the technology is still really new. Just in Boston, in that ecosystem, just last the last two months, we've seen one foundation just get started. And we're very excited. We're, uh, we have a VR AR scholarship fund. It's the first in the world, I think, and definitely in the country, um, that we're going to be providing um, to four-year college students in higher education so that they can start getting these skills early on um, that we're, we're building in our job training program. Um, and that's that's a challenge, too, because philanthropists aren't giving money to those programs because they don't really understand VR yet. So I have to take this headset to Sundance and stand in line and talk to people about what VR is, how you can use it, how it's going to change the world, get them to maybe believe me a little bit, and then see if we can get funding. But that funding trail right now is not following where we need the resources, which is at the grassroots level, to be able to really help support people who do not have access to a, a, a lab at MIT in the Valley now, um, so that they can start creating and playing and practicing and making mistakes just like we did in traditional media and in uh, in the tech world when the tech world started. Uh, those are some great points, and one that I will just kind of sit with is, I mean, to be quite honest with you, VR is a 1% technology. It is designed and made for the 1%. Um, so far. So far. Um, and it probably will stay that way, just getting, um, you know, the cost of displays to actually put in the HMD. A uh, head mounted display uh, is the actual headset. That's the HMD. Um, so it, it probably will stay costly, but I think discussing affordability without <laughs> discussing usability is just as important. And I think that there is, in my opinion, there are really just two active groups in virtual reality right now. You have the enterprise group um, that use virtual reality for things such as training staff, I, mean, I think UPS, Walmart, um, are leading the way there. And then the other community, um, which most of our users I draw from, are from the gaming community. And for individuals like that, there, there aren't any hurdles because they've already moved to the next paradigm of computing. Um, our average user spends about 25 hours a week inside of um, his, and I say his because most of our users are predominantly white males um, inside of the set set. Um, and once again, because of that, there aren't any hurdles for him. It's like, you know, I can actually go forward to pre-order the new Oculus um, uh, Quest that will be released uh, rather soon. Um, but typically, affordability and usability, I think um, they aren't as mutually exclusive as people think they are. Um, because I've yet to meet someone like an obviously normal <laughs> individual, right? Um, to say like, oh, I want to go back into a VR experience um, because I can't move throughout the day without my phone, but you can move throughout the day without your VR um, headset for most people. Um, so yeah. I'm sorry, just want to follow up and say, uh, uh, what I mean, the work that Russell's doing is really important because you're working in the browser space. Uh, once that once that becomes out there where you can, now you go to a website, see all this great stuff, you go there and see that website in VR, that's a pretty powerful thing. In terms of accessibility and barriers, uh, it's interesting because money is not so much a barrier anymore. Uh, it used to be to have the kind of experience that you had, you know, that made you cry. Vote for everything, but it made, made you cry. It was really too grand. I mean, where is what it was. And that's not going to get into many, many classrooms. And it's tethered and it was awkward. The, the Oculus Go, and that's what we both have up here, these are under $200. That's now in a donor's choose model for a classroom teacher. So these are starting to bring meaningful experiences sort of closer. You can always get these. This was way the first session today was on 3D printing. You could 3D print these little guys and you could have them. And it's not the powerful experience, as you said, you can have it. It's, it's pretty good. What you need for all these things, though, uh, for this and for these, is internet connectivity. And I've got stuff I've downloaded here. We were playing with it earlier. You can see the California wildfires. You can actually go out in space and visit a, a particle collider. That's because I downloaded it at a good pipe. Uh, if we're going to do this at schools, if I'm going to be able to have this and be able to check it out, so you're going to go home and have your, 
you know, submarine experience, whatever it's going to be, you got to have bandwidth at home, and that's important. These things all, these the, the lower price headsets all work with, uh, with cell phone. How many of you have cell phone? There you go. So uh, if you're going to download a, a VR experience, though, you're going to need a pipe that'll let you do it without killing your data plan, right? You've got to have open Wi-Fi to be able to do that. And once once open Wi-Fi happens, then we've got that whole new level of creator, like you said. So this is this is a, a VR camera. So I, I, all day I've been making video pictures of this. Getting this through security was interesting, by the way. <laughs> what is this? I said, it's a VR, and they explained, he said, what time is the panel? So if, if the security guards are coming in, I think it's a very good sign. But with this, I could, and these are under $200 too, I could show the experience of moving from this panel to where we had to have lunch, right? Because the school kids were filling up the, the cafeteria, so we had to keep walking. But I can demonstrate this and use a free tool from Google. Thank you, Google, for sponsoring this. Stitch it all together, and you can walk in my shoes to have lunch, or a kid can take use this and show how to go, go from their front door to the school where they attend, or what their cafeteria is like, and I can stitch all those together with free tools. So the, the money is not so much the, the issue anymore, it, it's not the barrier, but you've got to have the bandwidth, and the bandwidth has to be there for everybody, and everybody has to be able to access it at the same level. I, I do want to say you can actually watch all of your content offline. So you do have to download it, but you can watch it offline. We took um, we took three HTC Vives to Nairobi, Kenya, to do a project with the United Nations on a three-dimensional globe uh, where we put all of the particulate matter for 35 years, mapped it onto the globe, and then showed world leaders how you could use VR to tell stories in a three-dimensional way. And even though we didn't have these at the time, and I would have rather taken these than the 50 pounds and trying to get it through customs that the other uh, HTC Vibes were. It, it, it's still, I have to say, I really do think that uh, having a full system that allows you volumetric VR, which this does, but having a full Oculus, uh, Oculus Rift, well, and Quest, no, I guess yeah, two, yeah, yeah, uh, that just came out this week. Um, and the HTC Vive, having a 15 by 15 foot space, when I go to the senior center and do demos for seniors, and they can throw sticks for a robot dog and have him jump up and rub his belly and have him jump for sticks, I have to watch out that they don't run through the brick wall in my building. Because it is so real, but it's also physical. We did a parks and recreation class on fitness inside of the HTC Vive. You can't really do that with this. So I do want to just differentiate that there are many different headsets. We could do two hours on all of the different technologies and you know, do you make something in 360? Do you make something in Unity or Unreal or A-Frame, which works on the web in a web browser and is a is a really accessible, free, open source solution by Mozilla? There's so many different ways that you can create the art content, and I think that's one of the challenges. Just to get back to your question around accessibility, is also the fact that we're so young as an industry that we don't have standards. There's very little standards around cameras. There's very little standards. There was only three years ago an editing program, you know, Premiere took on editing in 360 even. Um, there are new programs coming out every day that will allow you to do things easier and easier. We haven't quite found the dream weaver of VR yet, but we're getting there. So you guys teed up my next question nicely. Because <laughs> Paul, you talked about broadband access and in public knowledge we care a lot about making sure that every neighborhood and everyone has access to broadband high-speed quality broadband. Um, but So you said that that's really important for VR, but you also said that you need to, sometimes you can download things without having an internet connection. If you're going to, I mean, a good example of this, mm -hmm. the best example I can think of for, for bandwidth is Google, uh, Google Earth. Google Earth and VR, Google VR, which, which won't work on the newer ones, it won't work on the device. If you have a good pipe, and I have a pretty good pipe in my house, but I still hardwired for that, you can look around, and this is where you can like fly over Paris if you want. Go down to the street view and look around, take a little walk. If, if you're waiting for the image to load, it's kind of like that old movie Inception, right? When you're building slowly, put together. But if you're on good bandwidth, you can really explore lots of different things in that headset. But it's got to be the good one. But without bandwidth, Google Earth, which is really somewhere out right now, really won't do it. So there's a lot of stuff I download. But a lot right. Of and there are a lot of policymakers in the room. And so I'm curious um, if you want to talk about why broadband access is important, and if there should be policies, what they should look like to increase access and deployment. Yes, so this is, this is Huawei, um, which I still believe is one of our Chinese 
um, anyway, is, <laughs> um, is uh, looking at this as well because in terms of VR and AR, uh, I mean, I go to Beijing once every quarter, and some of the technologies that I'm seeing over there that are moving a lot faster, and it's because of the 5G and the connectivity that they have. Um, so in terms of like thinking about policy, I mean, it's, I feel like it's one of those things where, you know, is it something where we will need to make mistakes first, and then policymakers will kind of come in and then govern us? Or can we govern ourselves before we even get there? And I'm not sure if we can, in my opinion, I think that policymakers are gonna to need to allow us as creators and developers of the platform to really mess up, to do things that we probably should not have done that are slightly, that are slightly unethical, so that we can actually figure out where those issues are concerned as well. Because right now, it's still rather early to say like, okay, um, how do we make sure that everyone has proper mobile broadband access um, in terms of like budget so, yeah. um, what, And let me just say that discovery education is moving us into education because it really works, really effective in a lot of ways for a lot of subject areas uh, that otherwise um, uh, aren't as effectively delivered. But in terms of policy, you, you two are a, a new industry. I mean, we're going to go the, start with schools and then hopefully go at home. But if we want this industry to grow, like the video business grew, like the software business grew, then you've got to have the, the highway that people can use that. It's, it's, it's 1%, but I think no, your stuff could be 10%. Oh, you yeah. just everybody had access. Oh, without a doubt. Because, um, I mean, right, think about it uh, in terms of the 4G versus 5G right now. So, one of the biggest issues right there is the latency, right? So, when you talk about latency, you're talking about the responsiveness of how it can actually work. So, so you're, gonna, gonna, you're so deep in the heart, yeah. right? <laughs> but the latency is when you look, but the image doesn't go with you. Yes, yes. So like, oh, it's really slow. annoying. That's yes. what this stuff does. Yeah. Um, and because of that, typically, I think they say anything under 50 uh, milliseconds is good latency. Um, and right now, that's where like most video lives. For VR and AR, you need to like below 20 milliseconds. Um, and you can't even get in there yet because 5G isn't there. So you can't have shared AR experiences yet as well because of that uh, um, that lack of technology advancement um, that we just don't have right now. I, I, I share some of your thoughts about that, but I'm also really concerned about giving um, the industry total power right now and letting them mess up with my data. I'm not okay with that. Um, I think that we need to be asking the hard questions now about VR and not make some of the mistakes that we've made with social media and with other privacy issues. Um, for example, Facebook owns this. You have to log into Facebook to do anything on this device. And so it's, it's not just the, the, what, the examples you brought up. Imagine if you have this headset on and uh, Facebook or any other company is looking everywhere you look and creating heat maps like YouTube already does with all of your videos. You can watch heat maps of where people are looking at 360 videos right now. You can see how effective your 360 videos are on those heat maps. But what it also tells you is where people's focus is. And as a developer and as a creator, I'm very excited about that because it helps me make better content, teach people to make better content. However, as a private citizen, I'm very concerned about who's gonna know where I'm looking and making certain assumptions about that. And what are we going to assume about people's sexual orientation? What are we going to assume about people culturally? What are we going to assume about people politically, economically? All of these issues are going to impact us. If, if they have the data, they will be able to make these assumptions about us. And I think that is cause, that is cause for concern in that early on, we have the ability to create standards for this industry that we didn't with other technologies that went really, really rapidly into where they're at now. Um, and then on the broadband issue, I, I was a VTOP recipient out in California. Actually, I worked in uh, Latino communities, mostly migrant communities, on broadband adoption. And um, you, you have to have, I mean, I think the bottom line is in order to experiment and play and create and learn with a group, which this generation really loves to do, and I think it's really important that we cultivate and support that, You've got to have uh, everybody online, and you've got to enable them to all have their own device. My mom was, uh, actually, I just went and saw Senator King today and thanked him because he worked on the main laptop initiative with my mom, who was the head of the main teachers of English uh, 15, 20, 20 years ago, I think now. They gave every fifth grader a laptop in the state of Maine, my home state. And having a device in your home that you can then play with and not have to share with somebody else, that's actually as important, I think, as having the broadband that goes with that, because we've got to give people 
an opportunity to play with different devices. And I wouldn't say that $250 is necessarily means that money is not an issue anymore. It's also having access to the cultural reference points of technology. Technology people speak a different language. My husband's always like, you need to talk more like a normal person. Because I'm, you know, I'm talking about A-frame, and I'm talking about this, and I'm talking about, we're talking about latency. And it's true, you need to break down the, you don't, you need to make, don't make the assumptions about what people know in the room, and just break down these definitions, because people can feel really excluded by that language as well, if they haven't been exposed to it, or they haven't been in a community that is as tech savvy, and so, you know, don't assume you know what anybody knows about this. So I'm going to ask a couple more questions and then take a few questions from the audience. So start thinking of your big questions. Um, so Russell, before you said that most of the VR users are white men, and this teed up my next question because I wanted to. Well, I was, re I was referring to <laughs> our users are at drop. I won't. Okay, make that at drop. Okay. Industry. At okay. Drop, yes. Um, but in general, I wanted to talk about the importance of diversity in this space. Um, and I'm curious if you think that the VR space, and this is for everyone, but um, if you think that VR is a diverse field in the sense of the content creators, um, developers, and users, and if not, how can diversity in VR be improved? Well, that's a great question. <laughs> so, um, I've been, we've been working on Drop for, what, we were four and a half years old now? What, oh gosh, I'm going on, almost going on five since. Yeah. We started in 2014. Yeah. Um, and since then have completely um, developed myself and myself in the industry. And one thing that you will notice whether you go to uh, GDC, a game developer conference um, that happens every year in March, um, whether you go to things such as you know the Augmented World Expo, um, it's a big augmented reality VR um, conference in San Francisco as well, is that oftentimes the majority of participants are male um, most are older, um, more than likely white male as well. Um, you will see very few women, um, uh, and you will, it's very rare that you'll even see uh, most people of color. Um, like I know, for example, at GDC, like Microsoft hosts a like blacks and gaming um, meetup just during GDC. Um, and something I've seen in terms of like developers and users just over the past four and a half years is that I would say in the last two years you now have um, uh, women in XR fund. Um, so you're seeing like you know more women who are actually building in XR and VR uh, at the moment. Um, in terms of the diversity of the developers as well, um, I, I get a lot of calls from uh, friends who work and live in Los Angeles who are content creators um, and who are you know from underrepresented uh, communities and they're interested in figuring out like okay how do I build you know this AR experience on AR kit. Um, so I'm starting to see folks outside of uh, the space like artists and storytellers and creators who are like. Oh no, I kind of want to see what this tool can actually um, lead into. So I think the last two years have been quite interesting. I'm not sure if you would agree with me, but I think during the early days, it was like very hard. Yeah, it was very hard to find people who, you know, kind of look like us, you know, around us. Like it's very hard. Um, so yeah, I would say that diversity, um, it, it's slightly improved. It's slightly improved. I would, I would agree. I think there's, uh, in Boston, we have a really awesome ecosystem and a very diverse ecosystem. So we've had, um, we've had diversity right from the beginning in Boston. Um, Boston VR, if you go, it, you'll see, you look out in the crowd, it's very diverse, um, which surprised me actually when I first went because I thought I'd be the only woman and it would be all white guys, and it wasn't. And so um, I think partly, you know, Boston has 60 universities, we're the biggest, you know, school town in the world, I guess. So there, there are a lot of students and there's a lot of international students and there's a lot of diversity in that way. Um, there's also some women leaders. I, I do, I, we have women in Next Realities that we started in Boston a couple of years ago. There's a women meetup in New York City. I definitely encourage you to uh, look into if there's women meetups in San Francisco, which I know there are, and I'll talk to some of them. The, the, face, the only reason I'm on Facebook now is because of the women in VR groups. They are prolific. They are constantly posting jobs and helping each other out. I mean, it is not uncommon for women, at least women in our field, to have 50 people post on, hey, what kind of curriculum can I use for this project I'm doing? Or, hey, does anybody know um, any projects in Berlin? Or, hey, can I find a, 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 a Unity developer to do this? So there's a lot of helping each other that reminds me a lot of 1999, which was, you know, um, I was a web developer in 1999. And, we were all helping each other out, and there were computer using groups, and we'd meet, and we'd all like help each other. Um, and that's really, VRLA came out of that, actually. VRLA came out of a meetup group, and it was one of the biggest tech expos for VR of recent years, and it had that community vibe 
really strongly. And so I do think that there are a lot of spaces in VR that we did not see in, in even the early days of the internet in Silicon Valley that are very conducive to diversity inclusion. I think um, generationally, there are, I mean, most people that I work with are, could be my daughters and sons. Um, so, you know, they're 25 years old and they've already started. One, one of our hackathon um, participants, it was her first event, she's from DC, Morgan Mercer. She came up to Boston for uh, our Eco Hackathon in April of 2017. She had never done anything with VR at all. And um, Morgan, she's African American, she is entrepreneurial, she's super smart. She basically now has a $10 million uh, company with contracts with all kinds of tech companies, um, and it's a VR product that's all about sexual harassment training. And I just think that's amazing because because of how young the industry is and because of the inclusivity that I think a lot of us have felt, there a lot of things are possible right now. Um, the other two folks I want to mention is just Kamal Sinclair, who's done a lot of work with the Ford Foundation. Um, she has an awesome uh, series, I guess, of a of, of blog and uh, reports on making a new reality about how VR is conducive to diversity and inclusion and how we can do more about that. Especially in the stories that we tell, if you have women creators and people of color creators, you're gonna have stories that are really different than some of those algorithms that have been built on the web, that when you look for CEO, for a woman CEO, you get a picture of CEO Barbie, still still in the first page in the first search forms, right? So we have an opportunity to build something different now. And I think, I, I'm excited about it, as you can probably tell. Um, I think there's a lot of opportunities for us to, to bake that in now. But I think we have to do it in a really conscious way. We have to talk about privacy and we have to talk about inclusion now. Yeah, I, I would agree with that. <laughs> Let me just say that the, one of the things I got to do it was last Saturday is host the, the 53-year-old California Student Media Festival. These are all projects from kindergarten through 12th grade. So I've been looking at it for 20 years. And, and we just did it uh, last Saturday. Uh, lots of women, lots of people of color. They're all there. They can all make this stuff. And right now, we don't have a vision of what a VR creator looks like. I mean, you know it's, it's a lot of white males, but no one else really does. What does it look like? We can change what people look like and therefore change the way kids guide. And to do that, we need to start this way. Our lunch conversation was so good. Getting us kids to do this. So when we're talking about barriers, uh, I was talking about schools. So $200 million is three textbooks, really two textbooks. That's it. If I can get this and this, the equivalent of four textbooks, into the hands of the kids we're talking about to create their experiences, this isn't owned by the old guard anymore. This is owned by the new guard. And we can do that and celebrate them and uh, create festivals for that, and lots of stuff will change. So now is absolutely the time to start moving this stuff, modeling this stuff in the kindergarten through 12th. Both great uh, space. That's why our conversation was so good. That's great, thanks. So we're running low on time, and I'm wondering if there's a couple of quick questions from the audience. Wow. That's, that's, that's great. That's Such an engaged crowd. Way more than the other panels. Remember my role? <laughs> <goal. laughs> Remember my role? We're asking questions, we're not giving long monologues. Thank you all for a great panel on this subject. Antonio White behind that this group. Um, you all talked about the diversity and inclusion issue, and it seems as though the way I understood your response is the only way to sort of combat that is a, from a grassroots approach. But what we know from like diversity and inclusion practices, unless it's centered at the highest platforms and the executives aren't the most people for those issues, it's hard to move the needle. So understanding how intellectual and economic capital flows through these big companies. What can companies be doing to make sure that there are more people of color or from disadvantaged backgrounds who are able to help create and shape those experiences so that if you're trying to build compassion and empathy, those experiences of ARB are actually reflect the reality. Um, and then the second part is, uh, I've been doing some work with the Berkman Klein Center at Harvard on misinformation, uh, particularly uh, through social media and how it impacts people of color. Um, do you all foresee with the future of AR, VR, us needing to have a public education about how you perceive this AR experience so that it's not a developer or a person with a certain perspective on how they want you to see the world, but it is actually authentic and true and based in real information, not misinformation. So I know it's a two-part question, but please respond anyway. Thank you again. I would love to touch on your uh, first question, uh, which is you know, the responsibility that companies have. Um, so something I've looked at is one day, I'll never forget, I was looking at the team. And I realized that 
everyone on our team at Drop has gone to a top engineering program, and more than likely, he or she is um, either a white male or Asian, for example. Um, and I bring this up as a very personal story when I thought about it. And the reason I was like, why is it that all of our engineering talent pretty much looks the same and has very similar lived experiences? And I realized that when you know, I looked at looked at the makeup of the team, is that the team is X Sony PlayStation VR. The team is you know X Google Daydream. And the reason that we were the reason that when they worked at Drop is because of course we only hired the best. Um, is that oftentimes when you look at these larger companies, um, I've noticed that there are not a lot of women and people of color on the right product teams where they can get the experience that they need to then ship into a startup. So for example. Uh, I was looking and I was saying, I'm like, oh, I would love to hire you know, a female computer vision engineer. And I was like, it would be even better if she was you know, a woman of color. And one of my friends, she leads a very prominent MA, MA, a machine learning team at a startup in San Francisco. And she said, where are you going to find her? Because there are probably only a handful and most of them probably at research institutions. So when I look at larger companies, something I would like to see is that when they're recruiting engineering, specifically I'm talking about engineering talent, when they're recruiting engineering talent, to put them on the right product teams, the ones that actually truly matter, where they'll actually get the experience that they need, that they can then take that knowledge capital and then bring it to a company like Draw. They can bring it to other organizations. Um, because that's the, that's an issue that I'm recurrent, and not, not even I, but I've talked to other founders about it as well that we're seeing right now, is where it's like, why don't these folks have the knowledge capital? Um, because the, I mean, if you think about it, right, if you look at, you know, uh, I know we've been talking about like HBCUs, for example, something I've seen is that oftentimes a lot of HBCU graduates um, who then go take on engineering jobs at large companies, they aren't on the right product teams. Um, they are working on engineering problems where I'm like, we can have you know someone who just learned how to program yesterday actually fix that. But imagine if that HBC, HBCU graduate um, now works on a Siri team at Apple, and then he leaves and goes start some machine learning startup. That's a completely different trajectory compared to working at Apple on, you know, Apple Music fixing bugs because, you know, um, the user couldn't get the next screen to work. Um, so I think that the long-winded <laughs> response to your answer is that I would love to see um, larger companies put uh, engineers and folks who kind of hold the knowledge and technical capital in the right positions. Because um, I think that right now, I mean, tech is a major wealth generator. I mean, let's not uh, ignore that. And a lot of that wealth generation can only happen by people who have the knowledge capital and who are technical. Um, so, so. And who will leave their company. Yeah, who are going to leave their company. I want to address the, the other thing that you brought up, um, two things. One, yes, that's true with companies. And companies, I think one of the things very specifically that they can do to attract diverse talent is to pay people to come to hackathons. So I saw Bose do this recently, and I thought this was awesome. So you know, one of my staff people, um, was able to get paid $1,000 to do a three-day product hackathon. Because those companies, when you go to a hackathon, they're using your ideas. They're, you're, you're selling them something whether you realize it or not, and you're usually doing it for free. So if they wanna make sure that they're um, di attracting diverse folks, they're, they're gonna get more people from different backgrounds if they're paying them for, in exchange for that. Secondly, um, the, the grassroots diversity thing for me um, we have 1,500 community media centers around the country. We're under attack right now. Um, one of the FCC, there's an FCC order uh, for polls rulemaking that could really hurt us, 05311, I believe, um, that could take away half of our funding. We have been for 35 years providing training to anyone in the community who wants to come in and make content, and we're doing the same thing in VR. I'd like to see us be protected so that we can continue to do this work. And also, we work with libraries and arts organizations and film festivals. Those folks are all doing that work, and they're attracting a really diverse group of creators and makers to their spaces. And lastly, um, building a network. So one of the best things if you, um, you know, for, for I think for getting more diversity and inclusion is to have Get, give access to your networks, right? So that's what I see a lot of women doing for each other is that we're giving each other access to our networks. I do not even hesitate a minute if a woman reaches out to me on Facebook and says, hey, I'm a woman in VR, 
do you have time for a 30 minute call? Yep, absolutely. So I think all of us who have talent and who have interest in nurturing the field, we should all be doing that right now. No matter what age, you know, I have 25 year olds mentoring 50 year olds and we have a lot of women who are coming in and creating and sometimes they get sidelined <coughs> to, to marketing teams or communications teams or taking the notes for the meeting teams. Um, and I want to put them into positions where they're the engineer, they're doing all of the product, not only the design, but actually doing the coding. So we need to, as allies, make sure that women are getting put into positions where they can have an opportunity to learn some of those skills. Because that's why the white guys just you know, stand up and do it, and sometimes we don't, and so we need help. And so I think helping each other will do that. Sorry, that wasn't short. And then but one of the things that we do is to, to, to discover education, we that very seriously. Uh, one of the things, and, and uh, Charmaine could, could talk about this better than I could, but we work with companies like Toyota to do content creation challenges. Uh, and that's where you see every kind of person come up and do that. The last uh, Toyota challenges ones, I think, were, were uh, two uh, high school girls of color. And if, if you can, Tata, the uh, consulting firm, who has a, who has a computational thinking site that's all free, all offered free, it's in English, it's in Spanish. Those things are really important, and if we can get, get them started before they get out of high school, then when they hear you and talk to you, you can pull them in a direction and have the skills and the interest and love that's something they want to do. So start young, go to your school, see if they're doing that. And that they're not just driven by test scores, I know test scores are important, but say, are you giving kids in this school the chance to create material for this? Because they can do that. But that personalized experience question, by the way, that you asked about ER, all media is edited. Right, and so the best thing we could do is teach young people to have really awesome critical thinking skills. And I have to say, I work with a lot of young people who um, don't seem to have that as a priority, and we really need to help them make that a priority because whatever media form we move to, if they're not thinking critically about both their role as a creator and their role as a consumer, we've lost everything. All right, so we're gonna combine two questions here. So I need these questions to just be 30 seconds or less. I need the responses to be 45 seconds or less. Okay. Um, I have a question about how how you all are approaching policy makers and regulators with VR, either um, what Kathy just talked about with the FCC regulations, but more importantly, how the nonprofit groups and other, or maybe not more importantly, but how other groups are um, utilizing VR technologies to make, to present their, their case um, for whatever it is that they're doing at the policy level. Um, because in my experience, we are going to find the VR and experience the VR um, as general public, as policymakers, as people needing to be entertained or, or in gaming. So what is that? What is that looking like? What can that look like? Thank you. Let's go ahead and get this question in, and then you guys can. Mine's like a very different question. It's more about, and, and I think the woman here from Brookline might have the best answer for this. But um, and I'm a neuroscientist by training. I'm just curious. Um, it, it, in parallel, is there a body of research that's looking at the cognitive? You've talked a lot about cognitive immersion to the point that I was like, huh, thinking about cognitive immersion in the different communities. So my question is. You know, where is where are things that I know everything's very nascent right now, but where is it at in terms of understanding what does that immersion actually do to us in terms of our cognition and how we're experiencing that? That may not be a quick question. If it's not or a quick answer, just find me after. I'm happy to talk to you. Do you want to do that too? Yes. Do you want to answer while you're getting somebody else? Yeah, okay. Right. I'm giving myself a timer because that's, that's uh -huh. helpful actually. Here's my second. Um, on the on the cognitive science neuroscience, um, I can get in touch with some people because there's a lot being done. Um, but there's a lot we don't know. We're we're actually organizing with a number of uh, friends on Twitter and different folks at uh, different universities. Uh, a white paper, research paper on seniors in VR, for example. There hasn't been one yet. So even to answer your question, you know, how are folks using VR for policy change? We're, we're not entirely there yet. I think the best use case has been Planned Parenthood, frankly, who came out really early on and worked with Vani de la Pena, who is um, one of the, I think, least unsung heroes of VR. She's the godmother of VR. Um, she did a piece with them called Across the Line that you can download and watch. And it, it gives you a embodied experience with what it would be like to walk across uh, a line of protesters 
Um, she used real audio from outside of um, abortion clinics, whatever you want to call them, um, clinics. And that audio is very intense. And so when you're being, it's being directed at you inside of that VR experience, it, it, it's, it's pretty impactful. And so they had a whole kit and a guidebook. We have a project on immigration and uh, migration storytelling that we're using uh, as a policy and a facilitating community dialogue conversation. I can tell people more about it if you come and talk to me. Um, and we'll be at the, um, at the, the thing tonight too. In, in terms of, of the research, uh, I'll just say that there, there is some research, it's, it's growing. Uh, it's not there, uh, Ted, uh, the, kind of, the congressman who sponsored this started off talking about how it's being used in VA hospital now for uh, post-traumatic stress syndrome, how effective that is. I've seen studies uh, with pregnancy that it reduces the uh, pain of uh, childbirth. Like, so there, there is some stuff there. The experience, uh, and especially as it gets to this level, uh, can do wonderful things. But the, the research is just growing. Yeah. I just and I was, saw a study, I'm sorry, I just saw a study just this week actually that VR, they, they compared VR and other pain um, reducers and VR was like the best because it actually is no body, drugs. yeah, no drugs at all. So they were actually there was a study or a there was a, something I saw this week. I think it was an article about um, the op opioid crisis and how might we use VR to um, move people out of addiction, which is an interesting idea. And again, we have to do more research on that. And I'll just quickly say, uh, check out Stanford's Virtual Human Interaction Lab. Um, they do some really impressive white papers on present immersion, um, cognitive, yeah, and cognitive understanding of VR. Great, unfortunately we have to wrap up, but thank you so much to our panelists, it was wonderful. <laughs> Alisa, will give closing remarks. All right, you all, thank you so much to coming to Emerging Tech for Social Change today. You are invited to our reception and showcase, which takes place at the Google office which is located at 25 Massachusetts Avenue. You can either walk there, it's about a 15 minute walk or so, or if it's really hot outside, as I said at the beginning, you can take an Uber or a Lyft or a yeah. cool down. All right, so I hope that you guys can join us there and make sure that you interact with our panelists. And let's give a round of applause for all the panelists and speakers. And be sure to use hashtag tech for change. Thank you.